28th marathon, 28 days. I said I'd do it. Like it looks like I'm going to do it. Um, so that's nice. It's nice to stick to your guns. I'm almost at the end. Marathon 28. Yeah, I'm going to do a gig now. Do a stand-up gig. And look at this. Da da da. say oh you must love the running I love the stopping it's not a body thing it's a mind thing it's so good to be here goes to charities that make humanity great because they do wonderful things out there. I'm going to kick, kick it off right now and, uh, and let's get this going and get the first marathon in London going. Cheers, see Good ya. Luck, boys. <laughs> I have just finished in Portugal. There you can see the Portugal flag. Got a train, night train, from Lisbon to Spain to Madrid. So I'm going to start running right from the station. Italy now, yeah. There we go. Italy. Running through the streets in Malta, in Valletta. Is it the sixth marathon? Nicosia in Cyprus, which has had its own problems of separation division oh. in Greece in Athens uh, uh, Sofia Bulgaria day eight I'm here in Bucharest in Romania running in the snow uh, this is Hungary Hungary is in Budapest the February 11th and 11th marathon you see it all ties up and this is Slovakia Bratislava in Slovakia off to Vienna. Each one I get up and I'm thinking... <sighs> Zagreb, Croatia. Here we are. Ljubljana. Um, is this Marathon 14? I think this is... When I've done this, it'll be the halfway point. Thank you for supporting. So, I'm in Prague. Czech Republic. I think it's the 16th of February in Warsaw, Warsaw. So I'm in Vilnius, which is in Lithuania. In Latvia, Riga, about 10k to go, running in Tallinn and Estonia. And I'm not running as you can see, I'm staggering. Finland and Helsinki. Uh, almost finished Marathon 20, thank you. Just finishing in Stockholm in Sweden. Here in Copenhagen, there we go, the UNICEF. This is the biggest, biggest warehouse, humanitarian warehouse in, in the world. Berlin, Germany, capital city in Brussels, Belgium, Luxembourg. Marathon, 25? Yeah, 25th marathon. It's 25 days. Sounds insane. February 26, marathon 26. Out of 28. Netherlands. Amsterdam, it's canals, it's canals everywhere. Canals, canals. So, this is it, 27th. 28th is tomorrow. And we've been running through Ireland. To Dublin. So I'm in 
I'm in France, I'm in Paris. Let's, let's get the French flag in there. There we go. And uh, uh, 28th marathon, 28 days. I said I'd do it and I have. It looks like I'm going to do it. Um, so that's nice. It's nice to stick to your guns. I'm almost at the end, marathon 28. Yeah, I'm going to do a gig now, do a stand up gig. And look at this. Da da da. People say, oh, you must love the running. I love the stopping. It's not a body thing, it's a mind thing. It's so good to be here. goes to charities that make humanity great because they do wonderful things out there. I'm going to kick, kick it off right now and, uh, and let's get this going and get the first marathon in London going. Cheers, see Bye ya. Boys. <laughs> I have just finished in Portugal. There you can see the Portugal flag. Got a train, night train, from Lisbon to Spain to Madrid. So I'm going to start running right from the station. Italy now, yeah. There we go. Italy. Running through the streets in Malta, in Valletta. Is it the sixth marathon? Nicosia in Cyprus, which has had its own problems of separation division oh. in Greece, in Athens, uh, uh, Sofia, Bulgaria, day eight. And here in Bucharest, in Romania, running in the snow. Uh, this is Hungary. Hungary is in Budapest. The February 11th and 11th marathon, you see it all ties up. And this is Slovakia, Bratislava in Slovakia. Off to Vienna. Each one I get up and I'm thinking... <laughs> Zagreb, Croatia. Here we are. Ljubljana. Um, is this Marathon 14? I think this is... When I've done this, it would be the halfway point. Thank you for supporting. So, I'm in Prague. Czech Republic. I think it's the 16th of February in Warsaw, Warsaw. So I'm in Vilnius, which is in Lithuania. In Latvia, Riga, about 10k to go, running in Tallinn and Estonia. And I'm not running as you can see, I'm staggering. Finland, Helsinki. Ah, uh, almost finished Marathon 20, thank you. Just finishing in Stockholm in Sweden. Here in Copenhagen, there we go, the UNICEF. This is the biggest, biggest warehouse, humanitarian warehouse in, in the world. Berlin, Germany, capital city in Brussels, Belgium, Luxembourg. Marathon 25? Yeah, 25th marathon. It's 25 days. Sounds insane. February 26, marathon 26. Out of 28. Netherlands. Amsterdam is canals, there's canals everywhere. Canals, canals. So, this is it, 27th. 28th is tomorrow. 
and we've been running through Ireland to Dublin. So I'm in, I'm in France, I'm in Paris. Let's, let's get the French flag in there. There we go. And uh, uh, 28th marathon, 28 days. I said I do it. I have, it looks like I'm going to do it. Um, so that's nice. It's nice to stick to your guns. I'm almost at the end, marathon 28. Yeah, I'm going to do a gig now, do a stand-up gig. And look at this. Da -da -da. say oh you must love the running I love the stopping it's not a body thing it's a mind thing it's so good to be here goes to charities that make humanity great because they do wonderful things out there. Good morning everyone. Five, four, three, two, one. So, just taking the knee there because black lives matter and we want to make humanity great again. Black people are part of humanity as we all are. So, so yes, Marathon 10, this is the one. Hello to all black people out there, your lives do matter. To all people, white people, your lives matter. Anyone, whatever skin color you have, your lives matter. We're gonna try it and make humanity great again. And rather than just one section, we're against nationalism, but for patriotism. Patriotism is, I love my country, and nationalism has come to be defined as, my country is better than your country. And that is the bad thing. That is the 1930s. That is, that is what we were seeing on the 6th of January in Washington, D.C. So uh, we're calling out to all 7.8 billion people around the world. We are raising money. We're up to about... Now, can you do the... the uh, can you check what... If I give you the amount, can you put it into the uh, euros and dollars exchange? Yeah, sure. So, we're right, just about to break for 49,734. That's what it is in pounds. 49,734 pounds. And so Sarah's gonna check here. So 49,734 pounds is currently uh, 67,479 US dollars Excellent. and 55,201 euros. There you go. 
That's where we are. Thank you so much for donating. Idiots.com to donate from around the world. Pounds, euros, or US dollars you can pay. You'll see if you get there, there's supporters. It's on the crowdfunder page. And you'll see this big orange bar, but if you just scroll down a little bit below, you can see you have a choice of currencies as well. But we're gonna get that sorted out so that it becomes more obvious. Um, everything ticking along nicely. Marathon 10, I've got a bit of a problem in the front of my right calf. Um, not sure why that is. Oh, we think it's because of lifting the foot on the treadmill, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, yes, so my thigh. Left thigh talking to me as well this morning. So once I've done this marathon, I will have done ten, and then at seven p.m. London time tonight, I will perform my tenth gig in ten days. If you've seen anything, I am struggling to combat extreme exhaustion in doing this. So it's a little, a little bit of an unusual gig, but I think I'm having funny somewhere in there, but there is no audience, no live audience, so there's a virtual audience, but uh, so this is Sunday the 10th, and on Tuesday the 12th, I will be running a virtual Vienna, uh, uh, and I will do the gig in German after that, make sure alles auf Deutsch um, um, uh, um, uh, 19 or uh, 19, uh, 1900 hours, 19 or 24 hour clock there. So that's what it, what's going to happen. I'm now essentially running on fumes. So, yeah, energy you can kind of fuel up and run, but it's tricky. You get very tired. I'm back at just been to the loo of course before you start and then you want to go I find I want to go to the loo as soon as I start so that's not so good uh, but uh, yeah I'll have to do that and today at uh, 12 30 we're going to be talking to a woman who's the founder of uh, one of the big comedy clubs in London Maria Kempinska and uh, it's 12.30 London time, 1 o'clock London time, Sarah K. Melo. I'm going to talk to her. Uh, and uh, she's a fan and she's uh, obviously made a donation, I believe. Um, 1.30 p.m. Facebook questions. We could dive on. Ah, now, Sarah, we've got, I can see. Twitter questions later on. Aren't we going to change that? Isn't that? Yes, I think I think we're sticking with this today, and then we might do a little oh, right. change okay. in future days. But there's no, there's no uh, um, YouTube questions, are there? No, just uh, Facebook and Twitter today. Okay, there you go. So 1:30 p.m. London time. Facebook questions. Jump on Facebook. Not until 1:30. I think it's the thing. They don't. They, they shouldn't go advanced, should they? And shouldn't go put questions on in advance, should they? No, it's best to, yeah, any questions do wait till bang on that time, uh, and then that'll be, uh, that'll be, we'll see them. Otherwise, they might disappear up the thread if you uh, put them too early. So, yeah, at, at that specific time, go with the questions, and we'll try and answer as many as we can. Okie dokie, that's at 1 2 p.m. Graham Johnson. Graham from uh, Mizuna, being sponsored by Mizuna, is their symbol here. Helped us get going, helped me with the kit. So I'm going to talk to Graham, he's helped me get on my kit and get it working. And as he knows, I can talk to him about I'm quite choosy about what works or what doesn't work. And, and uh, getting the, something that suits, which is great, it's been a great help, Graham has. 2.30, uh, Gabor Osvath. And uh, Veronica Yakev talking to them. Uh, three o'clock, Scott 
Briggs, walking with a wounded volunteer, excellent, one, walking with a wounded, one of our big five charities that we're, we are highlighting, which are walking with the wounded and Care International and uh, Covenant House and Fair Share, it's food wastage, uh, Covenant House helping young people in six countries uh, who uh, need a place to stay and just haven't got a place to stay. And then of course, Unite to Combat uh, Neglected Tropical Diseases. A lot of tropical diseases are still are neglected and not on the public radar. So, NTD, NTDs, Neglected Tropical Diseases. So, combating the fight against that. 1.7 billion people affected by that. Care packages. If you ever heard after the Second World War from America, care packages came in and helped people all across Europe. And now it's an international organization, which is good. Uh, okay. So that's talking to Scott Briggs. Um, Dave up in the sky. Is it Dave today? Who is it? Sorry. Hello. Dave. Yes, Dave. Certainly, it would be nice to have a. Um, any more details? Some people have got some details after them. Some people haven't got details. It'd be nice to have anything there. I'll get, I'll get into that some details. That would be great. Joel, Joel Oxberry, going to talk to Joel at 3:30 p.m. London time. Head of income for walking with the wounded. So two people we can talk to about walking with the wounded today. Twitter questions at 4 p.m. You can dive on Twitter at 4 o'clock London time. And. Uh, Send your question in, I'll answer them. Uh, Anna Lodge has generously donated. And so Anna, I'm gonna be talking at 4.30. Julian Clary, the one and only Julian Clary, 5 p.m., so it'd be great to talk to Julian. I am not a fan of pantomime, but Julian makes them work. I, have, I specifically wanted to see what he was doing in the, the pantomime with the Palladium, so I got, I think, the last ticket in the house. Last ticket going. I uh, knew who to talk to, and so I begged that, and, uh, and but bought. I'm pretty sure I bought the ticket, as opposed to because sometimes you get given them, but I had to pay for it because it was all sold out. But Julian has sort of reinvented in his own way, uh, pantomime, and then and we're talking to Sarah Collinson. Uh, yes, Dave, would be good to know. A little bit more about Sarah, I'm talking with Tim. Just a few words on there. That's at 5.30, 5.30 today. So I'm running along, so we're gonna break the 50,000. We've already broken 50,000 dollars, 50,000 euros. Now about to break the 50,000 pounds. Eddieizard.com, press on there. Gets you through to the crowdfunder site where you can support uh, us as we're raising money to, for many charities, particularly the five that I mentioned earlier, which I should be able to reel off now. Get them in alphabetical. So Care International first. Have to see. Sarah, can you tell me how we, how we the five charities uh, in alphabetical? Walking with the wound is a W, so that's I can put that last. I'm just trying to be able to reel them off. Yes, we should. Uh, we should get the alphabetical list. Actually, I want yes, you to make. Useful. I want you to make. I'll it. make it. So it's Care is going to be at the front. Walking with the wound at the end. Com unite to combat again so that's a U UVW so that's just before them and we've got fair share and we've got Covenant House so Covenant House is second oh care come yes care come two C's so care international Covenant House fair share with an F and then down to the U's unite to combat against neglected tropical diseases and walking with the wounded uh, doing a lot of good work people from the forces who've come out uh, and could be physically or mentally wounded or getting into difficulties, uh, including with um, with uh, the law. Um, uh, so they get into tricky situations or fights or whatever, whatever it is, walking with the wounded, they're helping, raising money and and face-to-face uh, -face help. They, and they've been I've been talking to people from walking with the wounded that said normally they, they try and get face to face but they've been having to do a lot of conference call link ups online 
but in fact that in a way gives them a bigger reach which is good so and today I am running I changed my track anyone on Zwift I changed my track and uh, and so I, I'm on a different one so I'm sorry if that threw anyone I'm on sand and sequoias is the route in Watopia in uh, is the virtual world of of, um, of uh, Zwift sand and sequoias was requested so I jumped to that route having been setting on a different route and that might have thrown people but there seemed to be a number of people with me it says 96 nearby but I think that's uh, yeah, there's a lot of cyclists there, and well done to them, but I think, uh, oh, it's a big long list, yeah. So some people just cycling by as we're running. I don't know how to see everyone. Uh, I suppose it's the list on the right-hand side, any of those names, but right next to me, we can give them a shout-out. Oh. Now, I've said this, I keep starting the bloody run and then I want to pee. So I'm sorry, this is, this is me. I am going to stop for a pee at quarter past the hour and try and have a quick pee and come back. Apologies, so I'm stopping in a couple of minutes. Uh, it's just one minute. That's what I'll do. Yep. Certain people I know running with me have run before. You would recognize names. Um, now there's people in and out. Thank you. People donating here, down here at Riverside Studios, right next to the Thames River in, in uh, Hammersmith. People taking a COVID safe walk. But there's a little donation platform. Do you know about the, the? Did you mention about the signs that have come down? Yes. yes yeah, we'll get on that. Okay, cool. Alrighty. So in 15 seconds, kids, I'm going for a pee. Sorry, apologies, but uh, it's been a pee break. Maybe this will be an everyday occurrence. Okay, here we go. Having a pee break. Shockingly, over 2 million tonnes of food a year is wasted within the UK supply chain. Fair Share is tackling this problem in a strikingly simple way. We work with farmers, producers, distributors and retailers to save good quality fresh food from being wasted, so we can get it onto people's plates instead. In practice, it's a huge logistical feat, involving hundreds of volunteers working tirelessly to unload the produce, unpack and sort it at any one of our network of food warehouses across the UK. The food might be surplus, but it looks and tastes just like the food you'd eat at home. Most of it arrives well before it would have hit the supermarket shelves. Food becomes surplus for all sorts of reasons. A glut of courgettes from overproduction, or a lack of demand as unpredictable weather plays its part. Incorrect packaging and labelling, wonky fruits and veg, and cancelled orders. Wherever it comes from, with the support of our team of volunteers, we prioritise the incoming food, itemising it for traceability and breaking it down into smaller quantities for redistribution. Fairshare gives nearly 11,000 charities access to food, all of whom are onboarded safely and meet all food safety regulations. These charities and groups range from food banks, children's breakfast clubs and homeless centres to small local community groups. 
Not only does this food save charities thousands of pounds on their food bills, it means they can offer the people they support more fresh, healthy fruit and veg and a wider range of food in general. New innovations like the Fair Share Go app have seen direct pickups from the supermarkets, meaning perishable goods like fresh bread and fruit can quickly be redistributed. Fair Share is more than meals though. Food brings people together. It helps local organisations tackle loneliness and isolation within their communities, or help connect struggling families with the services that can support them. It's such a simple concept. Food that could have been wasted is instead used for good. Back running, full stop, Eddie. Okay, there we go. So we're celebrating running a Budapest virtual marathon today. That's what I'm doing. Budapest I have run uh, around there on the 10th of February last year. And there's an island. There's a, there's a video you can see behind me of me running back in January. Um, Sarah, you know, the, I, I did three videos a day in all these different cities. We can have these streaming up now because we've got footage here, which I think is from Tim. But, you know, it's got me chatting and talking in... In each, yes, at yeah. the start of each day, yeah. Well, the middle one particularly, the middle and the last one, I think the start is not terribly interesting, but, yeah. you know, if, if any of them are, can, someone could just sit back and time through them, mm -hmm. they could, uh, you know, like the one in, uh, was it Bucharest? Or was it Sofia? No, Sofia in that, that wonderful, or was it Bucharest, that wonderful snowy yes. park? Yes, Bucharest, I yeah. Bucharest. Um, yeah, some of the, the middle videos. Yeah, the middle. The last one is always where I'm finishing. Yeah, the last ones are. Well, the last one's going to be good, but if someone could look at the middle and last one, just have a yeah. quick troll. Those are on uh, your They're Twitter, on, aren't they? Yeah, Twitter. Yeah. Just to see if we want to put them in the mix. So, yes. Oh, I can see my pony tail So, once I get to days, I, I believe there's a psychological, well, I have said there's a, that's not quite the way to put it, it feels like there's a psychological change at the end of 10 marathons. It is 10 in 10 days, which is just, you can't sniff at that, you can't go, Whoa. so even in my own brain, anyone else's, you just, it's just a thing. And, uh, We'll be a third of the way through, and we will we will uh, in my head and in our project's head, the Make Humanity Great Again project will be we're up and running, we're on the way. When I can get the 15, 16, that's halfway point because we're going for 31, and then it'll feel like downhill. That's <laughs> dip downhill. Mental, mentally it's downhill, even though it's up. Now, Bucharest, uh, sorry, Budapest. Sorry, my brain, I'm a tired person, but Budapest. So it's the River Danube, it is the River Danube, isn't it? It is the River Danube. Yeah, you've got to look at, you've got facts and figures. I'm going to look it up. Um, so I'm pretty sure it's the Danube, going through an amazing river. You can go, I keep seeing, I think it's Viking sailing holidays, and it's probably for, for see more senior people, but I am a senior person now. I feel like sitting on a boat going down the Danube. I could do gigs, we could do a tour that way. On a boat? A Danube tour, yeah. Oh, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, oh, up for that. 
Get out, play the venue, then stay long. That would be a delight. Oh, okay, that's, that's on the list. <laughs> a tall boat. We've never had a tall yes. boat. We've had a tall bus, not a tall yes. boat. I've already thought about a ship going around the, the, uh, the coastline of, of Europe, which would be fun. Yeah. Or the coastline of anywhere. Down the coastline of America. Yeah, I think we were the thinking America. if we had a big enough boat that had a theatre on it, Everyone just comes no, on the boat. I, I looked at it and I think no, because then that's that's kind of a yes, but that's a bit lazy. But if you just had a what you know, then you you don't need such a big boat, just any boat and you're living yeah. on it, whatever the crew is. And uh, then you land it and you go to a local place so that you're in the uh, town or city and kind of like a cruise, like well, a cruise slash tour. Yeah. Yeah. But the the cruise is well, it, it has this. this Hopefully, relaxing thing, unless we get into big arguments. <laughs> but that, ha that would happen on a tour anyway. Well, I think a, we'll... a bus is much smaller than a boat, so we, we do pretty good on the bus, so we'll probably be all right on a boat. Dave has just said in my ear that he has a skipper's license, so he can drive oh, the boat. Go. So there you go. Ian, Ian, Ian. Oh, it was Ian. Oh, Ian I'm sorry, Ian. But Dave has karate? Dave what? has karate? Yeah. yeah. Dave, what? what uh, oh, tell us about it. Oh, what? Um, I, yeah, I studied karate from the age of 12 for what? nine years. Wow. And you know that Sarah had as well, have you got the black belt, Sarah? Yes, but Dave has got medals at national level, so yeah, we're, we're, we're well looked after with Dave with us in the sky. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> so, we're not assuming anyone's going to give us any grief, but if we could use karate on COVID, that would be good. But, uh, yes, yes, if only. Joe Rogan, who was Taekwondo teacher and obviously expert, I was talking to last night and uh, he recommended, uh, what was, what's the one I learned? Is it Jiu-Jitsu? Jiu-Jitsu. From the book, yeah? I learned Jiu-Jitsu from the book. I didn't learn. I attempted to learn. That's a better way of saying it. I got a book on it. And it was when they come in like that. Well, it was they come down with a knife and you block the knife like that, and then you take it and turn it around so the knife comes out of their hands. It was quite practical, but. Was there one with a pen? I think it were a pencil. Yes, I didn't go into that with Joe, but. I think it was if you had a pen. Well, I probably read it wrong because all the other stuff was very practical, and it seemed that. If you put a pen between your fingers and squeeze your fingers hard, that really hurts. And so it said, do that. But I'm not sure how you'd get them to put their hand out. Maybe they came up maybe with a pencil. I don't know. I can't remember that one, but it seemed bonkers, but I didn't used to talk about it. Well, I think yeah, it's quite effective. But yeah, you do need a pencil and, yeah, to get yourself in that and Someone position. to come at you like that. Ah, stop you with a pencil, thank you. Yeah, it just seems there's too many things that the, the attacker has to give to you to make it work. So, I think I have that book is somewhere. Actually, just and now from our expert Dave in the sky, has just told me in my ear that you can do it with your own finger instead of a pencil, which it makes total sense. Put your finger in between yeah. their fingers. Yeah. Does that hurt your finger? It, it releases their grip, so stop holding on. Ah. So what, you put their finger where? Well, you were saying that, but if you use a finger, if you push your finger in between their fingers, you can do it on your own hand and you can feel that the way the pressure is. Oh, okay. Thank you, Dave. A finger between their finger can release their grip. These are obviously bad people coming in and you're the good person pushing back. Uh, do you remember that, um, was it, well, this is Krav Maga, but the, um, there's the, the, technique that you use if, if you're wearing heels and if someone comes behind you and kind of bear hugs you and the whole stamping on the back of someone's foot if you've got heels on which I quite like. On the front of their foot with the back of your foot. Yes, yeah. Yes. yes. Which is quite Especially a nice my heels. Tip. That would be my stilettos that would give them a hard time. Yeah, your heels would be better than my heels. But... We, have to, we have to get back into that. So, huh. So we're talking to a whole load of people today celebrating Budapest. So it's written Budapest if you're an English speaker, but there's an H sound in which is Pest. And when you get to the Danube, it is the Danube, 
I'm not sure what it looked like. Oh yeah, I was looking at that. Yes, I'm pretty sure it's the Danube. And yeah. uh, one side is Buddha and one side is Pest, uh, which is initially you think, oh, that's unusual. But of course, you know, with most uh, little settlements that grow up around rivers, uh, the river was difficult to cross, and so it's understandable that you get an identity on one side and another identity, identity on the other side, which happens in London, north of the river, south of the river. But because we got London Bridge a long time ago, there was just one bridge, London Bridge, that had buildings on it, about seven stories, including heads on spikes at one end at the sort of uh, garrisoned end, which I suppose could be locked off to stop people coming into London. So North London was, north of the river was the thing with the city of London on the north. The south of the river was considered uh, more impoverished. Uh, but now it's all one London. And to an extent the facilities are still a bit like that, particularly the underground in South London is less than the system in North London. But uh, I believe successive mayor City Khan will be uh, who's the mayor at the moment. Not that there's a massive, we haven't got any money to put a massive new system in, but every mayor that comes in is worth the sauce for you looking at. Make uh, travel systems good for everyone from London. So we have the Oyster Card that when you're over 60, you can go anywhere on your, on your Oyster Card. I'm 58, so in fact I'm going to be 59 just after this, uh, uh, this run. This make you anti grain oil is a project challenge. There we go. Yes. That's the word I'm searching for. So, yeah, we, from the end of this challenge, uh, a year and a week later, I'll be able to go everywhere on buses and trains and tubes. Uh, it's trains, I suppose it's trains within a certain area. Uh, I believe so. But. Uh, it's like what you did in, didn't you in Berlin? There's like a looping train where you can kind of go around the whole city. It's so those beautiful Ah, yes. Loop. Get to Berlin, go on the S, S41 or the S42. So the, uh, the 41 or the 42. And that's the S-Bahn, which is Schnellbahn. It's the fast train. And then you have the U-Bahn, which is the underground train. And uh, the S-Bahn is above. And you go on the S41, 42, it goes round and round. Berlin in quite a big chunk, a bit like the Circle Line in London, but imagine it above ground. Uh, and there is a Circle Line in New York, which is a boat, and that gives a lovely view, but that's from the boat outside and looking in on the island of Manhattan. But this is in Berlin, so, and it's got heaters in it, because I remember it got down to minus 15 centigrade in uh, Berlin when I was there performing. Learning, I was doing my German lessons in a train huddled over a heater, there's a heater on each seated four person, six person bench. So, but you could look out of a snowy Berlin as the train took you around. It's quite a beautiful thing. The S41, S42, Einen Fürstig und Fürstig. And uh, speaking in German, I will be doing my show in German on the 12th. Tickets if you teach German, if you're a German speaker, if you're learning German in probably A level, uh, you come and see me to do my level best, because my last German show was at Caen in uh, Normandy for the 75th anniversary. I was there, and every five years I will perform my 333 three shows. I do it in German, French, and English, the three languages of the Battle of Normandy, uh, to commemorate people who fell and celebrate, and to celebrate above all Germany that's tried to be as good a country as a country can be since then, uh, since 45. And between 33 and 45, obviously, it was, the country was kidnapped. Freedom of speech was kidnapped by Hitler. People were murdered if they stood up against it, so people quietened down or they became exiles and they got out because if you stood up, you were murdered or shot or taken to a concentration camp. Curious to see one of the people in Washington, D.C., with a uh, Camp Auschwitz t-shirt on, showing their mental attitude of being pro-Hitler, white supremacy. On the back it had staff written. So, 
this was obviously someone who loves fascism, the old fascists of the right. So that's a hellish thing. And this is, I link this under nationalism. Anyone who says my country is better than your country, it's like being at school. And this could, you might think this is overly simplified, but it is the essence. I think the world is run like the school run. And my country is better than your country. It's essentially a kid at school saying my dad is bigger than your dad. It's rubbish. You can't, there's no point going into that. You might say they've got more weapons, more this or more that, or more money, but no country is better. We're all trying to be as good as we can, and we're all human beings. Anyway. Eddie, I have a for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for now. Hello, Maria. Hi, Eddie, how are you? I really am fascinated by you talking about Auschwitz and the German, as you said, they were kidnapped. My parents were, um, my uncle was murdered in Auschwitz. Oh, wow. My parents were Polish refugees. They were both in Siberia. Oh, wow, so, so how come Siberia? The... Well, because my mother was on the eastern part of Poland. Right. And the Russians came in there. My father was on the western part and the Germans came in that side. Right, and uh, was, she, was your mother taken away as being Polish because she was uh, a Jewish person, because she was a uh, uh, military? An intelligentsia. Intellectual. Intelligentsia, the intellectuals, yes. Yes, this is under Stalin. We've got to yeah. say, the Stalin communist regime, a big... Can I, just, can I just say how impressed I am that you know this? Because I cannot tell you how many people just don't get it. Yeah. So to come on the tail end of you talking about that, it is just amazing because I've, you know, I've even talked to people at my kids' school, like the history teacher, and said, "Oh, my uncle was in Auschwitz. He was murdered there." And they'd say, "Oh, you Jewish?" And no, no, you didn't have to be, and you understand that. You absolutely yeah. got it right. It was political leaders. It was intelligent. Uh, the the. They called them the intellectuals, people who looked for better ways of going forward. The Nazis hated that, and the communists hated that if you were doing, going against their ideology. And that's under Stalin, we've got to say. The Russian people, I have a big salute for the Russian people. They were always yeah. great, and they helped us beat the fascists in the Second World War without the Russian people and the generals who were there. But I'm, I'm taking Stalin out of this equation because he was... He was... Uh, yeah, he was... Uh, Brutal. And he caused all the people going to the gulags. And I do know this history because I've tried to be a student of humanity, which might sound, my brother said, you can't say that. But yes, I, you can. You I think you can. Are. Because you I'm, are. I'm trying Absolutely. to, I'm looking, Maria, for the, the patterns of repeats, because we humans keep repeating things, not yeah. learning from history. And I'm, try, I'm also trying to work out what, when we, when we do things are more better progressive, what locks them in so that even if Hitler took them out, or even if Trump takes them out, you know, Joe Biden will bring them back in, and uh, the leader of Germany, the Ch Chancellor, in a free Germany after 45, brought human rights right back to the same level. So it's, I'm interested in locking in good ideas, tolerance, all that kind of stuff. So, so yes. Well, you know, I don't know if you know this, apart from uh, having met you at Jongles, which we'll talk about shortly, but you're, you're Dipping into my passion, I'm also a psychotherapist. Right. And um, I did my MA and PhD in psychotherapy, and my PhD was in the uh, mind of a comedian. Right. And I, one of my, um, I did a theory of comedy, you know, uh, Freud did one about jokes. Well, I did it about the mind of an alternative, not alternative, but a comedian. Yep. A modern day comedian like yourself. And I said, there are those comedians that are great. Those that are ordinary, they're jobbing comedians, which we see a lot of. But those that are what's called, what I call the supra comedian, the comedian that can not only make the world laugh but can affect change. Yes, and, it, that, and he becomes a healer, and that's you. You're like the shaman. You dip into that world, and you can. You're like between the worlds, if you like. So I can fully understand you saying that you're humanitarian, and you speak as a humanitarian. And of course, you're an Aquarian. Well, so you would be. Well, I'm quite, but I don't, I, it's for others to say whether I'm a humanitarian, but I would say I'm a student of humanity. That's the thing. I want to study it and to work evil. There, there was documentaries that have been on this. Is evil born? It doesn't seem to. It seems to be learnt. Uh, is, yeah. is a baby evil when it's just out, been born? It seems that if you track people like a Stalin, like a Hitler, 
they're usually brutalized at birth. This doesn't Absolutely. forgive them, but they, they work out when they start using brutalization back, it seems to work for them. And they say, well, I'll do my entire career like this. And you've got Caesar doing it as well. You've yeah. got Genghis Khan doing it. Um, and uh, um, William the Conqueror in, in Britain, all three of those I just mentioned Caesar, Genghis Khan, William the Conqueror, William the First of England, were very brutal, but they were totally attacked. And, uh, and Caesar almost died uh, under Sulla, the dictator Sulla before. And, they, and, they, and people pleaded with Sulla, saying, no, let him go. And he said, watch out for this guy. He'll be, he'll be dangerous in the future, but I'll let him go. And he was. He became Caesar and megalomaniacal, yeah. killed a million Gauls. Anyway, we're going on. But it's, no, but it's interesting, because I think we all have that ability with inside us. I remember I was walking down the, you know, sort of the um, railway tracks in Auschwitz, and right. I turned to my sister and I said, I wonder how many people who were pushed would not have been able to withstand, withstand the force of becoming evil and doing an evil deed. Because yes. it takes something so deep inside of you and so strong to withstand that force of evil. And it, I think it, we really, in our day and age, fortunately, don't have to come up against that in our general... Well, I don't know. I don't know if you have. You know, sort of, I don't know, because you're much more in the public eye, the trolling, the hate, that type of thing that you must take on board. How I, do you cope with that? I don't read it, actually. So that's my technique. Yeah. I just... No, because remember, comedy clubs, people would say, fuck off, Hello. you. Fuck off, you <laughs> bastard. You go, if you, particularly if you weren't doing very well. They'd say, or the, even if they, you were just starting out, they'd say horrible things. And if I ever thought, well, you've got a point there, you drunken <laughs> idiot, then I'd be lost. But so, in yeah, this. Uh, Dave Bedil apparently said that one of the guys in the audience with him said to him, nobody liked you at school anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because they probably don't. Like, you know, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a rough right, place. Right, yeah. The comedy club's a rough place, and it's much harder for women comedians because I think low character men are have been the thing that has held back humanity the most now we know there are women who worked in in, in the camps in Auschwitz so we know there are women who could behave really badly bad yeah. with the children so it probably goes hand in hand if we but throughout history because it's been a male dominated world low character men have, have held things back and, and made people go backwards and used the threat, even if not the actual violence, the threat of violence if you disagree with them. And yeah. uh, that's something that we need to get on top of, get beyond. And as a trans person, you know, people obviously love to throw hate in my direction, and I just throw it back. That's all I do. And if they fight me, I fight them back. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the place I've got to. But do you find that you can, uh, I'm, I'm a big believer, I mean, I've had the joy of observing practically all the best comedy in that period of time, it's yep. gone now, hasn't it? Because they're not allowed to say things, and that's a bit ridiculous, because it was almost like a sanctuary, an area people could say what they wanted, you could think of ideas. Do you remember Jerry Shadowitz, by the way? Yeah, Jerry Shadowitz, yeah. Yeah, when he talked about Jimmy Savile all those years ago. He announced that Jimmy Savile was uh, a paedophile and nobody sort of listened to him. But, oh. you know, and we had wonderful things going on, you know, Malcolm Hardy playing around. And there were some great acts out there as well, of course, than yourself. But you moved off the circuit quite quickly, didn't you? Yeah, I started in 88. It was about two years before I started Jonglers in 1990. And I left at the Christmas of 91 playing the comedy yeah. store. And really? uh, it was my yeah. third medium of comedy. Yeah, because you started off in, um, didn't you do the street performing in Covent Garden? Yes, I was street performer. I was a double act called The Officials, and we played it at uh, Jonglers as The Officials, but, right. but not, we were, it was knockabout comedy. Yeah, I always yeah. remember, I that. yeah, it was more knockabout. It could work, and people go, hey, these people are crazy, but at its base level, it wasn't clever. It was more just crazy. And I knew that I came from spoke. I came from sketch. I'd done 12. I did 12 Edinburgh festivals over 13 years. So, sketch comedy, then street performing, then stand up, which is quite amazing training, accidental training. But by the time I got to stand up, I was like on a train, ready to go, as soon as I could do it. But Jonglers was a very tough club to play because uh, the audience could really turn on you 
and rip you apart. I found, but I, yeah, you set it up. Did you? Yeah, well, I set it up with 300 pounds over. I lived in the bed. Okay, I, my parents, when they came here, there were six of us in one bedroom. Right. Okay, Paddington. And then we moved to South Oxy in Watford. I was just telling Miranda. And I was a girl from the local council estate. But we made good because my parents always wanted us to be educated. Of course they did. And I went to a convent grammar school. And um, my dad and I um, volunteered in the local, what was called a mental asylum at that time, which was a massive Victorian asylum at the age of 17. And I was really always interested in mental health. And my father told me to do not to do two things. One is not to go into entertainment and not to go into psychiatry. And I ended up uh, starting jonglers with 300 quid overdraft. I lived in a bedsit and a uh, bicycle is collateral and ended up getting my doctorate in uh, psychoanalysis. Because that's what you do when you have to. <laughs> right. And but you're very much like that. You, you have followed your own, you've blaze trailed your own uh, path, haven't you? So, you know, I. I do things, uh, something called uh, Speak Your Mind, and it's a live show, if you like, a panel. Right. And I did it at uh, Groucho's. So I had psychotherapists talking to the audience about things, and I chose the subject of the hero's journey, you must know that, through Joseph Campbell. Right. And I thought, you're the epitome of the hero on his journey, because you created your own trail. You've gone down the road less trodden. You've opened doors when nobody else has been able to. You've stood your ground. And that's what you're saying when you get hecklers and people. You know who you are. There's something inside you. And the Greeks used to call that the daemon, your unique genius. And somehow you've allowed that to develop inside you, but also you've actually held on to that. How did you do that when you were being, you know, you were going on a new trail? How did you manage to hold on to that? Well, I didn't think it was a new trail. If you think about it, all I'm doing is Monty Python as a stand-up form, which I have said to Monty Python, thank you for the career. And they told me they wanted, Perry Gilliam told me he, they wanted it back, the, my career. <laughs> but it's, it's really, I'm not doing anything particularly. You know, I'm influenced in the stand-up version of what I'm doing by Richard Pryor and his chatting to characters, and Billy yeah. Connolly as well. Both of them had characters having a chat, slight turn of the head, and you could do sketch comedy on stage. I realised this because Billy did that wonderful uh, one available in the UK, which was an audience with LWT, which just murdered, yeah. you know, yeah. an entire audience of celebrities. But you could see they were not you know, happy to, you know, they weren't trying to laugh, they were just falling about in their seats. And I remember watching it thinking, this should be released, and it eventually was. It was such a perfect show. And the, in, the one, you know, when he was acting out the stuff and turning and playing characters, I thought, that's what I need to do. And I'd already gone through sketch, and then I'd learned street in order to play myself, and then I took it in. So I just carried on doing that, but I was very determined. That was the thing, and I knew, I thought America would work, because Python had already done America. So if they like Python, they should like me because they're my big heroes and I'm essentially doing surreal comedy like them. And then that worked. And so now I, and that's how it's happened. You add more to it, don't you? Because I, I actually quoted you in my PhD about, uh, you were sitting in a cab with a, a yellow cab driver talking about one of your pieces about the ego on stage. Right. What the, in in, America. Um, do you mean the joke about, that I had with a cab driver, or...? You were, you were explaining to him because he didn't recognise you or something, and you were actually... Oh, yes, yes. Yes, that yeah. was on the way back from Wembley. Yeah, yeah I should yeah. do that tonight, Sarah, make a note that, because that's a kind of a beautiful piece of... Um, I'd been to see Jesus Christ Superstar, which I do find interesting because it's, it's less a religious version of the story, more feels more historically based. Tim Rice, the way he took the lyrics. So it's great music and lyrics and in an arena, unusual. So I, I asked if I could go there, I got a ticket. There was an after party, that was great. And we'll come on in. And then going back, a bunch of us got a, shared a taxi and I'm sitting, was I in the front seat? I think I was in the front seat and the driver who was Asian British taxi driver and he'd never uh, seen me do stuff. It wouldn't be his cup of tea probably. Uh, but he was just like, and as you say, as we were, getting towards Piccadilly, you know, central London area, he said, will you be going back to Wembley? And I thought he meant about my career. I really thought, I'm getting through the Asian 
the British community. This is great. And I said, you know, well, yes, I think I have to, you know. I'm not sure, well, you know, why not? And I will be going back to Wembley. And he said, well, here's my card and I'll, I can pick you up later. And I said, oh, no, no, not tonight. Oh, I see. And my ego had gone off. In a, yes, <laughs> I will play at Wembley Arena again. But he was actually saying he'll, he'll give me a lift back because he'll be still in London. Uh, <laughs> so, but that uh, nice story to trip myself up. No, no, but it's great because, you know, somebody like you can introduce the whole world of the psyche to people and break down, you know, that's why I'm doing the Speak Your Mind into the public, for the public, because we talk about incidents that happen to them and how they overcome them. Yep. And, you know, the stories, as you were talking about, the psychological history, because both Freud and Jung started off at the same hospital. Right. And they started off the psychology, but then you've got all the philosophers before that. And, of course... You know, then you've got the great philosophers, Aristotle and the rest of it. But, you know, the whole psyche and how the psyche works, what people forget is we are also psychologically evolutionary. So as soon as you work something out about yourself, you're still moving forward. And you've still got to take something forward. But I think what I'm really interested in that you said is why is it that people hang on to such dark, um, you know, sort of the power, the dark power? And you're right that parents can often do that, which Hitler had, as you know, his stepfather used to beat him up terribly. And it was almost that sort of balance between his stepfather beating him up and his mother who totally adored him. Yep. You know, and That's... somehow the mind can't take that. Well, it was, I... I think that is the essence of the problem with Hitler, that he understood love with his mother and so could portray that, you know, with dogs and children as he did. He did yeah. seem to, I don't think he was faking that, but he, he said, you know, something like he hated his stepfather, but he respected him for beating the crap out of him. So he was going to beat the crap out of the rest of humanity. And, and he never really faced it. Interestingly, he was a runner in the First World War, so he never really faced this, you know, head on. And in the Second World War, he never fought at the end of uh, in, from the bunker, he didn't come out, didn't pick up a gun, didn't go for it, didn't try and go down fighting. He just took an easy way out for him, and uh, just lying there on a sofa and having taking uh, some poison. But you know, he, he just never faced that, and he was sociopath, psychopath. All these bad things rolled into one, and lied upon lied upon lie upon lie, and that is a, that is a playbook that certain you know. Trump is slightly different because he hasn't done a world war, but he has lied upon lied upon lie. And if you imagine if Hitler only had four years, he would have been out in in 33 and out in 37. There would not have been all this murder and destruction. Imagine Trump had another four years. What could have happened? They're worried about the next 10 days with Trump. He is so unhinged. He is so disgraceful. Anyway. Yeah. But you know, I think what, you're, what we're talking about is elevated power, because there's a lot of people out there that are, that's what Hitler was in his Bavarian castle. He was so high up and everybody else did his bidding that yep. they thought should be done. You know, Goebbels and Hess and Himmler. And a lot of people just did what they interpreted as the um, Nazi movement. Yep. And I think that's the tragedy that people follow in that way. But uh, I think what... My biggest tragedy of our world, apart from politically there's a tragedy going on globally, is that the fact that they're stopping people talking in the comedy sphere. That they're stopping people actually saying what they need to say. What do you think about that? Well, okay, you've got freedom of speech, and I do understand that. You've got censorship. There's this political correctness. I think the word is a bad word. It should be positive attitude. Yeah. Now, if you're saying... I'm going to talk about black people now, and I'm going to attack them with my comedy. That yeah. does not seem a positive thing. Now, people would say, well, you should have the right to do that. Well, I don't think so. They've been through hell. They've yeah, been through yeah. absolute hell, the worst situation. I think women have been through hell. Uh, people whose skin colors are other than black have been through hell. But I say black people and slavery, it always tends to come down to them. In America, it's been through absolute, it's crimes against humanity again and again. And if you track, I know a lot about the American Civil War, you track the winning of that with Grant essentially winning it, General Grant and Lincoln, and you take it on 99 years before LBJ could come up with um, a constitutional change that would ensure that black people could vote, African-American people could vote, 
in elections because the South had twisted everything. You saw a Confederate flag in the White House. They're still replaying this thing. They still want the right to behave in a racist way. And it, when Trump said, grab women by the pussy, sexist, be sex, he gave people permission to behave in a disgusting way. So I believe your comedy should, you can attack power groups, but not empowered groups. You know, no, black no, I totally agree. That's what I feel. And it gets, it gets confusing when some say, we can say anything. Well, that means that you can start attacking women again, start attacking no, black no, people no. again. And I say no, because that it doesn't go anywhere. And, and if you do it to a black, okay, if you're going to attack black people, stand in front of a black audience and then attack them and then see what happens. And it was always, you know, if you take about the, the white supremacists, they were doing it in southern states. It was always one black guy against a whole load of white people with the law on their hands. If you see Mississippi burning, you can see the example of that. That's in the 60s. And the war was won in 1865. So it's just incredible how long hatred and racism and sexism can hang on. Women should have had equal rights since 70,000 years ago. I do not believe you should be standing on stage and you know doing my wife, my wife, she's so, uh, my, 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 my mother-in-law so, you know, these negative jokes. I, that's what I disagree with. Positive attitude, yes. P um, political correctness, no. It's a, it's a different word, but it's, you know, certain things are hate crimes. Otherwise we say in life, people can come to me, I'm a trans person, I say, a lot of hell to me and they're allowed to they have been allowed to get away with it for centuries and millennia but now British law has changed it's now a hate crime so if things are hate crimes I don't think you should do hate crimes on stage no no I, I agree with that because when I started Jonglers I had I was a, like the comedy police I set up so that you could be you couldn't say anything homophobic so if anybody came from America that had anything homophobic sexist or racist in their material. They either didn't perform or they cut it out. Right. So, so what? So what is the area between what I'm saying and no, where you feel? Right. right. No, because I think it, there's an area where they're saying. I mean, I believe in self-deprecation. So I'm Polish. If I go on stage and talk about me being Polish and the experiences I've had, Polish English. I can take the mickey out of that. Yeah, you're absolutely okay. allowed to. And Jewish people, and uh, yeah. black, black people, like anyone, I can take the piss out of trans itself, as I am trans, but other yeah. people are not allowed to. That, exactly. Uh, that, I think, is the rule. Yeah, so, I think that has to be the rule, and I think it's just gone a little bit too far. But there are, yeah. well, I, I would also say there are power minorities, like, like monarchy is a minority, but it's, it's hugely powerful, hugely rich. So I feel that it's fair game. Um, yeah, yeah, the no, super, totally. I agree with that. The too. super rich, should, small that's group. That's the whole people. idea, though. Our, our British, our British history. I was born here, so I feel, you know, my heart's Polish, yeah. but the rest of it's British. But you know, in our, the court of the English kings and queens was that they had um, a joker once a year that was allowed, the clown that was allowed to turn the history over, and that everything the king had said or queen had directed, they could turn it on its head. Yeah, and I, and think, I love that aspect of, uh, the, I mean, to me, the British language, the second language is humour. I think, I love that, I, having, yeah. having played 45 countries, I would say that's human beings because they do exactly. say there's a British sense of humor, Polish, a Chinese, a Venezuelan. I do not believe that to be true. Having traveled there, having performed in four languages, I think there's broadly a mainstream sense of humor in every country, and there is a more alternative sense of humor in every country, and the alternative is more Python, what I do, Off the Wall, Sean Locke, this kind of crazy stuff. The Simpsons is very alternative. Was yeah. was more interesting. If you watch The Simpsons, because they got, I think, 31 seasons of, of Simpsons, and it starts mainstream plus a bit of alternative. And now it is really off the wall, very subtle, very dry. Dan Castellaneta and the writers there, Al Jean, just keeping it going um, in, a, in an amazing way. Um, so, so that is the alternative thing. And that has an alternative audience, just like alternative music has an audience around the world and mainstream pop has an audience around the world. So they're different audiences as opposed to nationalistic. There's no national. Uh, even though we've got great comedy here, I don't think it's British. Because if you say it's British, is it, is it, uh, is it Jim? Uh, is it one of the mainstream comedians in the 70s, or is it a Monty Python, which are way different? 
you know, um, we, we've got racist and sexist comedians still playing away. Is it them or is it, or is it Python, which is completely surreal out there and off the wall? So but in my early days, I had people like, um, he was the first rapper on the circuit. Uh, gosh, now his name's totally gone from my head. Equally, uh, you know, Mike Myers used to do stuff at Jonglers as well. Yes, Mike was there, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Judy Tanuta said one of the funniest things about, you know, I learned about psychotics because she was talking about, um, you know, so when you learn that psychotics can't laugh. Right. They can laugh at others, but not at themselves. Ah, yes. And I think that's quite a big one. Um, Benjamin Zephaniah, that's right. what I was thinking of. Right. He used to perform for me. He used to close the show. In the days before you had to be, you know, sort of a cookie cutter comedian, which is, you know, where a lot of people are today. You it know, is. Sort of with a certain type of humour, you had to look like a certain type. I quite liked the anarchy of that time. Well, yeah. I think I didn't, I, don't, I was already out as trans, but I don't think I was wearing makeup. I'm pretty sure I wasn't until I left the circuit because I felt the circuit or people arranging the circuit, they wouldn't be able to deal with it. I had to do, do a show on my own, you know, so it's me, yeah, it's yeah. just me, and I'm wearing a dress, I'm wearing lipstick, and that's where we're going, kids. And I had to test out that, that was in 1991 when I, 1992. I left on the Christmas of 91, but I was, I was a bad, you know, I was, I was okay at sketch comedy when I started in the early 80s. Um, very bad at street performing, got better at that. Very bad at stand-up, but got better at that. And so, I do think any young stand-ups out there listening, you, you, when you start, you probably will be awful, but you can get better. Time on stage is the, is the necessary I, thing. You've just got to do it, you've got to do it. I did 10 minutes stand-up for charity. And it was the best thing I ever did to learn about myself. Right. It's such an interesting process, but I did it in the traditional sense. So I did it in six weeks. So I was given this mission, if I wanted to raise some money to do 10 minute stand up. And I thought, okay, of course, yeah, I can do that. I don't mean it in a flippant way, because I know it's not easy, but that's more my style. Yeah, I can do that. And I, by the time I got on stage, I was so myopic. <laughs> I'm not like you because you, you are so um, at ease on the stage. It's well, almost you take things from an audience. You can actually just flow and blend with things on the stage and twist and turn. But that, that, me, that comes from Billy. That comes from Billy. I studied him and I thought, Billy is so relaxed. How is he so relaxed? And that's hours on stage. If you do your own show, you end up doing hour, hour and a half on stage. Sorry, I interrupted you. Carry on. Yeah, yeah no, totally. And, uh, but I decided to do one-liners because as you can hear, that's the far, I speak in quite a fast way. And so I had 16 one-liners that I had rehearsed and rehearsed, got on stage and couldn't remember one of them. Yes. But my saving grace was my opening line. So I did the self-deprecation, I knew that. And then to talk about being Polish, you know, again, because, and there were no Polish people in the audience, which I was quite disappointed. Right. <laughs> After all these years. But how do you fancy learning Polish? It's such a hard language. Well, Ru <laughs> Russian is on my list. I've chosen my list carefully because as I say again and again, I'm not superhuman, I'm just determined human. I'm just an ordinary human who's got, got a determination thing to do things. So French, I'd learned that at school, did eight years of that, so that's now pretty good. Yeah. And I improvised in French, which is beautiful. Um, in two days time, on, I'll be running a, a virtual, I'll be running Vienna virtually, and then doing a gig in German on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. So I have to get my Deutsch in, uh, in good and order <laughs> because, you know, I'm very positive on the German people and they strive to say, nie wieder, nie wieder. There's the alt-right which has turned up the uh, alternative to Deutschland and that's the new Nazis coming along and uh, there's the good people out there campaigning against them whenever they march, saying, nie wieder, never again. And hopefully never. Germany can yeah. save the world in that way, in their example. And uh, Angela Merkel, great example of a great calm leader. Unfortunately, she has to go. But uh, so Russian is on, so German is there. Spanish is next, got such a big reach, so that's a very practical thing. I learned German at school, I did two years of that, so I find it a logical language. Um, but it's tricky. Spanish, if you've got French and English, not too bad to get to. Arabic, I was born in Yemen, you may know, I was born in Aden, in Aden in oh. Yemen. So I want to learn that, to be able to eventually go back to my home city, 
when it's not in a civil war and be able to do a gig in Arabic, that would be kind of a beautiful thing. Well, but that would be amazing. That's, that's right up there, sort of in the future. And Russian, because the Russian people, 25 million to 27 million people, Russian soldiers died, men and women fighting against fascism and it's in their great patriotic war. And uh, Shuikov, great generals, Shumayev, um, just very, you know, they, they, they helped us win because they took it. But only about half a million British died, which is hellish. Half a million Americans died, that's hellish. But 25 to 27 million Russians and then, died. And, people, and it, was, it was deplorable what was happening. My father was in one of the gulags right. in the north part of Siberia, which was freezing. But also these had already been set up that were murdering their own people. Yep. And I don't think people understand that, that they were already there. It was horrendous. Yeah. And, yeah, but do you, what's your, do you have a spiritual drive as well? Well, I'm not religious. I don't believe in a, in a mystical God. I believe in humanity. Humanity is my, is my belief. I believe there's more goodwill than ill will with us. I can link up with any spiritual leader. Um, I, and we just have to disagree on that. But any spiritual leader who's working with the community to try and help this, yeah, uh, yeah. this reverend in, uh, in Georgia, who's just Reverend Warnock, um, has just been elected the first black senator in Georgia. Fantastic. If you know the history of Georgia's southern state, one of the big hubs of the Confederacy, and now you have a black senator there, first time, and he's a Democrat, and he, you can just know he preached in the same church that Martin Luther King Jr. and Sr. preached in. And you can just know uh, that he's trying to help people in a very way. And I would you know, link up with anyone from whatever faith when they're helping people. We just, if we got into discussions about a mystical power, I don't think there's one there because if you track humanity and the history of the world and the universe, it doesn't look like a plan. It's a very weird plan. Whereas if you take God out of it, then the rolling of things, the way things happens, it just looks like it's people and characters and sometimes the, uh, the simplistic politicians like like uh, Hitler coming along and saying, come on, Germany's going to rule the world. And people go, oh, I'll buy into that. And yeah, I just, I'm, I think it's us. We have to connect, make stronger connections um, than people trying to separate at the moment. I'm trying to make even stronger connections than before because humanity must go forward. That's what I feel. But it is the power of the word that can help. Yep. Yes. And you know that because that's what you do. Yes, you've got to inspire with your words. It's a, and if you listen to Joe Biden's words, he is trying to calm down and inspire people to take a moderate path of living that live. And if you listen to Donald Trump's words, he's trying to separate. He's using lies as a tool of politics, absolute lying, making up any lie he wants to. He is an unhinged individual and should be impeached for the second time, if not a third time, if they had time. But, 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 you know that when, um, not that you're on this maniacal sort of journey, but you know when uh, um, Alexander the Great was going on off on his walls, obviously to follow in his father's footsteps, he took Aristotle with him. Who did, yeah. who did you turn to? Well, is politi somebody that you, you politically, actually? yeah, I turned to, they both passed away. One is, I think, of Nelson Mandela, on one side and, and uh, Abraham Lincoln on the other side. Those two political talisman are my yeah. guide stones. That's how I do. Anyway, I'm gonna have to talk, uh, jump off, Bria. I'm gonna talk to next Thank guest. You. It's been brilliant talking to you, obviously. Great Thank talking you. to you. And you take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you. Bye. 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 Okie dokie. So, now, I am going to uh, talk to Sarah Kay, is that uh, Sarah Kay Mayer? So my eye, so I got one lens in Mailer. I'm sorry, Sarah Kay. Sarah Kay Mailer. And I'm uh, going to have a chat with Sarah Kay. Is she, is she available? We're, we're just moving over between Zoom and Okay, thank you. Oh. So, if you'd like to donate, ediezo.com, you could donate through there, through Crowdfunder, just press the button when you get the ediezo.com, the support us button, and you can buy hats, make humanity great again, hats in blue, and masks and shirts.
Also scroll down that front page and you can find more details. You can send text if you have a, a UK phone to 70810. Just write in letters, write 10 or 20. It doesn't matter if they're uppercase or lowercase. I mean, we always print it in uppercase, but I've fiddled around with it. It seems to work any which way. So, yeah. Do, do that. And then you can buy tickets for tonight's show, 7 p.m. Show in English tonight, Sunday, tomorrow, Monday, also English show. Tuesday will be a German show, as we are celebrating Vienna and, uh, and, and therefore uh, where German is the language, of course, spoken. And I have an okayish German. It's not, it's not great. I just listen, listen back to one of my old shows, and uh, I thought I was in quite a confident place in my German, but it actually. I, keep, I, I listen to the audience and they're not laughing that much, and I realize because my, my German is kind of sporadic. But anyway, I will try hard. Hi there. Hello. How are you? So, okay, hi. Hi, hi, I'm good. How are you doing? I am okay. Where are you in the world? Uh, I am in Wigan. Oh, in right. And how are you getting on in Wigan? I suppose it's as difficult, probably the same as the rest of us. It's all very tough, yeah, in Wigan? Yeah, it's uh, back in lockdown and it's been snowing here, so it's oh, very, wow. very cold. Yeah, is, does it look nice? Hopefully, because we get occasional snow and it looks nice when it comes down, but then you get a bit bored with it and it sticks around. How does yeah, it look? Yeah, we've got quite a lot this time. Does it look nice out the window? That's my point. It does. It's a uh, nice. It's starting to thaw now a little oh, bit. All right. The last few days, it's been quite thick. There you go. <laughs> so tell us about yourself. I have, I've got a lot of information written above in front of me, but I've only got my like close reading lens in. <laughs> and uh, so yes, tell us about yourself. And do you prefer Sarah Kay or Sarah or? Uh, Sarah's fine. Yeah, Sarah. Sarah's fine. <laughs> Sarah, tell the world about yourself. And you've donated. I believe. Hopefully, you've. You've been to the donation button, yes. Yeah, so thank you so much for doing that. Um, but yeah, far away. Tell us then. Uh, so I moved back to the UK. I came, I was teaching in Dubai for the last seven years. Oh, wow. Um, but we, I decided to come back in June last year when all the lockdowns started. Right. And uh, I've come back to my hometown in Wigan uh, with all my family here, which is absolutely wonderful. And I'm now a teaching assistant at the local high school. Okay, and I take it, are you doing virtual teaching at the moment? Yes, yeah, it's, it's all turned to online. We do have a rotor system though at the moment, so I will be in next week with some of our vulnerable children and students who, who need to obviously be in school, key workers, student uh, children, and things like that. So in Dubai, I take it you were teaching English speaking kids in Dubai, yeah. right? And yeah, really. Is it, um, and are those people who are their working jobs, their parents are working in Dubai? Would that be right? Uh, yeah, I mean, the school that we were at, it was a uh, large majority of Emirati students, so their, oh. their mother tongue is Arabic, and but we would teach bilingually within the school, so I would teach in English, but they'd have also the Arabic lessons and, and the, the ch children were great. They can flip between the language, languages just like that. <laughs> Excellent. So, because I, my, my, I was out in Abu Dhabi, uh, a sister Emirati to Dubai, which was back in 1973 or four, I think I was there. So a long time ago, and we drove to Dubai on the one road, that big. There's a one there's straight there's road. There's probably a lot there. <laughs> well, Dubai was mainly a port town and. It was, a, I remember, a market. The, all those buildings weren't there. Is it, is it a little bit surreal um, living in, in Dubai? Because it's quite space age, isn't it? Yeah, I, I remember the first, what, what, the first night that I was there, and we were driving around, and it, like, I felt so tiny, these huge skyscrapers, because we're not used to such big skyscrapers here, especially up north. And, um, but I was really fascinated with the metro lines and like these gold domes. And I was just, it looks like something from a sci-fi movie. It's incredible. And 
so do you say the majority of your school was Emirati kids? Yeah, yeah. Right, and uh, are their parents uh, professionals or they work in markets or was it a fee paying school or was it? Uh, yeah, it's a, a private school, so a lot of their parents were working, uh, yeah. and it's a, an IB school, so International Baccalaureate. Oh, I got you, International Baccalaureate. Right. Yeah. And, uh, so, sorry, carry on. Oh, it's, it's, it's quite a, an interesting curriculum, and how like they cross-connect all the different subjects, which I really enjoyed. Rather than just doing English, you did have to like connect with geography, and science, and maths, and actually how the whole world connects together rather than separate subjects. That is very good. I mean, I'm about making humanity great again as opposed to making individual countries in a separate way great again. I just think we've got to reach out to everyone and make the world work this century, 21st century, the coming of age of humanity, I believe. It's and really important getting the generation ready yeah. They're taking the planet after us, they've got to... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they've got to hopefully be looking to other people from around the world and looking at them as equals and saying, what can I learn from you, what can you learn from me, what can we learn from each other? That's mm -hmm. the way forward, as opposed to this, this uh, nationalism. We have ideas and you people are lesser than us, which I hate, and we mm -hmm. did that in the 1930s. Um, did you pick up any Arabic? I take it you, you know, uh, sh shock right? Um, very, very little, little bits. My husband actually was a lot better than, than I was. Oh, that's good. But, uh, salam alaikum. Uh, yeah. <laughs> alaikum salam. Uh, and then, then you, uh, shukran. Did you pick up shukran? Is it? Shukran. Yeah, shukran. Shukran. shukran <laughs> thank you. Shukran. Thank you. And <laughs> uh, salam alaikum is uh, peace be with you. And uh, yes, there's a number of things. I you know, go to any country, try and pick it up. Was your husband a teacher as well in the school? Yeah, we, we taught at the same school, so we were, we were very, very lucky. Uh, I, actually, I met him in my school here but when I was teaching in Leeds, and then we moved together <laughs> to Dubai, and we're still in the same school. <laughs> right. Right. So, so now you're going to be back in Wigan. I take it when COVID finishes, will you go back, or do you think you're going to stay in the UK for a bit, or? Uh, no, I think we're, we've been there long enough, and I had my little baby girl in 2019. Right. And as, as much as I, I love Dubai, that you can't replace having family and that village to sort of support you and, and be together. So we're, we're ready to be back and everyone together again. Gotcha. I think the lockdown really makes people think what's important to you. And so, I think that really hit home. I was like, I, I miss my family. I want to be back, back home. Yes. Yes, indeed. It's a, it's a tough time. And I, I do worry. I don't worry. I actually think that, um, you know, we, we were 20,000 people 200,000 years ago. We're now 7.8 billion. And uh, David Attenborough has mentioned in his latest show the figures mm -hmm. that were 30 about a third of the world, 33%, are humans. Uh, another 60% are animals that we slaughter to eat, and only 4% are wild animals. And that is a that is a bad balance in the world. And I think another co another COVID type thing is going to happen because if they had a SARS, they had an Ebola, they had a way back they had a Spanish flu in 1919. I think they're going to come again. We need to be ready the next time. We need to. We, and people don't like lockdown, but it's, it's, uh, some people don't believe that this is happening, which is very weird. It's just, uh, I don't know. strange. I, <laughs> I, I liked when we were talking with Dr. Nara before about learning from the past and, and learning these mistakes that we've made and making sure that we don't do them again. Yes, well, this is the problem of human beings is that we constantly do things and then time passes. I mean, if I talked about the Second World War, a number of people in the UK or around the world would say, well, what was that? And you go, well, you don't know about that? Oh my God, it's, uh, we have to learn not to do it. That's why the European Union was set up. I'm still a proud European. And uh, we set it up to stop us having world wars. So if we go back into the, the separation, the retreat into this, this isolationism, 
then it just sets it up for someone else to come along and start another one. And we've been through so many of them, so this is, uh, people forgot all about that. But, but going forward, so you're teaching uh, um, many different things, drama. Um, um, but I'm a, a learning support assistant, so I help a lot of students with learning difficulties within the school and um, helping them with their sort of their studies and coping mechanisms within in the classroom. Right. Um, so it's actually a new role for me because I was obviously a a, a, a teacher, uh, but when I've come home, I've taken on the role as a learning support. Oh right, okay. So it's a different gig. Yeah, okay. I have to sort of remember my role, but. It's really enlightening actually seeing from the perspective of a student what it's like to be in school and the class to class, and especially if they've got learning difficulties, like, well, how are they engaging with the teacher? How, how are they able to access the information? And I'm actually, like, doing some more professional development and of how to help children individually, which I think I'm, I'm finding very satisfying and enjoying that side of getting to know a student really personally. Right, that's good. That's wonderful. So, yes, and I believe, and I've mentioned you've donated, but you've also got tickets for tonight's show, I right hear. I do, yeah, I'm yeah. really excited. Well, you'll see a very weird show if you've ever seen my shows before. Um, <laughs> you have that comedy and it's I'm doing a, going through some of the older pieces and talking about them and bringing them back to life, remixing. But also, I am knackered, so. You'll have to bear with me a little bit. I don't know how you do it. I mean, you can do a show after doing the marathon. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not sure, because I'm, I'm only a third of the way through now. And, uh, I'm not sure where I'm going to get the extra energy to, to keep going, especially when I go into German or French shows. I'm doing a German show on the, on, the, uh, on Tuesday night, so that's going to be tough. The French show will be easy. My French is stronger. but. Uh, we shall see, we shall see. Okay. How do you find that with switching between two languages? Well, it, like, it, because it, just sometimes you fall into another language and you have to sort of correct yourself. Well, the better you get it, the, the easier it is to fall into it. So in French, it's pas de problème. Si je fais un spectacle à ce moment-là, c'est pas de problème. You know, because I can, I can just jump into French and I don't even have to think what is the word for that. Um, I'll just say, ah, nous avons ici un studio, et je suis sur un uh, um, uh, runner, I don't know what it is, a treadmill en anglais, je dis un treadmill, and then I say, qu'est-ce que c'est le mot pour treadmill? If I don't know a word, I just say at the office, qu'est-ce que c'est le mot pour treadmill? And if it's modern like treadmill, it'd probably be something like treadmill. But, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, it's like computer in French, you can't say on peut dire computer, but ordinateur is the word they have for it, so. It's uh, it's not, it's not too hard. But uh, German's going to be mehr schwierig, harder, hard for me, more more hard. But uh, I will struggle up well. But now I'm going to say thank you. Thank you for donating. Anyone want to donate? Go to eliezer.com. You can donate there for these great charities we're raising money for. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah K. Nice to meet you. And I'll see you. I'll see you tonight out there. Okay. Cheers. Bye. All right. Now, Dave, I'm going to, it's a loose stop again I'm going for. So, uh, just going to power down there. Go the ah. Having a quick break. Twenty million are living in food insecurity since conflict escalated. Ten million people are at risk of famine. Three million to four million uh, people are displaced. The damaged infrastructure has hit the water supply for humanitarian assistance are about 80%. So COVID in Yemen is a crisis on a crisis on a crisis. Of course, uh, funding for COVID-19 needs to come on top of the funding to respond to the pre-existing needs.
قالوا ذا الكورونا ما ادري ايش احنا مرضنا كمان انا وحده من الناس ثاني اللي اسبوع مريضه ما قدرت تضرب حبه ابره مخلق يراني اللي مريض اللي ما عياله واللي زوجته واللي هو ما قدرناش نعمل ولا اي حاجه والاكل ما فيش احيانا ناكل احيانا لا داخل ما فيش The COVID-19 make uh, the WASH team think about new ways of supporting communities in Amran city. Here will support the local authorities in reconnecting or rehabilitating the sewage system for the city to support hospitals that have uh, reproductive health uh, warden and hospitals which have isolation centers provide them with water supply directly or to fix their uh, water supply network. With the water scare in most of the households, people would prefer to keep water for drinking and cooking. Cleaning will be their last priority. So the awareness raising were intense. The team used the different local uh, media outlets, like local radios and TVs, to reach uh, most of the population. قبل ثلاثة أشهر جارتي سماح أجاءت عندنا وعلمتني الطريقة الصحيحة لغسل اليدين كمان علمتني إجراءات الوقاية من كورونا من ذاك اليوم وأنا أعلم صديقاتي الطريقة الصحيحة لغسل اليدين إحنا كلنا أبطال ونقدر نقضى على فيروس كورونا بطرق بسيطة ونرجع للمدرسة ونحقق أحلامنا COVID had a dramatic impact on Yemen economy and businesses had closed. So as much as we can, we try to uh, support people by doing cash transfer. So the main thing that we change in distribution points, uh, we installed hand washing gas stations. With all this crisis with, uh, that uh, people are facing, Yemeni people are still trying to find means to survive and supporting each other in a way or another. Also, their positiveness in receiving any support they get from any um, humanitarian actor give fulfillment to everyone working in a humanitarian sector in Yemen. NTD. It's not terribly descriptive. Needlessly tricky denomination. We need to disentangle. Need to define. Nothing to declare. National Turnip Day. Never tickle dinosaurs. No, that's daft. Now the disclosure. Neglected tropical diseases. Not that difficult. Neglected though? Deserted. Disenfranchised. Desperate. Dying. No, that's dreadful. Now these diseases need to discontinue, need to disappear. Never mind the difficulties. No more tedious delays. Now's the decade. Nations together declare no to disease, no to discrimination. Nobody treated differently. Neglected tropical diseases. End the neglect. Hi, I'm Kevin Ryan, the President and CEO of Covenant House International. For nearly 50 years, Covenant House has been a place of promise and of hope for young people experiencing homelessness. Now more than ever, we need partners in the community to unite with us to end youth homelessness. Every person deserves a safe place to sleep and hope for a brighter tomorrow. 
For young people, homelessness interrupts progress toward adulthood and a future of independence and self-sufficiency. Covenant House's doors are always open to all young people who need housing and help regardless of their race or their religion, their sexual orientation, their gender identity or expression. Our trauma-informed services help bridge the gap between potential and progress. And we also advocate for systemic change through public policy while promoting awareness of the critical issues related to youth homelessness. The Covenant House mission is centered and built on community, where youth and staff and volunteers and our partners love one another unconditionally, respect each other absolutely, and dedicate ourselves to a covenant of compassion and hope. Learn more about resilient young people at Covenant House and our life-affirming services at covenanthouse.org. Okay, so we're going on Facebook in, uh, in three minutes. Is that video they're playing? Because we can play it now. Okay, I'm gonna play your video from what I shot on the 10th of, uh, of, of February last year when I ran my marathon in Budapest. And then at uh, half past the hour, at the bottom of the hour, we are gonna be talking to Facebook. Anyone get on Facebook from 1.30? And I'll ask your questions, answer your questions until 2 p.m. That would be great. Sorry? From now? I want it now. Uh, this is Hungary. Hungary is in Budapest. Budapest, you may not know, but there's the river that goes between the, the city of Budapest, the city of Pesh. It's about Budapest. And it's got a sh sound in it as opposed to pst. Budapest. So, 10th marathon. I've always found when I do these, it's the 10th marathon, your brain sinks up, the body sinks up, and it starts getting somewhere. Anyway, off we go and see what's going to happen. This is the Shoes on the Danube Memorial. The arrow cross, the extreme right wing of Hungary at the end of the Second World War. They murdered Jewish people. They told them to take off their shoes and they shot them and they pushed them into the Danube. It's very sad. If you know about the Second World War, the whole thing is a horrendous time, but this is the extreme right murdering Jewish people, pushing their bodies in, and their shoes were left. Now, these aren't their shoes, but uh, this was, it's a monument that they're made out of uh, iron or metal, and it's, it's, a, it's a great tribute here in Hungary, here in Budapest, never again, this kind of thing will happen. If you come to Budapest, come and see it. Monumento de los Zapatos is, is how it's written in Google Maps. Okay. Uh, tenth marathon. Just beginning to rain. <sighs> no, no, no. Okay. So we're going to get those... Oh, I was going to get those in pieces. Uh, rather than shove them all together. But, uh, yes, that was me in Budapest on the 10th of February last year. Now the 10th of January, running Bochum running a Budapest virtual marathon. There you go. Uh, so now, Facebook questions from uh, now 1.30 in London. I'm in time. It's very chilly today. Do you find it cold today? Yeah, it feels a little colder today. Yeah. Just a, just a tad, yeah. We're going to have Sarah up on the screen. It feels cool. Well, it feels way colder to me. It feels like... I'm not sure why it's so cold. Are the windows even further open than usual? No, the same. But, yeah, I think maybe it is... I don't know, I'm looking outside. We've got, we have got cloud cover. I thought maybe less cloud cover it might be I'd like you to take a picture of those doors for Gary and just ask him... OK. What do we need that? Because it's... Yeah. It's weird. I have got my tea at the moment. So. Sorry? All right. I've got my tea. Yeah, it's not an immediate thing. So, Facebook, how are we looking? 
Um, so yes, so we should say, so we're going to do um, Facebook questions now. Um, so now is the time, everyone. I know we said wait till uh, 1.30 so we get to see what, the questions. It is, it is 1.30. But yes, it is 1.30, so now is the time to uh, post your questions uh, for Eddie. Um, so this is in the comment section of the live stream on Facebook. So uh, if anybody wants to do any questions, then go to the Facebook live stream and put your questions in the comments and we'll try and uh, get through as many as we can. Now you tell me when to get started. Okay, so ah, oh, great. That's the uh, obviously the point where Facebook reloads. Give me one second. I did just see a question come through though, asking, uh, and I'll I'll name check the person once it's back up and running. Um, but someone was asking, do you have uh, different um, running uh, outfits that you wear, or do you launder the same outfit each day? I have essentially two. I've got two pairs of leggings. I've actually got two tops, but I intend to be wearing the same one, but I launder every day. I do my own, shove it in my washing machine as soon as I get home. I've got an alarm to make sure I do it and uh, make sure that I don't forget. So yeah, it is, I am laundering shoes, of course, I don't wash, um, but everything else goes in the washing machine. and dries overnight so get it in go get it out as a short wash not too long I have to wait till that finishes I have to I have one of these kitchen units where obviously there's a washing machine behind the door and if I close that door it tends to finish and if I'm not noticing it when it finishes I don't I forget that it's in there so I have to leave the door open maybe I should set an alarm maybe <sighs> anyway so yes, every day I wash the clothes. And that was from that was Judy Hall. That question. Thank you, Judy. Uh, so let me uh, scroll through some more questions. Okay, so this is from Tracy Cameron, who asks, "What was your favourite marathon?" And this is Tracy from New Deer, Scotland. Well, one of my favourite ones was the uh, Mountain Zebra National Park in South Africa. Because you normally, if you ever go on a, into a national, uh, a wildlife national park in Africa, you'll be in a thing, a sharabang type vehicle with seats that sort of raise up and iron bars over the top. It's open, but it's um, apparently animals see shapes and uh, they know the big green metal thing that makes a noise with the engine is not edible. <laughs> so. They stay back. And there's a guy sitting on the front with a gun as well, just in case. But I was running outside that. I was running alongside the vehicle. So when we got to the top of the hill, to some of the lookout places, really looking out over Africa, that was amazing. Uh, the extra third of a marathon I ran at Somerset East was wonderful. These are some of the South African ones, but they are kind of amazing in my mind. Uh, and they were. They were very hot, but as you got used to the heat, they just became warm. Or they could be kind of beautiful. Uh, so running in the morning with the sunrise in South Africa, that was amazing. So yeah, uh, a lot of the South African ones were great. Finishing is also great. Uh, the double marathon in South Africa was not a fun experience. It was good to finish, but it was tough. Uh, yeah, yeah, those are mine. I think I do remember on the, the marathon in the uh, national park. I think the uh, park ranger who was with us, who, who had the gun, I remember or one of the park rangers. It was called Surprise. Yes, it was the best name. Well, the best name, hopefully, for uh, if an animal was going to be too pushy, they would be surprised by surprise. But I hope, hopefully, that surprise would never be surprised. But who was a lion there? Didn't expect that. No, no, I think uh, I think definitely that way around. No, it was great, but yeah, brilliant though. Um, next question uh, from Carol Yami, who asks, 
who says, Hi Eddie, what adjustments do you have to make to your diet while you're doing these challenges? More protein? Question mark. More carbs? Question mark. More food overall? Question mark. Well, I'm leaving it to physio Tim and nutritionist Jordan to work out things and you have a certain amount of carb, a minimal carb before you get off and run and, and then when you finish after the show I have something bigger <coughs> that has carb and protein and uh, protein before I go to bed as well so that's kind of what I do with uh, it's a, it's a it's complex or somewhat complex so I do let, do let other people work out exact times of doing things but uh, I mean it doesn't I'm sure it makes a difference but when you're in your 10th mouth it all feels a little rough especially when the front of my calf is just giving me a hard time and I don't know why it's just that one and not the other side trying to adjust the incline a bit, but it's not making much difference. Yeah, so that's what happens. Okay, so next question is from uh, Ellie Jones, who, this is a lovely thing, uh, Ellie says, please, please, can I make you an outfit? I'm a seamstress and love your style, you always look gorgeous. Well, thank you, that, that was, that's a lovely offer. Um, I have someone who does uh, is making outfits for me at the moment, so I'm kind of okay. I don't know how to follow up on that, but uh, but yeah. So thank you for the offer, and I'll just have to keep a note of it. But uh, I have someone I work with generally, and who is making outfits for me when I request. Can I have something a bit like this, or a dress a bit like this? And uh, so. It's great working with her, Philippa. Yes, so okay. thank you, but I'll have to just bear it in mind. Next question is from uh, Christopher Michaels, uh, who says that uh, they're watching from Budapest. Uh, their question is, uh, which is the most beautiful city you have run around? Ah, well, I'd, I'd never go in and say this one rather than that one, but... Um, It's uh, a lot of different cities have amazing things going for them. I always look for interesting stuff in each one. And uh, Budapest does have the Danube. We think we're we pretty sure it's the Danube, isn't it? It is, the, yes. Says, I did yeah, check. Yeah, the Danube. Going through it. So that just looks amazing. Um, but uh, a lot of different cities. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in Paris, working in Paris, doing my gigs in French. So. When I perform at La Nouvelle Seine in Paris, it's a barge. You can look it up on Google Maps, La Nouvelle Seine, it's E I N E, as in the name of the river, even though it's a play on words for S C E N E, which is a new scene. And uh, in, on that barge, they have a theatre downstairs and a restaurant upstairs, and you can look over the Seine River and Notre Dame just ahead of you. It's quite beautiful. So that's that's like one of my favourite places to get to. And I stay in Montmartre when I play Paris, so that's beautiful as well. The La Butte, the uh, small hill. It's a great high spot in Paris. You can look over all of Paris from it. Okay, so next question is from Anne A. Kerry, who says uh, or who asks. Uh, have you ever been interested to learn Welsh or Gaelic, Eddie? Um, I tried to learn Welsh. I got a phrase book. In my teenage years, I went to uh, up in near uh, Port Merion, where the, the Prisoner series was shot, and uh, Port Maddock, uh, North West Wales. Stayed in a lock cabin for the family. Probably one of the last family teenage holidays while I was a teenager. Uh, before you sort of want to do your holidays on your own. And I tried to, but as a dyslexic person, I found it very hard uh, coming through the Roman languages of French, having learned some German, 
German, I thought was going to be very tricky, but I find it quite logical. Buchhandler. Buchhandler, that's a bookshop. You know. uh, but the pronunciation of Welsh I found tricky. And Gaelic, I, my trouble is I would, I would like to have all languages at my fingertips, but I don't want to learn a bit. I want to learn the whole thing and, and use them in shows. And I only have so much brain space. That's the trouble. Um, I'm not superhuman, I'm just a determined human. And uh, so I've got six languages on my list, and I've got four of them. Well, I've got five languages on my list apart from English, and three of them are up and running. So I've got to get Spanish better, I've got to get German better, then Arabic, and then Russian. So that's, that's what I've got to do. That's the way I'm going to do it. So, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm not, I haven't learned everything, every language going, but I want to. I, I, I would like to, but I just don't think I'll be able to do it. Just going to, oh, okay. okay, next question is from Stephanie Kick Johnson, who uh, says, I have seen you both times you played Cincinnati, Ohio, it's in the USA. Uh, do you always learn history for the cities you play? Um, I would like to, again, I'd like to, I'd like to do bits in the language that I'm in. I'm a little bit lazy though. So, uh, sometimes I already know history, but I don't inhale the whole of the history because there's you, energy, you've just got to work on the amount of energy that you have in your body and it's, it gets a little bit tricky. So yes, again, it'd be nice if someone just stood there and told me things, I could take that in. But uh, I tend to try and have relaxation and energy and, and then perform, because I have to perform every night or a lot of nights when I'm on tour. So that's the problem. So yes, and I'm imperfect at that, but I do know quite a lot of history, so I do try and hold things in my mind. Anyway, I already have some information or a fair bit of information in my mind about where I'm going. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay. Uh, next question is from Anita Clemenson, who asks, how do you sleep in the midst of these marathon streaks? Um, I'm taking a, a homeopathic uh, sleeping pill. I found that from when I started doing these back in 2009, the body, if you're really pushing it, it wants to wake up all the time. So I still wake up, but I try and do that to help me uh, sleep, get a good sleep. Um, so that's what I do. I think it's called Nitol. Is it called something like that? It's from Boost, from our chemist, you know, it's a non-prescription homeopathic uh, pill. That's what I do to try and help have an easier sleep. Okay, next question is from Dinny Templeman, who uh, asks, have you ever thought about doing a film with uh, Taika Waititi? Uh, when I saw Jojo Rabbit, it reminded me of your humour. Um, no, I haven't. Uh, it's not that I've, you know, I just haven't been asked, so I'm up for working with any good people, but uh, I'm making my own films now. I've got to make more. And, but uh, yeah, I'm open for anything. So any good directors, good actors, good cinematographers in the drama area, I want to do. I just don't want to do comedies. That's not on my list. I do enough comedy separately. Okay, so next question is from Amanda Hidalgo Mason, who says, Eddie, what do you like to do in your downtime? Sleeping is a very good thing to do in downtime, because uh, we've all, all got <coughs> the COVID thing going on. Been watching a lot of streaming series, dramas, and, and uh, films. So that's something I like to do anyway. Uh, black and white films. Be nice to do that now. On a Sunday, is it a Sunday where everyone is? Yes, it is Sunday, yes. Yeah, I'd like to do that, but uh, unfortunately, uh, I am doing this 
so, uh, yeah, we're just, uh, just resting and relaxing. I don't really have an overt hobby. Because uh, my hobbies really were acting and doing comedy, and I'm doing that now. Yeah, that's how that works. Okay, so next question is from Michael uh, Bogers, who said, who asks, are you currently working on a new comedy special? If so, what is the theme? Thanks for all you do, Eddie. Mike from Indianapolis, USA. Uh, Mike, no, I'm not working on a new one. I'm going into politics, so uh, new material might come to my head and there won't be a theme. I tend not to have themes. I just look for stuff that I find interesting to put into a show. Uh, and give it a name and give it a shape. But I'm not, I'm looking to put forward, that's what the shows I'm doing at 7 p.m. London time every evening. I am doing shows which are compiling uh, pieces of uh, best of series, a uh, best of show with some pieces I've done before, trying to remix them into a good shape, uh, refine the, the comedy in them. So. That's what I'm doing at the moment. Except the three shows, the two I'm going to do in German, one on the 12th, one on the 23rd, and the one on 28th in French. And they will be wunderbar shows. They will track my last show. But the English ones are, the English ones are always the best of shows. So that's where we are at the moment. Thank you. Okay, next question is from Nick Barr, who says, uh, Hi Eddie, I haven't seen you in movies for a while. Do you have plans to do more movie acting when all this uh, CV nonsense is over? You were such fun in Mystery Men, um, I know, a while ago, they say. Yes, I'm afraid I've been doing drama since that Mystery Men is more of a comedy, but that was back in 98, I think. Um, since then, I have done a, a lot of dramas that you might have missed you. The Richard series uh, and the United States of Tara, Hannibal TV series, uh, films 12, Ocean's 12, Ocean's 13, uh, Treasure Island, Lost Christmas, uh, Valkyrie, Victoria and Abdul, quite recently, and uh, Six Minutes of Midnight is about to come out, Judy Dench, Jim Broadbent, and myself uh, in that set in 1939, just before the eve of war and in Bexhill on Sea. So that's going to be coming out uh, March 26th in America and in Britain. Uh, on March 26th. That seems to be the date we're locking down to. Uh, that's six minutes to midnight, so that's a drama thriller set just before the break of World War II. Which essentially I think I'm starring in. But, uh, yeah, that will good to see out as we finish it in 2018 and I will be doing more in the future and making more films a TV series of my own oh, well that I'm not of my own but that I wish to, that I wish to make yeah. okay um, I am just going to do a little follow on question from Nick Barr again yeah. uh, so Nick uh, says hi Eddie my six year old Charlotte loves watching you run she wants to know uh, if you love unicorns because they're her favourite animal and if you've ever seen one. And he also says, um, Elle est bilingue, sa mère est française. And he says, we live in London. Elle est bilingue, oh wow. Um, non, un licorne en français. J'ai pas vu un licorne, I've never seen a, a, a unicorn. Je suis désolé, sorry about that. Mais uh, j'espère, I hope. Uh, the licorn exists, the unicorns exist, they're out there. Um, and I do I love the idea of them. J'aime beaucoup l'idée de licorn. And uh, they're out there running, they have to be running it seems. Or just hanging out, having something to eat. But yeah, they do seem a beautiful creature that uh, exists somewhere between reality and our imagination. The licorn, the unicorns. So thank you for that question. Merci beaucoup. Okay, next next question. Uh, this is uh, Jennifer Rancia says, um, I'm going through a very dark time and I would love to hear how you heal from a broken soul. 
that's a very tough, tough question. Tough one for Jennifer. Jennifer. I... I don't have an easy answer here. I think... Connecting, I'm not sure what has caused your dark time. I'm not in that situation to know, but... You have to reach out to friends. I think you have to... Oh, get help, reach out. I know the NHS is under a very tough time, but so it's going to have to be friends at the moment. It's the only way through. I. You can try and escape from your situation in your mind through watching adventure stories, films. I know that as a kid, that's something I did. I'm not saying you're a child, I don't know what age you are. I'm sure you're an adult, but, but uh, somewhere in the imaginations of, of other people that would be made into films or drama series, that could be a nice place to go and be for a while. Um, yeah, so I'm, af I'm afraid, sorry, I'm not, not a brilliant answer there. But uh, uh, ask friends for help. It's the, it's the best idea I can do and think of. And uh, try and find some story books, read books and streaming TV shows, something that will take your mind out of where you are until hopefully you can get to a better place. Uh, if you can do things that that are constructive for yourself, that uh, make you feel good about yourself in your situation, that's good, but I don't know what your situation is, so I can't suggest what that would be. You may not feel you want to do that, but somewhere between books, uh, some, some wonderful stories in books, or wonderful stories in, in films, they are more easy to get in these, these times of COVID, as you can download books and you can download films. There's my answer. Sorry, it's not brain. Okay, next question is from Richie Smith, who says, uh, my first time seeing Eddie was at Hysteria 3. What does Eddie remember from that show? Well, Hysteria 3. Hysteria 3 is run by Stephen Fry. Very interesting. I hadn't done any television. It's the first piece of television I did. And it was a benefit, so I thought I'll do this because that helps people. It's a benefit. It's two years ago. It was for uh, pushing back on AIDS, raising money for people combating AIDS, for suffering from AIDS. And it was at the Palladium, I believe. And I did a piece about being brought up by wolves. Oh yeah, that should be on my list, shouldn't it? Um, can you just note that down so I put the? I could talk about that tonight. But being brought up by wolves and that, because I forgot to talk about that the last few nights. Yes. Need to put it on the list. Um, just make a note of that. So yes, I I remember thinking, because I, you know, I'd been trying. This was 1990 or 91 when that happened. I think it was 91, and I'd been trying to get my my comedy career going for so long. But here was a lot of people, and it was on television, so I thought, let's try and do this well. And uh, this piece of being brought up by wolves was so surreal and bonkers, and people seemed to like it, so I thought that would work. And the people, some, two people had come to see me to check on what I was doing, to see if it was worth it. They'd heard that I was doing good work. And uh, they came and saw me, and I... I knew they were there, so I tried to do well, and I did a terrible gig. It just was awful, because I, I was pushing it, so I said, oh, well, don't worry about it. It's, uh, you just saw me do a rubbishy version of that, so that's that, let's just forget about that. And they said, no, we'll come back and see another one. So they came back either the next day or the next week. And that time I just thought, oh, I'll just do this as I relax. And, uh, and I relaxed and uh, did a, you know, really, it was a good, fun show. The piece went well, and they said, let's, let's, let's do it. So that became uh, being brought up by wolves. 
and a little bit about taxi drivers, mini cab drivers, um, who uh, would always tell me jokes if I said I was a comedian. So instead, I would tell them stuff about going on different journeys. So yeah, you need to see the bit. But uh, yeah, that was the first piece that had ever ever sort of got noticed by a lot of people all at once. So I was happy about that. Um, and hopefully it helped in the benefit. But yeah, that was Hysteria 3. That was, I think, 91, just before, but just after the, uh, the Edinburgh that year. Yeah. OK, next question is from uh, Karen Lindale, who says, Cereal, what is your favourite? Well, I think ricicles are my favourite, which are basically Rice Krispies with the sugar already put on. I think I might have put sugar on top of them. No, I didn't. That was the sugar, sugar on the Rice Krispies. But yeah, it's, it's really a sugar induction system uh, breakfast cereal for me. And uh, I do like in Seinfeld, but Jerry Seinfeld was often just eating breakfast cereal. I very much identified with that. Very easy thing to put together, but I had no break on it. I just couldn't. I'd get through a whole packet very quickly. Um, anything with the sugar coating already on, yeah. it didn't really matter in the end. I could eat them out of the box. I could just, if there was no milk, I'd just put my hand in. And, you know, like eating crisps, eating potato chips. So that was. Uh, that was my cereal career. That's gone now. My first bit of stand-up at work was being addicted to breakfast cereal. That was my first piece that ever got last in a, in a workshop gig. Yes, indeed. Okay, and I think um, probably a last, last question to do before we uh, move on, which I've just yeah. lost a person's name, but they said, um, uh, are you going to narrate any more uh, books? As they said you have a good a good voice for that. Thank you. Um, yes, I I probably I will narrate more books. Um, not quite sure at the moment, but uh, yes, I will. I th uh, I'm sure, uh, but probably not loads and loads because I'm I'm a slow reader and I have to read them first. But uh, yes, yeah. So. Yeah, audio book wise, what have I? I've audio, I've read my own biography, Believe Me, that's out there as a download audio book with lots of footnotes and footnotes on footnotes. And, uh, and also, uh, Great Expectations. Great Expectations, um, which is obviously Charles Dickens, and uh, over 20 hours of that masterwork book. And I now perform the show, an hour and a half version that my older brother Mark has adapted and adapted well. Because the David Lean film is two hours, but Mark got it to an hour and a half. And you may say, well, surely you've just cut it all up. But no, he was very careful on it. Even members of the Dickens family have come and seen it. And it seems to work. 21 characters out of the 28. And uh, a solo show. And I've done it on rooftops and gardens and then big halls and the Cadogan Hall up at Edinburgh in the music hall there. I played at the music hall in uh, the assembly rooms in George Street in Edinburgh 150 years after uh, Dickens had done his last ever show there. So that's, that's, quite, uh, that's quite wonderful to do. Um, yeah, but I'll do, I probably will do more, but not that much more, but they'll be very well, sure, they'll be carefully chosen things to do voiceovers too. Okay. Now we're going to talk to Graham, yeah? Is that all right? Yes, and I think I'll just check with Ian and Dave if we have uh, Graham with us. Graham's, uh, we're just getting Graham to stand by. I think his internet's frozen. So okay. As soon as he's unfrozen, we're going through. Very good. And I think we should mention that we're doing more questions later today. See more questions later yet yeah, from what time? Uh, I'm just going to pull that up. Uh, we are doing questions at 
four o'clock on Twitter. So if anybody has any more questions or if we didn't get through uh, to your question on uh, Facebook, then if you head over to Twitter for four o'clock, we'll be doing questions from there at four. Okay. You can always take any photographs of any questions that are there that left over that you feel should be asked during the day. Oh yes, yeah, that's true. Give that's it, it might be a few there. Yeah. If you wish to. Can you see what's in front of me, Sarah? Uh, no. There no, you can't bring me. Uh, Dave, you're probably out your eyeballs. Is Ian with you today, Dave? Hello, Ian's here. Yeah, Ian, if you can you see what's in front of me? Yeah. It's got the last line of Graham, it says, and the promotion of sports. Uh, Graham has spent 40 news running. Is that, ah, is that 40 I, I years copy running? I copied and pasted and did not check. Uh, 40 years, yes, I will change that, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and I do have Graham ready. Okie dokie. I'll pass you through. This is going to be fun. Hi, Graham. Uh -huh. Dave, can you, you punch, can you punch in on Graham a bit, make him a bit bigger in my screen, please? Um, I hope you can see me, you're quite small in my screen at the moment. It's internet oh. bandwidth. I'm oh, sorry. Internet bandwidth. Oh, right. So we, and we can't zoom in with the camera or anything? All no. uh, oh, right. So, well, I'm going to have to. I was thinking, ah, I'm going to see you because we've talked quite a lot, haven't we? I have. Oh. This is our first place to face. It's good to see you. Yes, good to see you too. You've been very helpful. And as you know, I've been, I've been kind of uh, choosy because uh, you. Uh, well, let's, let's uh, say you're the. Mizuno marketing manager in the UK, I take it, UK marketing manager, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right, yeah, and, um, and, uh, that's, and that's kind of how we got involved with, yeah. with, with this with this project, yeah, so... So you've been, um, Mizuno's been... Your... Sorry, I was just going to say, Mizuno's been sponsoring us, as people can see watching, here's the uh, the, uh, the uh, image, the logo, ah, I can see you much bigger now, the ah, image of Mizuno, great. yes, and... Uh, and so the top of the leggings and the shoes and everything you've, you've got and said it was, it was a little tricky to do because COVID was happening. And I was saying, do you have one with slightly different thing? Because that one doesn't work with me. As a trans person, I was trying to get things that worked and look good. So now I think we've got it. We've got it all working. And uh, 10th marathon, yeah. Did you think, I must, I didn't even think, you know, it's, I never think forward, but it's, it's beautiful to be in the 10th marathon talking to you, put it that way. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm pleased it's the 10 functions we've had. Yeah. Well, you, used to, you get to about 10, and that's when the kind of machine kicks in. You, you, you become a robot, and I was just checking the case. Oh, you're, 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 your sound is jumping about a bit there. Can you repeat your, that last line, Graham? Yeah, we talked earlier on the phone earlier this week. You said, not 10. It was about the time where you you started to become a bit more robotic. You you, you know the number was the one where you started to just feel a little bit better. Yeah, I'm going to choose a different word. A machine, I think. I'm happy to be a machine. Not so, not so wild about being a robot, but uh, yeah, it's it's like it, it becomes normalised. You know, the brain and the body they link up. As I yes, I did say this to you, and I said it to everyone. So I'm in the middle of the tent, so I don't quite feel there yet. But hopefully tomorrow. I will feel like, yes, we've started, yeah. and it should yes. get easier. And uh, yeah. so I'm very happy that Mizuno was pleased to come in. And you're, uh, as a company, I believe you have a philosophy of trying to help contributing to society. For I'm reading off here the advancement of sporting goods and promotion of sports. And you've been 40 oh, years you, running as well. Yeah, I mean, you've nailed it. You, you, you've got our corporate philosophy probably more down to pat than I have, so well done. I'm reading it off a screen. Of <laughs> I'm sorry. But yeah, that's great. I, you know, companies, some companies do not have any policy towards the general public apart from buy my goods and thank you very much. But, but Mizuno right. Right. looks at it in a different way, more positive. I think so. I think it comes a little bit from, it's a Japanese brand and it comes from there. And it, it, is, it is a powerful thing, sport, and you're embodying this right now, and, and that's why your values with all of your events, not just this one, we, we, we actually, I dropped, I dropped your, your team online a, a few years ago about doing something with you, and you were already um, 
partnered up. So it was really nice that the opportunity came round again. And so for us, with our corporate philosophy, exactly that of contributing to society, you know, through the good of sports, we've got it's a very long philosophy. We might need to shorten it. Might need to be a bit more punchy. Yeah. But, but the but the overview, it, yeah, the, the power of sport is so you know what, what you're doing now and, and how you're how you know, from from when you're a child, you learn so many values through sport. Um, you know, you learn teamwork. You you learn to lose. You learn to win. And you learn to be. You know, gracious about all of it, and, and, and so much more. And and the idea is, yeah, of course we make sports kit, and of course we market it, and we promote it, and we do all these things. But the idea that people are enjoying themselves in that, or are performing better in it, or yeah. are healthier because of it, and happier because of it, that's that's really at the bottom of what we do, and that's really why we thought this was such a good partnership with you, Eddie. And. Um, you know what, what what you're doing is incredible, and I'm, I won't be the first or last to, to say that. But it is unbelievably impressive for those who, who don't run or don't play sport to get their head around what you're doing. Is is it's unbelievable. It's, 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 you know, very very impressive. Well, thank you very much. It's um, I I sometimes have difficulty getting my head around it, especially like a. This is tough, the, the doing of it, the grinding it out. The chatting to you is, is much easier or much better. It helps me get out of my body. And uh, the front of my right calf is, is giving me drip at the moment. Not the left one, just the right one. Why that is, God knows. But uh, once I've finished it, then I have to get really quickly ready for the show. As you'll know, I'm doing a stand-up show at 7 p.m. every night, which is also bonkers, but hopefully good bonkers. But. Uh, that's the only time at the end of that show I can have some food, I can relax, I've got some sleeping. That's, that's the best time of the day. That's what I have to hold on to, that little bit. Kind of two hours, two and a half hours there of winding yeah. down. And then next morning we start the whole bloody thing again. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But, your, this, this thing with your calf, that's, it's the streets of Budapest. It's on a slight camber. <laughs> Yes, it must be a, a Budapest thing. They've got a great running, they've got an island. There's a running track there in the middle between Buda and Pesh. If you ever go there, that's where I run my, my do my training or do if I'm, if I'm performing there uh, or I did my marathon there as well. And I've, I filmed in Budapest as well. So one of my earlier films was there too. I don't know if you've ever oh, been, brilliant. have you been to Hungary, Budapest? I went to Budapest, yeah. yeah. I, I, I didn't find the island that you're talking about, but I did very much enjoy it. Very cosmopolitan, yeah. very laid back, really, yeah, really enjoyed Budapest. And there's a lot of, I mean, you, you've obviously ticked off a lot of European cities. I, I thought here, behind me, Eddie, I thought I'd bring a splash. I've been watching you, I've been watching what's going on, and your environment looks quite dark, so I thought I'd splash a bit of colour down the, the lens for you. Is that all right? Yes, that, that is great. Splashing anything behind you. Is that is that your photo that you've got that's virtually behind you, or is that your actual background? That's my actual background. That, that's, this is this is the living slash dining area. This is a, a, a painting. My, my partner's Brazilian, um, and, a, and a friend of hers painted this for us. It's, it's Recife in the northeast of Brazil. Oh, wow. I was, was going to find out if you've got any uh, Brazilian aspirations, Eddie. Oh, yes, I want to play in Brazil. I, unfortunately... Spanish is, is my f third extra language to learn, but they speak uh, Portuguese there, Portuguese. And I know that if I go to Rio de Janeiro, they said probably that's not the best city to play for if I'm doing in English. There's another major city in, in Brazil that I should play, which has gone out of my head. You may well know the second city of, of uh, Brazil. But anyway, yes, I, Sao, Paulo. And Sao Paulo, would it be that? Um, but uh, yeah, I want to get there because I want to play the whole of Central and South America in Spanish, except yeah. for Brazil, of course, will be unfortunately in English. But yeah, I want to get there. I do want to see it. Yeah. So I take it you've, yeah. been, you've been there a few times, I take it. Yeah, a, a lot, yeah. Every, every year, if the last is my favorite talk summit, it's my um, It's It's um, incredible, like being very hospitable people. I mean, you kind of, you know, there's a lot of uh, stereotypes like that's easy with everywhere, aren't there? And Bruce Paul is stereotypically party and unavoidable, color actually, and, and most of it lies through. Um, then, but there's this side that you hear about the positive, the very out of the way, like that. And then also, 
but it's getting all this business as uh, uh, well. They're, they're going through the mill a little bit at the moment, I think, with, with the pandemic. Um, yep. They've got a leader, as you know, Eddie, who, who is from the Trump mold of... Yes. Uh, I, I, want, I don't want to say this the word, the Trump mold of dictatorship. Yeah. Um, so he's, he thinks it's a runny nose, and, and I think it's going to cause him some problems, which is a, which is a great shame. But yeah, so I mean, it's, it's been a hell of a week, hasn't it, in the news? On that, yes. on that note. It has been a game-changing uh, week in America. They've, we have to take lying, I've said this, if lying is, a to, is allowed to be a tool of politics, bald face, I've fundamentalized again and again. If that's allowed and people can get away with it, then humanity dies and we will not make it. So uh, somehow we have to get to another side. Uh, another, I've got one. And another place on that, and you know, white supremacists, you know, doing insurrection in, bizarrely in Washington DC, at the center of America, the center of USA, and shouting out, USA, 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 but they're in USA, that's the seat of USA, and they lost an election, and Trump just goes on lying, it, it is, it's, it's, yeah. it's worrying, and as you know, I, I keep saying, we've got to drag ourselves towards the 2030s, and some simplistic politicians are saying, no, come on, let's go and try the 1930s again. And that will not work, and as we've seen that in America. So on the 20th, Joe Biden becomes president, and hopefully we will begin to get the ship of humanity back heading forwards rather than backwards. Um, and I, I, as you know, I want to be in politics, so I'm going to fight for that yeah. as hard as I can. Yeah. Absolutely right. I, I love the way you talk about it so passionately. Yeah. And your reason for getting into politics, yeah. your, your reason for wanting to do it is for good. You know, when you when you, when you talk about, I don't want to bang on about Trump, but, but there's a guy that just wanted to become famous. And, yeah. and, and, and his money has allowed him his privilege. And, and, and somebody's got to work out how we stop someone that's got the most money having the positions of the highest power. That, that's, a real, that's a real problem yeah. that's developed in. He did have a lot of money, but I would say a lot of people getting into president do quite often come from a, a financial background. But the thing he did was giving, appealing to people by giving them permission. This is my analysis. He gave them permission to be racist and sexist again. He said, I'm racist and sexist. See the things that I say. You elect me, and if you feel that way, you can back me, and then you can do and say what you want. You can behave badly. You can riot in, in the seat of... of of democracy and try and tear that down. You can do what the hell you want. He gave them permission to behave outside society. And some people find that beguiling. They want to tear down society. They want to use hate. Confederate flag was in there, in the, in the, uh, in Washington, they see inside the Capitol. And that stands for slavery. They fought for slavery. Crimes, uh, crimes against humanity. Black Lives Matter, I took the knee at the beginning of every run now, and I apologize I didn't do it earlier on, but uh, my brain was just trying to get the gigs going. But I think we, we just have to take all of humanity forward, 7.8 billion of us. We've got to learn to live together, work together, some shape or form, and the nationalism that Trump talks about, that the simplistic politicians, the very right-wing uh, people, some of whom are leaders in their countries, that, that my country is better than your country, it, we will go back to the 1930s. Whereas be proud of your country, be, be uh, patriotic, absolutely, but nationalistic, where you think you're better than the rest, it just won't work. That's my theory. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, hey. I totally agree. Totally you've, got, you've got Sarah with you, she's... Um, Sarah, is Sarah, are you, are you round the back, Sarah? I think Sarah's gone to the loo. I'll bring her back in. I'll bring her on the screen in a second so you can see her. She'll be back. She'll be back. She's, get, she's keeping you fed and watered. Yes, yeah, she just came up with a with a chocolate thing, which looks like it should be chocolate and bad, but it's actually protein. It's a protein bar. And then ah, that's a little bit of chocolate. chocolate. And that's like it's, chocolate. I like the sound of that. <laughs> yeah, so it's weird. I, But to eat and talk, well, it, the bizarre thing is that talking is keeping me going, even though... Yeah. yeah, I sometimes have to yeah. catch my breath, but if I was yeah. just pounding on the treadmill, I'd have lost my mind on about day two or three. But uh, 
this is uh, this is much easier. It says here you got a forty year running experience. Is that is that running is something you you like to do? Or have I yeah, missed it? It's, it's something I kind of do as a matter of course now, just to just to really tick over and, and stay fit. But yeah, it was, it, was my, it was my first sport that I probably really got into at any half decent level when I was a kid. Yeah, and 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 these and, and then of course you know. You're 10 years old and it's great, and then you're 15 years old and other things in life start, start to appeal, don't they? Yeah. Um, and sort of went away from it a little bit and became less and less competitive, um, but still very much in the running community, still very much in the running world. Know a lot of runners, and it's great. Um, yeah, so I'm now for a little poodle this morning. I don't even like to talk about it because it was 10K and you're running 42K a day. So no. it was a mere, a mere sprint. No, the 10 case is good because I think you would agree that you, if you're doing 10k, if I'm doing ridiculous amount, that's kind of a little bit difficult to grab hold of. But there are people coming up who have, who realise that they must move their bodies, otherwise they're going to lose it. It's going to get ill. If they've got to that point, the 10k, the 5k, is the way in. The 5k yeah. park runs. I encourage people yeah. one to do, look up park run online, and there's park runs near you. Obviously, in COVID times, I think it's. Probably not happening, but from couch to couch to 5K is a good app. Have you heard about this app, Graham? Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I think that whole progress that you're talking about, couch to 5K, yeah. then once you've got that 5K under your belt, park run becomes a really viable, not, not a competition, but an opportunity to just kind of time yourself if you want to do that. And then, and then you kind of get the bug, don't you? A lot of people get the bug at that point and think, well, I've done five, I'll do 10. I've, I've done 10, I'll do 20. And, and then, and then of course, 42 is a marathon. Yeah. And, and that's how a lot of people progress. And, and you know, we're all for, I, I, I love that people can put a watch on what they do or measure their run or time it and all of these things. I also love the fact that you can just kind of, you know, it's quite a low maintenance sport, isn't it? Yeah. Place your shoes up, put your top on, get out your front door. And it doesn't matter if you walk a little bit or yeah. you, you just stop or you jog. It's, it's, just, just go and get out there and get some air and, and, and really, you know, really enjoy it. And it's good, even with cloud cover, you get vitamin D into through from the sun. And I know that makes the body better. We were, these bodies were designed, we were hunter-gatherers, and they're designed for being out there in loose coverings or sleeping under the stars. And the whole buildings that we have developed and, and then computers, television, or eating cake, that's all, we're not designed for that effect. And uh, yeah. if you do get out, and it can be cycling if you want, it can be swimming yeah. is a slightly different thing, but that's very good all over the body. But get yourself outside, go for that's a walk, true. be healthy. It is a good that's thing to do. Yeah, we're talking again about the power of sport, the power of exercise, but you know, especially now, especially now, it never has the need <laughs> to go and just get yourself some exercise being greater. There's only so many sofas you can sit on, so many TV shows you can watch, so much bad news you can abide. You've just got to get out and, and try and clear your head. And that's, that's very much, again, I, I think this partnership is, it, it is that <coughs> message, part of the message, which is important. But no, so I, I, I'm, I'm sure you'd much rather be out in the fresh air. Yeah. I know you've got some fresh air because you've got, you've got the doors open and you've well, got the, the, the Thames blowing in a, an icy gale. Yes, it's, it's, it's not quite a gale, but it is icy. It is odd and it comes in from the side. And normally, I think, all the clothes with the wicking, we should talk about wicking, you probably know about that, but the, the new garments that can take the sweat away from your, or just move it, or whatever they do, you'll tell me in a second, hopefully. But it's usually with a front on wind. And I haven't got that, I've got a side on sort of draft, which is odd. So, I, yeah. uh, I quite often feel cold. Yeah. And I used to, when I'm running, you get to a thing where, uh, and I remember playing this, I loved football when I was a kid, when I was 11 and 12, I was, you know, first team and, and I remember stopping on a freezing day and you could see the breath coming out, but you were fine. The whole the radiator of your body was fine. And I do that with running too, but in the, on the treadmill, it's a little bit different. I don't know quite what's going on in the microclimate in here, but it's odd. So yeah, you, yeah, you have got a microclimate and you're, you're taking pit stops as well. So you're going for a wee and then you're coming back and yeah. you're drying off and then you're getting wet again and it's all, Ah, you've got yeah. yeah, you've got a bit of a, another just another challenge to add to all of the others. My pit stops will get ironed out. I did find uh, when I did the 43 around the UK, the last day yeah. I stopped for one pit stop only. 
all other food was done on the move. And, and the same actually when I did the double marathon in South Africa, I, I was so anxious that I had to stop after one hour to really evacuate everything from my body because I was like tense like this. I knew I had to run for about 11 hours that day. And after that, I just, at this speed, interestingly, 7.5 miles per hour, I just carried on and on and on and on and uh, had to get faster in the last hour because for whatever reason, I had to go up to 10 kph, which was a nightmare in the 10th hour, in the just about coming up to the 11th hour. But I got it done. I like to get them done, you know, if you can get it done, that's beautiful. And yeah. Oh, we've lost you there, Graham. We've frozen up a bit. If you can hear me, Graham, we. Oh, if you could, if you can hear me, we need to. You need to start that sentence again. Cause it all, the signal went away. Can you hear me? There we go. Think I'm coming back. Yep, you're coming back now. I think I can hear that. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's my end actually, rather than yours. Well, I, I'm going to say that too because we, we've been chatting with other people. But just say what you were saying before because we've got you back now again for a bit. I can't remember where I was. Okay. I can't remember what we were discussing. Uh, the fluctuation I, into the, was killed by train of thought. Now, I was saying that the double marathon at the end, just to get it done, staying at this speed, and I got to the end. Well, anyway, I can say it because I, I love talking about it because I hated doing it. But yeah, I, yeah, the weird thing was to finish a marathon, if you can imagine that, and then start another marathon with no kerfuddle, no waving of flags. It just just carried on. I was counting down from 90k uh, for 84k yeah. for the double marathon. I just had to count down, 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 down until I got it done. And uh, yeah. yeah, it was good. Yeah, I mean, I'm, that's where I was going. I was about to say, for, for me, for everybody else, we're on a Sunday and we're kind of, you know, we're kind of just ticking off time at the moment because we're, we're, we're looking forward to better times. And we're, we're saying, right, okay, it's Sunday. That's the end of another week. And I think for you, it's just, not that is it it's just another day yep. where you want to get to the end where you want to get to yes it is it's uh i'm, I'm doing them in tens curiously because i find that's more gravel because i say the first 10 is the thing so at the end of today i've done the first third then i go into the second yeah. 10 i just have to get to number five or number six and then i'm halfway through and then i can mentally think of this downhill even though it's of course not downhill um that's how i'm going to do it always be counting down is my is my motto. Uh, I, I think that's a I think that's a great philosophy to apply to you. But like you say, when you, when you get you know, and that, there's going to be a point where you're halfway to the whole challenge, and then you are downhill, not downhill. Yeah, mentally down, mentally down. And also, you think, well, if I've done 16 and I've got 15 to go, if I can do 16, I can do 15 because I've already done 16. You know, there's that kind of mental <laughs> stuff you can play with your mind and help yourself. And <sighs> and, and, and all of these chats. So when when you started. If there weren't that many people lined up to chat to you and, and it sort of seems like the ball's rolling on that a bit better now. You've got, you've got lots of people to chat to over the next, where are we, 21 days? Yeah, I did actually tell everyone, don't give me too much pressure on the first few days. Um, uh, but quite soon after I started, I said, no, give me that because it, it's weird because there's a pressure of trying to talk and, and talk to your good self. We've, we've chatted and we chatted many about, can we get this through and where does it get delivered to and this kind of practical stuff but now we're talking about ideas and things and, and Brazil and uh, the the art of an interviewer I suppose is you've got to be able to listen here you know take everything in and react to it and say oh that's interesting tell me more about that but also think of where you're going to go and what next question you're going to ask and uh, and on that point, I want to ask something because I did, a, I might have told you this, but I did accounting and financial management with mathematics at university. So, so business was something I understood and I liked. I did that. I was always, always going into this, but I knew I could do that. And I did pass my accounting exams with no work whatsoever, it seems. So, but you're in a, a corporation, Mizuno. And, and it's Japanese, and, I, and, and that does fascinate me, the, the Japanese corporation story, particularly, you know, with the, uh, the car industry. And I know it's gone here and there and everywhere, but there was a time when they were trying to bring Japanese cars into the world market. And I know in the American market, they were laughing and saying, this is just ridiculous, it's not going to happen. And then it did happen, and then you realize the Japanese are working very hard on things. So how, my question to you is, do you feel the 
the Japanese, do they just, because you're in, uh, is it Mizuno UK or Mizuno Europe? Is it the same thing? Or is yeah, it, the, so, yeah, Mizuno UK is a subsidiary of Mizuno Europe, which is which is a subsidiary of Mizuno Global. So it breaks down into quite a small part of that. So do you feel, um, uh, do the Japanese people who obviously are in the corporation, do they make their presence known or do they really let you get on with your thing and say you know your countries and you do your thing with certain guidelines? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess the best way to explain it would be we we are completely in control of our strategy to do country, but we absolutely adhere to the, the, the global philosophy and the Japanese way. But yeah. I, I very much feel like I work for a Japanese company. Yeah. And is there, can you define the Japanese way in any particular thing? Is there an attention to detail or is there... Is there um... I, think it's, I think it was always, it's always innovation is very important um, in, in the world of Japan. And I mean, I, I mean, you were talking there about cars entering the market. I think, I think up until the end of the Second World War, it was comfortably the country innovating quickest. I think probably since then, it's slowed down a bit and you've got South Korea are doing amazing things and, and yeah. other nations perhaps technologically a little bit more advanced. But but the main thing I noticed working for a Japanese company is I the, the work there are treated. You know, it's um a very good company to work for. And and I think that comes from from being I, it, you know, there are lots of good companies to work for. Yeah. But I believe that the philosophy comes from a Japanese place. So you, you, you feel completely like you're looked after all of the time. Oh that's interesting. That's that's very good to hear. Well, I'm going to talk to some more people at half past, um, and uh, they are in Budapest. So, um, so hi there, and uh, so thank you, Graham. Thank you for all your help uh, so far, which will, I'm sure will continue on. And good luck to you guys. And uh, and uh, yeah, I've got your I've got your logo just sitting there and helping me get things forward. So, thanks for all your help. Well, blame it. We've, we've lined some good guests up for you as well, so uh, I hope to watch those. And the friends of Mizuno will be chatting in the next three weeks. Okie dokie. Thank you for you. Thank you for that. Thanks. Uh, and I will no, no doubt talk to you very soon. Yeah, well, all the best, Eddie. Cheers. Thanks, Graham. Yeah. Okie dokie. So that's Graham Johnson, who I've been talking to a lot just before this happened. Mizuno, one of our sponsors, getting me the kit and helping us with money to get some of our infrastructure uh, to go forward in, and do this challenge. So thank you to him and them and the people of Osaka in Japan and uh, yes of course Japan is an East Asian country and I was born in the West Asian country of Yemen. I was born in Aden which the British called Aden. But it's actually Arden. That's how you pronounce it. So, um, I'm going to I'm going to do another peace stop. I think it seems I'm peeing all the time. Okay, quick peace stop, guys. I should only be two minutes. Hi there. Oh, back. Life is a journey. We set out not knowing exactly where we will end up. It can be tough. It can be hard. Sometimes it takes a I will. Other times a simple I do. We take each step with our focus ahead. We have plans and strategies, but they do not always work out. There are times when we get knocked down and doors close behind us. Our hopes can often be replaced by fears. We can lose our direction and struggle with change, become passengers in a life that is spinning too fast. At times like this, we need someone beside us, someone to listen, to advise and support us, see what is really possible, someone to give hope and to get us over that line, and someone to say bye when the job is done.
Walking with Wounded supports ex-servicemen and women with physical, mental, or social injuries to gain the skills and qualifications to develop new careers outside the military, reintegrate into society, and provide long-term security for themselves and their families. Our programs give vital support to the most vulnerable and hard-to-reach veterans, those who are wounded, homeless, or within the criminal justice system. Support more of our wounded to regain their independence. Okay. Gabor and Veronica, we're not going to talk to them. Um, Hi there. Hi. Hi. Hey. Nice to meet you. Hi, Eddie. Hi, how are you doing? Good to see you. Oh, great. <laughs> so, um, it's Gabor. Um, I'm here as well, yeah. Oh, yes, right. you're there, yes. I was thinking, you have to talk, and then it's going to sort of... So where, where are you both? You're obviously in different houses. Are you both in Budapest or are you in different places, or where, where are you? Yeah, we, we, live, we live apart. Right. Uh, unfortunately, but... Uh, <laughs> but are you both in Budapest or, or in, in different cities? Yes, we are. We are just uh, both at home. Right. Well, home office, and, you know, it's Sunday, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. So, what's it like in Budapest at the moment? Uh, I take it you're in lockdown like we are? Is that the situation? We are uh, less strict, I guess. My British friends tell me how uh, strict it is over there. We have a curfew at 8 p.m., basically. Oh, wow. We don't have restaurants, bars, theaters, cinemas open, but that's very common, I guess. And. Uh, the 8 p.m. curfew is since uh, early December only. The, I mean, when the second wave really was going up. Yeah. And uh, and now we hope that February will bring some kind of a, I don't know. Uh, on one hand, I want everything to reopen and uh, have a, go back to normal, but the numbers just don't uh, make it like uh, realistically possible for February. So yeah. it's, it's going to be the spring, I guess. Okay. And is it, are you allowed to go out and have a walk, go for a run? Is that allowed? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We can, I mean, we can, we can go to work. Uh, the kindergartens are open, uh, schools are open. Oh, wow. But, uh, yeah, after eight, you can, I think you can just walk your dog. I'm not sure. I don't really, I have a kid, so I don't really know the world after eight anymore. Gotcha. So, yeah, we're and, and are shops open or shops are closed at the moment? They are open, yeah. Oh, wow. Um, well, you're, yeah. you're in a very different situation to us, so um, hopefully uh, you're in a better position than we are because we're, yeah, shops, there's only deliveries really happening at the moment, except for grocery shops and uh, drugstores, I suppose. Those are the two that I think emergency, you know, stuff that I needed for life. And then people can walk and they can run. And is it cold? Are you 
freezing cold all the time. What are we, about two degrees here? Is it freezing? We, we have a minus two Celsius right now, so it's a bit colder uh, yeah, it's than you have over there. It is. But uh, yeah. actually, the malls are open with all the shops. That's the strange part. And wow. especially be, the, uh, between, before the weeks of Christmas, it was like super crowded. Only the restaurants were like closed and only open for deliveries. But uh, they still had this curfew with 8 p.m. Right. And uh, so shops closed at 7. So Everyone who wanted to go buy presents, they just were, were swamped in those few hours of, uh, of a time slot to buy presents. So that was that was crazy, and I'm I'm quite surprised the numbers didn't really uh, became much much bigger those weeks. Right, you, you can come in on this as well. Yeah, yeah. I'll get Sarah in, on, in a minute on the on the chat. So. Um, do you, does everyone have to wear masks when they're outside or in the shops or not necessarily or uh, it's absolutely necessary you have to wear masks and uh, of course there are some idiots who, who doesn't yeah. who don't wear masks but yeah it's mandatory Ma even in the streets yeah. as well or just in the shops even in the streets oh that's yeah. interesting because i think they do that in new york as well whereas in the streets, we don't have to wear them, which is, yeah, every country has a different kind of rule. Hopefully, at some point, we'll work out what does work and what doesn't work, so everyone can do the best things. But, uh, yes, and we should talk about, um, I've, I've come and played, how many times have I played in, it's just, <laughs> is it twice? Twice, yes. Yeah, twice in Goodwich, thank you very much. I'm going to get Sarah on. Screen a second. Um, I think we had you three years ago and then one and a half years ago or something like that. 17 and 19? Probably, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, 2017, 2019. So there have been good gigs to play. And that's, and actually, you can tell me this and tell the world because I, I like to play to, to local people. And unfortunately, I haven't learned Hungarian. Hungarian being one of the tough, one of the harder languages to learn. But, uh, would you say what would be the percentage of Hungarian citizens that were coming compared to English speakers who were coming to the gate? I, I would say uh, two thirds were Hungarian. Oh wow! Okay. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's closer to 50-50, but usually it's more like uh, two thirds are Hungarian. And that's and, good. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that. Yeah, no, that's beautiful because the younger generations are grabbing hold of English, not because of us or the American, just because it's a useful language to have, yeah, I assume? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and they have, they have watched um, from TV shows to comedy gigs and everything that's available online for a long, long time, and it, I think they were just very, very hungry for, you know, getting these people like you on stage live, so, yeah. And here's Sarah, I think, Sarah. Hey guys. Hi. Hey. Hi Sarah. Hey. Long time no see. I know, I know. So yes, because when was it? 2017 and 2019 we were with you guys. Yeah, time okay. flies. Time flies. Yeah, no, they were both, yeah, great gigs. And I remember we went to, what was it? Did we go to a restaurant that was on a boat? Do you remember that? Oh yeah, that was in, that was in 2019. Yeah, we went, we went on a boat and then we were also in a lot different restaurant in 2017. I think we had fun and and wine. Yeah. That's what I remember. <laughs> I think yeah. so. Oh yes, I remember that one. The boat right by the quay. Yes, I do remember that. Yeah, we were talking about boats earlier and uh, yeah, I remember that. So, yeah, we went to that lovely, uh, lovely restaurant. But actually, actually, Eddie came three times uh, to Budapest because the third was only the running. Right? Absolutely, so, yeah. yeah. That's right, that's right, that's yeah. February of last year. February the 10th, we know. That's you, what I, I remember you guys managed to swing by and say hello to us, which was lovely. Yes, it was good to see you on, the, on February the 10th. Have we finished that day? How do we finish? I think it might have been we just arrived. I think we just yeah. arrived the day before, I think. Yes, yeah, so it was probably our arrival. So we probably saw you on the 9th. But didn't you tell us about the island? What's the name of the island that I run around when I did the marathon? What's Margaret that? Island. Margaret uh, Island, yes. You did, you did your uh, 
half marathon there, I yep. think, running circles, but yep. it's quite a big island. And Sarah got a bike. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, well, you sorted me out with a bike, I remember. I, I, I was slightly wobbly, I think, on the bike, but it was good. It was good. I think I got stuck in a tram track at one point. Yeah, it wasn't, yeah, not, not that great on a bicycle, but yes, that, that, that was lovely. And, uh, and so that was the half marathon, and then I came back and did the full marathon, just to, just to be crazy. And that was in la last February. So yes, we have seen around that area, the, right in the centre of Budapest, and, and did, did the, uh, the, the different parts of the city, the different uh, towns that became the big city of Budapest, did they start developing at the same time? Was, or was Buda there first, or was Pest there first? in history terms. How did that happen? It, it was actually two separate cities. Yeah. And uh, because back like, I don't know, 300, 400 years ago, we didn't have bridges. We right. only had the first bridge uh, in the mid middle of the 19th century. Mm. So uh, obviously there were some boats, uh, but they were just neighbor cities on different banks of the river. Actually, there was a third one, north of Buda, but that just complicates the story, so yeah. I leave it out. And by the, in the 19th century, the two cities were, became one, and uh, then th that's the name Budapest. So yes. That's the simplest version of the story. And, um, and I've got a piece of information in front of me. You've, <coughs> you're working on Hungary's first Christmas movie. Tell us about that. I am, because all the other countries did romantic comedies, which are set during Christmas, so now it's Hungary's turn, and oh. obviously, uh, it, it, because all the Christmas movies are so big everywhere, like Love Actually, yeah. and uh, all these local versions, so we are trying to, we are currently filming uh, uh, one right now, which has a budget of, I would say, like 3 million euros, so it's quite a big of a project, and... Uh, I'm really happy. It's 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 happening. Like tomorrow, we will film. Our, it's going to be our fifth day already. So we started just before New Year's Eve. Wow! And I take it you're shooting in. Are you shooting in, in Hungarian or because now there's some people do it in English and then they can reach out the whole world. But I take it's Hungarian. Yeah, we are making it Hungarian, and uh, obviously. If <laughs> if if it's good, then we can always sell the remake rights. So there you go. Or do a version. I saw, I've seen a German film that was shot about a German story that was done in, in English with the German actors speaking English. But um, obviously that's not necessarily caught on yet. But I think just because I find the English language is a useful connector, it's there for people to use if they wanted to. I want, I want to make uh, stories which are like uh, in English or partially English, but it should be coming like it should be organically, uh, you know, within the story while yeah. they speak English. Right. So it should be then about, for example, a diplomat, an American or British guy coming to Hungary or stuff like that. But Hungarian actors speaking English, that, that would be very lame, I guess. Oh well, but in the future, it might, I'm not trying to push it. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking, I'm looking for a way that that uh, Hungary can have a big hit all around the world with one film. It's just uh, in the future, it'll be it'll be easier. But I'm not pushing anyone to do it. I just I'm thinking, I am thinking ahead. Now, are there more? Um, when did English-speaking uh, comedians start playing in? Uh, in, in Budapest and in Hungary. Has it, it hasn't been a long time, it, not so long since they started first playing, is it or is it? Tell me about that. Uh, in you speaking what? Comedians. You... Comedians. How many? Oh, you were the second one. All right. Uh, and the first one was uh, Louis C.K. in uh, 2016. There you before go. Before his thing. And um, you were the second one, actually. Right. And I'm... Are more English speakers coming in, or not so much at the moment, or maybe in the future? Well, last year would have been pretty big for us, and right. uh, we had to postpone all the shows. Right. We had, we had John Cleese, Russell Howard, ah. and uh, it is a Slazinger. We had all of them lined up, and now it's pushed to this year, hopefully. And uh, 
and obviously we are before the virus uh, it was really like spiking going up uh, the number and the uh, of the guests and and the, and the, obviously we hope that we can continue where we left uh, last year yes that would be nice that would be nice because Gifal, what's the, like the local local comedians in Budapest? What what's the uh, what's the scene like uh, currently? Veronica. <laughs> For, well, as um, as the expert on local <laughs> on local comedians, well, there are always um, uh, these open mic nights uh, scattered throughout these small clubs in Budapest. Like <coughs> I'm talking before pandemic times. And um, I, th I went to a couple of them, but uh, I went to even the English speaking ones. And um, yeah, there there um, there are some there are some very very. But you you mustn't you mustn't forget we have uh, some big superstars of Hungarian stand up comedy. But because they perform in Hungarian, uh, and they're pretty good, some of them. Yeah. And some of them are very political, which is very good. But uh, they obviously they don't cross borders because they are in Hungary. No, we're, we're not. I'm not worried about it. We're actually interested in the Hungarian-speaking comedians. That scene is that getting bigger and bigger? Yeah, I would say yes. For example, if you, if we look like decades-wise, like ten years ago, I don't believe we had like a female stand-up comedian in it, performing in Hungarian, like mainstream. Now we have many. Uh, girls and ladies doing stand-up and being like stars and uh, right. having huge power. So if you look at it like not just year by year, it's I think it's a very uh, um, it's a very good picture we see what we see. Excellent. Excellent. Well well thank you for talking to us. It's uh, it's great to hook up back with you. We've got pictures of, of Budapest uh, just uh, that are floating behind me, and if you can widen the, the screen, Dave, to show our screen behind us, yes. So, is our screen frozen? I think it's yeah. frozen, I think, but yeah, th these are uh, change over. We, yes. we wanted to shoot the Christmas movie on that market, the previous image that was behind you. Oh, and wow. obviously, obviously, the market was cancelled, so, and we knew this in advance, so. We just figured out, okay, we're gonna make our very own market. Like we create a Christmas market instead of like there's no markets. Yeah. Christmas markets. So you, here, so you created that in a, in a studio? No, we actually like secured like uh, uh, a place which is quite. Uh, we can use it basically as a studio, but it's actually like not. Uh, it's uh, it's an outdoor, right in the center of the city, but still, uh, people will not come uh, like uh, from the outside it's a, it's a very secure place right so everyone will be actors and extras and us so. excellent excellent well good luck with that uh, good luck with the christmas movie i'll watch it with the subtitles um, but yeah hopefully it hopefully goes well and uh, thanks very much Gabor and veronica for coming and talking to us uh, a big shout out for budapest and hungary and uh, we will be back play this yes, in the future. Okay. Take care. See you guys. Take, Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Oh. Okay. So, uh, three o'clock in ten minutes time, three o'clock London time, we're going to be talking to Scott Briggs, uh, walking with the wounded volunteer, one of our, one of our charities that we're championing. We champion five which are Care International, Covenant House in America, um, Fair Share, Unite to Combat uh, Neglected Tropical Diseases and Walking with the Wounded. So that's the five that we're championing at the moment. And if you go to adsr.com, you can denote, denote, can donate even, which would probably be better than denoting. Uh, you can donate there, donate there, or there's a text you can see on the screen with a UK phone. You can use a text, which would be good. Now, walking with the wind, Scott, 
and this team of volunteers have been supporting both local councils and the NHS during the uh, COVID pandemic. Scott grew up in a military family from an early age. Scott saw how service lives can affect families and experienced firsthand some of the challenges service personnel face. Upon leaving the military, Scott joined regular services, uh, joined regular service after a short stint playing rugby and then setting up an armed forces support initiative with another organization. He left this position early via transfer to reserve service, reserve service, excuse me, and uh, has since been deployed overseas, most recently to Africa, supporting and mentoring Liberian troops ahead of their UN deployment to Mali. Scott serves in the Duke of Lancaster Regiment. The Duke of Lancaster Regiment. So we're we'll going to be talking to Scott and. Uh, Three o'clock. I'm running out. I'm just about getting my heart up to halfway. 21k, a good psychological point to get to. Half a marathon on my 10th marathon. My uh, Jason Mitchell on Zwift has said, Welcome to everyone that recently joined Eddie. So thank you, Jason. For, uh, oh, I see people on Zwift are now trying to run in blue to support me. Well, that's very nice of you. Thank you, people on Zwift. Uh, and Rebecca Wensley has said on Zwift you can change gear while running. So that ah that would be that'd be a fun thing. And I'll be able to tell, but I assume that everyone's running next to me. He's near me. Um, so the uh, the route today was Richard from Zwift said, can we try this one? It's got lots of nice trees and, and uh, Topography in this virtual world, so I'm probably going to change things up more. It, it was uh, I didn't have a little running symbol next to it, so I thought it wouldn't be so good for runners. But of course, all the cyclists tend to shoot off past us, and we are really uh, in a good little group. Uh, the front of my uh, right calf still playing up. I have to walk from time to time. So that is uh, something I have to do. Yeah, just to try and ease. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I will indeed. Yes. If anyone does, um, Zwift comes and changes their uh, top so it's a blue top, that'd be beautiful. Then we'll all, we'll all look like a big team. Team humanity. There you go. In the blue. That's what we're fighting for. Let's make humanity great again. Team blue. Yes, team blue gets imagined. Who said that? I, I'm sorry, I had a little thing and I just missed it, but thank you. Um, oh, that was Jason. Jason Mitchell. Um, um, Dennis Pinkard is asking, what is my favorite route in Zwift? Well, I don't actually have one. I mean, this one's really nice. I like, uh, well, the trouble is, Jason, I'm, uh, uh, Dennis, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I've had my eye on the screen, my screen, because I'm talking to people a lot of the time. Sorry, that's not great. Um, but now that things are changing up and getting more used to things, I'll hopefully Zwift pull down. I've also got a tiny screen that I can see messages going by. Team Humanity. You like that, Jason? Excellent. Yeah, let's go with it. Team Humanity. Yeah, I think that's one. We're going to be around for a while. So this isn't just for now. This is for the rest of time, baby. Let's make humanity great again. At this time, with America going through such hell, with extreme right-wing people trying to spin things, lie things, take things back to a horrible place, Donald Trump setting the worst example a leader maybe has ever set in, in a peacetime. I think you could say that. In wartime, no, there's been worse than that, but in peacetime, the worst ever example. Donald Trump, a bad human being. Just simply that. 
Other people could have different opinions. Well, I'm afraid you're wrong. It's, he is a bad human being. And that is it. Anyone tries to incite his people to go and riot and uh, cause five deaths. Five deaths. Uh, Donald Trump's responsibility. So, President Biden will soon be uh, on the 20th, be President of America. Carmen Harris, Vice President. And we just know they're going to help try and make humanity great again. So, just trying to stretch out my legs here. Dave, are we going for a three o'clock start with Scott? Is that the plan? Yes, I believe so. Okay, well, I'll just keep talking and easing myself up. I could always do a few Budapest facts, if you like. Yes, yes. And then... Uh, Budapest, and you can do Hungary facts as well. Budapest. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Let's see if, uh, if Gabor and Veronica are still listening, they can, uh, they can fact check my... Uh, internet found facts. Uh, so, some facts about Budapest. Uh, first one. Ah, now the Zimplar Kurt Cafe, uh, it says, was rated the third best bar in the world and number one in Budapest. Which, uh, unless this is sponsored by the Zimplar Kurt Cafe, I'm not sure. It doesn't seem so, so... Uh, what was that? Say again. The Zempler Kurt Cafe was rated third best bar in the world and wow. number one in Budapest. There According to Lonely Planet, apparently. So there oh. you go. Oh, there uh, apparently, uh, awesome beer, you can smoke hooker, tons of crazy stuff on the wall and just awesome is what they say. So there you go. Uh, Ah, oh, this is interesting. Budapest uh, Budapest was created when three cities joined together. Well, that's what Gabor was saying. Ah, did Gabor say three? Ah. Yeah, he said there was one. He says that confuses the story. So what's the uh, ah, one right. north of... North, north, is it Buda or Pest? Um, there's uh, Old Buda, Buda and Pest. Right. Yeah. Ah, uh, oh, originally named Pest Buda and later changed to appease the public. Ah, oh, it's maybe people prefer the other way around. Maybe it rub, trips off the tongue easier. Kind of does, yeah. yeah. Oh, this is interesting. The Rubik's Cube, the inventor of the Rubik's Cube, was born in Budapest. Ah. Yeah. That is interesting, because that was out in communist times, wasn't it? Was that, was that the 80s again? Uh, it was a very 80s thing, wasn't can, it, the Rubik's you, Cube? Can you click on that? Or that no, and it, do, it doesn't even tell me the name of the inventor. It's very thin <laughs> on information on that one. I'll separately Google it. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah Allenby. Uh, check it out. Back tomorrow for Team Humanity as we run on. Anyone waiting blue on Zwift? I'm part of Team Humanity, so thank you. But just... Excellent. Thanks, Sarah. Scott Briggs, hi. Hi there. Can you see me? I can see you. Can you see me? Yeah, very well. Hi. How are you doing? How are your, uh, your joints feeling? Well, um, everything was feeling pretty good, but yesterday the front part of my calf uh, started playing up. So it's been playing up yesterday. Right, the second it's really not too bad, but uh, yeah. I tend to know these things from my multiple marathons before. They come, they say hello, they stick around for a bit, and then they tend to wander off to maybe another part of the body. And, uh, <laughs> So I don't worry about them too much. I do know yeah, that probably. endless running will make them go away, as opposed to, well, you may know this, because uh, you're, you're ex-military, yeah? You've been through military, through the services. Yeah, 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 no, I'm, I've served the reservists now, alongside my civilian job at Walking Wounded as well, so, yeah. I'm, we, I'm uh, not, not too, uh, well, not too, um, well, I'm, I'm very, I've experienced a lot of shin splints, let's put it that way. Really? Uh, and I think you'd know from a military person with the exercise, the fitness you need to have, that uh, would you agree the fact that if you get something, if you can keep going, adjust your thing at speed, r rub on it, work it through, it, it can, you can work through it and it'll go away, as opposed to you have to give up. A lot of people give up when they get a little twinge or something. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think village training definitely uh, helps you develop that robustness and that mental resilience when it comes to training and, and working through things that uh, are somewhat, sometimes a little bit testing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but no, it's an absolute pleasure to join you uh, on this. I'm very new to um, online uh, interviews, but it, oh, right. it's a real, really incredible campaign. So thanks uh, to you and your team for inviting us along. No, thank you for being willing to come on. If this is your first one, or you've done a few online chats before? This is my first one live, so <laughs> yeah, I have to be very careful. I'm with like an absolute expert as well in yourself, so. No, well, you can say poo and you can say helicopter, and, <laughs> and uh, I don't, I don't mind swearing because this is like this is like a, a HBO or something. It's you know, it's a, we're out to the world, and it's essentially my TV station, so. You know, right. I, I swear, I, I'm not swearing that much on, on the show, but, uh, but you know, people swear in real life, so I kind of like us to be real. I'm a trans person. I'm, you know, I came out 35 years ago, part of that is saying, this is really true. Let's talk about it, let's express myself. So I don't mind on the chapter, and you're doing great. <laughs> Just yeah, chatting right. away. So tell, <laughs> tell us your story. So when did you uh, join the services? Yeah, so I, I joined the race. So I'm from a military family. Yep. Uh, I grew up around uh, military service, men and, and, and women in my family. And then um, I had a little spell playing rugby. My brother is a really professional player. Um, his, his coach is now in the elite game. Um, and then I joined up as regular. I left fairly uh, early and then um, transferred to the reserve service. And um, for the last just over a year, I've been working at Walking the Wounded as well. Right. So it's really cool because I get to uh, step up on both sides of the fence. You know, I get to still serve as a reservist yep. and, you know, get to go overseas and do all the really cool stuff um, and training. Uh, but I also get to, you know, work for a National Armed Forces charity that supports our client group in a pretty incredible way. Um, I'm working on a little project that I'll probably, you may have heard about already, but I'll, I'll talk in a little bit detail afterwards. Yes, no, no, tell us that. I, I want to ask you one question just so the people around the world can understand. Yeah. I wanted to join the, uh, the forces, armed forces, when I was a kid. That was a serious plan. I had officer cadetship papers. I was going to go to university, then go on. And I was kind of obsessed about getting into special forces. Um, but I didn't do that. I've, anyway, I, I say I've done civilian, my, my version of civilian special forces because I'm you know, running marathons and performing in different languages and just being out as trans is difficult enough. So, but I, the, the reservist thing, so I know quite a lot about the military. The reservist, so that people know, that means that you're someone who's already trained up and you're in reserve, but if there's an emergency, you can be back into the front line in action at quite a short moment's notice, yeah? Within a week or something. Yeah. A few days. Yeah, absolutely. So there's usually mobilisations that come in to uh, support our regular counterparts every couple of months, and that could be um, in like operational deployments overseas. So there's yep. troops in Mali at the moment. Uh, earlier in the year, I had uh, the privilege of joining a small team um, that went over to mentor the Liberian Army ahead of their deployment to the on a UN mission. Yeah. Um, so, so there's loads of opportunity, and with like manning and things being a little bit lower than it, than it used to be, uh, reservists are, are more frequently embedding within their regular counterparts. Um, right. But yeah, it's all exactly as, as you uh, as, as you described, really. And you can and you could get the call at a moment's notice. You have to be ready to be on call. No, so I, I think there are elements, there are forward elements that, you know, are at a higher readiness state. Uh, right. The unit that I'm with, we, we don't have that, but I think um, you know, th there's a reserve, you mentioned the Special Forces before, and yeah. there is a reserve of Special Forces. Yes. Um, but yes. I, I can imagine that they're, they're held at a state where they can move at you know, a moment's notice, but uh, for me, it's, it's, not, it's not quite as, as, uh, as immediate as that. They're never going to knock on your door and say, this no, is... No, 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 no. It's a, Luckily, or you yeah. just get a text on the phone saying the balloon has gone up and you go, I'm, <laughs> I'm out of here and say goodbye to your wife. Okay, now. I, I, I'm not vital enough for that, uh, I'm afraid. Really. <laughs> so I'd like to know about your family. Before we talk about walking with the wounded, yeah. tell us who was in your family in the, in the, the services and, uh, and what did they uh, experience? What did they do? So just, just a bit about yeah, that. So my, my grandfather was in the military. Yeah. Um, my father was in the military. My father did not nearly his full term. But what? But what, what, what parts of the military? What? It, 
Also, uh, army. So my grandfather was in the army. Right. Um, my my uncle was in the Royal Air Force. Um, right. My father was in the army. Yeah. Um, my uncle was in the navy. I think he did 24 years in the navy. Wow. As a submarine. So that's a completely different kettle of fish. It is. <laughs> uh, in the in the deepest deepest darkest depths of the ocean. Yeah, um, I couldn't do that. All serving, all serving numerous operational tours. It's something that I grew up alongside, which is pretty, it's pretty cool, you know. It's, it's not much more of a, of a real good role model for hard work and, and motivation than, well, in my eyes, than someone that serves in the British, the British military. So. And what age were you when you signed up? Uh, so it was, I was fairly late, actually. So I was 25 when I went through the, okay. the No, 24 when I went through the process. Um, yeah. And was there any reason for that? Because you got the military family, but you thought, I won't do that. And then you thought, actually, I will do that. I mean, what were you doing up to 24? Yeah, so I played rugby um, when, I, when I was younger. Right. Um, like, like I said, I touched on it before. My brother's played, I think my brother's played 40, 15 years professional uh, right. in the elite game. And now he coaches one of the, the premiership sides in England. Um, and that was a pathway that I was wishing to follow. Um, yeah. It doesn't always work out, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then I worked in the civilian world, and, I, and I've always had this, you know, this this taste for you know, for the military and, and, and serving. Um, and I just thought, you know what, I can do it. <laughs> and I just did, um, and it's great. And, and I, I love my role now. So, I, like I said before, I get the best of both worlds. I get to serve a little bit in, in, when I can, and, and around my civilian job and, and my life. Yeah, you know, I've got two children as well. Yep. Uh, um, and I also get to do do. Uh, well, both, both sides of the story really get to, get to work in, in uniform sometimes, but support those that uh, have been in uniform as well. And did you see, because walking with the wounded is dealing with people, correct me if I'm wrong on this, it's not only, they could be, uh, it, 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 it tends to be more people who have um, problems with mental health when coming out of the military, sometimes getting in trouble with uh, the criminal justice system, things like this, or is it also people with physical disabilities coming out and trying to adjust to normal life? Is it all of that? Yes, so essentially all of that. So what we mean is one of the National Armed Forces charity that supports those that have landed on hard times, yeah. um, be it through whatever reason, ever really. Housing, employability and mental health are the main three. Um, but more recently, in a project I work on, um, so I, I lead a project called Our Regen, which is Walking the Wounded's core volunteering project. Um, and what essentially Our Regen is, is a platform for ex military, any ex military, be it wounded, injured, or sick, or just, you know, service leavers, um, to showcase their inherent skills that have developed within the service uh, and have a positive impact on the area that they live in and do all the nice stuff like. Uh, develop community cohesion, you know, and challenge all those stigmas. Yeah. Uh, Charles Division, which I know that you're absolutely, um, you know, focused on, and, and it's testament to all, all the work that you've done as well. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it, it's really cool. So we are like a, well, I think we're probably one of the most proactive armed forces um, charities at the moment, uh, and the work that we've been able to carry out during the global pandemic has been absolutely inspirational. And, it, it is. I was talking to someone from Walking with the Wound and they said normally you will try and get face to face with people to help but you've been forced to use this kind of more virtual link up but actually that can help in your reach in a way. It, it, it might actually be, this might be slightly helpful being able to use the virtual link ups. Is that a case that you found or is it less? Yeah, about? absolutely. Um, I, I'm quite lucky because I have still been able to see um, our volunteers on a face-to-face -face basis because we have been volunteering and trying to be part of the solution uh, during COVID-19, you know, supporting the food banks, yeah. uh, deliveries of like, emergency provisions and, and food to the most vulnerable, um, and also help assemble teams for NHS Nightingale hospitals. But, but on a whole, the, the virtual world, it, we've remained completely operational throughout the, throughout the pandemic. Right. Uh, and, and it's the little things like, you know, staff members, they're, they're not commuting for an hour a day uh, before and after work. So you've got more time to spend with our client group so you can speak to more clients or you can spend more time with them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, clients, if, if they are able and they've got, they've got the technology and equipment, they're able to speak open and freely in the comfort, comfort of their own homes as well. Uh, and I think as a staff member, that helps. 
uh, as long as the kids aren't running running uh, <laughs> doing racket. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, that can be quite a challenge. Yeah. Uh, no, I think. We've adapted really well, uh, and I think it's important to see the positives in, you know, in, in uncertain times. I think we've done that uh, to the best of our abilities, and that's why to make our service as, as good as it can be for our clients. And did you find, growing up with this extended military family, that, that some of your relatives who had been in the military, you saw them have difficulties readjusting to civilian life? Yeah, 100%. Uh, so some of my immediate family members and, and extended family members of them uh, yeah. have experienced difficulties. Um, and I've seen support from um, our organisation, from yeah. Walking the Wounded. Oh, right. uh, Excellent. And, it, and it's, it, it's really empowering to work for an organisation and be able to say, yeah, you, you're facing difficulties, but I know how, how they may help there. Yeah. Uh, I'm walking the wind. So, so I've seen firsthand the, the great work that I see with client groups, but I've heard it firsthand from my immediate family members that have accessed our support services. Uh, but I think it, 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 it's always important to say that you know um, there are there there is a, an amount of people that, that leave service and they do face difficulties, but there's also a, a large portion that you know leave service and transition really well. Right. Uh, um, and that's something that, that we like to showcase at Walking Wind as well. We, you know, we like to show things in a positive manner. We want to yeah. help those that have landed on hard times regain that independence. Uh, but we also want to work with those that have transitioned really well, that are doing really well, potentially engage them into our volunteering project to help spread the word and support those that haven't done so well. Yeah. Uh, so it, that's that's why you know it's, it's really great work with Walking Wind and Walking Wind the charity because you know it's irrespective of illness, illness, injury, condition, background where you've transitioned, if you served, how long you've served, you can get involved with us, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, so not just saying um, you have to be injured, you have to um, be seriously injured to get our support. Anybody can come and get involved and build that big walking room the community. That is cool. So if people listening now, or they know friends, or they happen to be uh, ex-military themselves, they just go online and search for walking with the wounded and they can get in touch that way? Yeah, absolutely. So walkingwiththewounded.org.uk uh, is the website. There's yeah. lots of information in there. So even if you've not served um, and you're feeling a bit, you know, feeling a bit pants with the uh, with the pandemic, feeling a bit low, there's loads of handy toolkits on there for mental health and resilience. Very good. Um, but should you, you know, you want some support service or feel like you should refer or could refer someone to support services. There's a, there's a get support tab on there, and there's a there's a join and support tab in terms of. Uh, helping with the volunteering page and there's a full sign up page on there if, if you visit that and then on uh, social media you can contact us on uh, support at support the walk um, put that into any search engine and, and walking the wound will be there slap bang in front of your face excellent excellent and uh, okay well that's that's brilliant to talk to you is there anything I haven't covered you want to tell everyone about that uh because my brain gets a bit addled when I'm running along, and, but uh, anything I've not covered? No, I don't know. No? No, I, I think you've covered everything there, but I think, well, how, how many kilometres are you in now? I'm now 22, so I'm past 21 is the thing. Of course, in the UK, people, number of people still think in miles, which would be about 13 yeah. miles, but uh, it's easier in K, because you'll know every time you've been deployed around the world, it's been in kilometres, hasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, it is. Um, there's only three countries in the world that use miles. Now there's a whole thing of nationalism about oh, it's our miles, but it's, I just try to make things easy for the world. Everyone uses the metric system, and we sort of half use it. But America doesn't, Liberia doesn't, and uh, Myanmar doesn't. Those are the three, and we half use it. So that's the weird thing, because I think it'd be nice to have both up on on uh, road signs so that because we want tourists to come over you know there's a whole brexit argument where they still we want the tourists and they be nice then to be able to look up and know how far it is you know miles and kilometers no problem so i try and do i do it in k because it's easier it goes yeah. 42 30 20 you know 15 10 you know you can count down easier and it's more grabbable you know you can do i've oh, just you can have your watch set it set so that every oh. one kilometer it goes billy and you've got done another kilometre. And uh, one thing I'd love to see, Eddie, is the amount of calories that you're going to be burning in the next 31 days. You must be eating like a machine. Well, I am 
I'm eating, is it, we've got nutrition working on this. We're working very hard to get out the perfect nutrition for me. Uh, it's very hot, my energy is low. So I'm, yeah. running, I'm running on fumes, which is, this is my, men, I'm trying to do selection here. This is me, every time I do this, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to do selection of special forces. No one's shooting at me, I totally admit that, but I'm just trying to keep going, keep going, keep going. And uh, there is, even though I take, I take a certain amount of, carbs in just before there's a porridge I eat an hour before and then there's a, a certain carb loading after which is the, the, the big boy carbs as Jordan my nutritionist says and then it's it's more protein protein just before bed for muscle building uh, and it's uh, yeah I'm I look at my face when I go to the loo I can see my bit like I'm not looking too bad but I feel a bit I feel a bit chunky around here still but, uh, uh -huh. but when I'm talking to you, talking to people and guests, that's the, if I could have a good conversation like we're having now, I'm not even yeah. thinking about the legs. That's the weird thing. I just come right out of it. And I'm just into ideas and what you're doing is positive. And I could have been, you know, I could have been in the military and what would that have been like? And if it was World War II, I definitely would have been there. I just, I just know that. I remember reading about the commandos and, uh, it was up in, um, right up in Scotland, and reading about a guy who had gone a absent without leave, AWOL, as you know, and uh, which is illegal, and then you get thrown in the brig. But but if they, if you went AWOL and you, and you could somehow, through a sort of, uh, it was Britain in military times during the war, get all the way up to Scotland and get there, they'd have you in the commandos because they'd like the fact that you'd you'd got your way there without a, a travel warrant and without you know anyone catching you so they wanted that thinking out of the box thing and that's kind of that's kind of what i've done all my life is doing it differently and getting there you know coming out as trans back in 85 i don't know how old you were in 85 but it was toxic back then i was a toxic person and in 1990 still toxic 1995 it's continued until 2014 when it got a bit easier and uh but i'm ready to to fight anyone who wants to fight me and if they insult me, I'll throw insults back. So this has been my own personal battle. And you know, mental health, you know mental health. My mental yeah. health is in a very good place uh, because I've confronted the issues and I've talked about them and tried to explain myself and created a space for myself without hurting other people. It's not, I'm not getting in anyone's face. I'm just saying I'm here, I exist, and this is true. So that's what, that's what I do. No, it's an absolute testament to yourself there, Eddie, and you know, I, I, I'm keeping a close eye on this campaign, and I've seen all the amazing work you've done in the past, um, so all my best wishes to you, and I think it's, it's around 51,000 now, isn't it, pounds, and it's 21 yes. days to go, so it, I think is. I'm fairly confident you'll, you'll smash that target, we hope um, and I'll be promoting and raising awareness as much as I can where I can, so thank no, you. amazing, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you, so thank you for having me on. Wonderful talking to you, if this is your first one, you're good at these, so do more of them, so. Oh, perfect. Invite me back. Invite me back next week. <laughs> yeah, that, that's okay. You can come back anytime you want. Because uh, it's, it's a bit like I have a chat show now. Come back anytime you want. Because <laughs> I always, I always, I talked to Joe Rogan yesterday. He does a, I don't know if you know Joe yeah. Rogan, but he does a you know, podcast that's huge. It's the biggest one in the world. And I talked to him for three hours. And then he talked to me. And I was interviewing him for 45 minutes. And he said, if you're down in Austin where he is now, I can pop in and and do another chat so I, I like talking I because like, it gets if you can get through the truth and ideas of what's really happening as opposed to the light and fluffy and you know what's your favorite color and what's your your pop song your list it's, it's the real thing about human beings how we interact how we live our lives how we can help everyone get forward that's what I'm fighting for and I think you're fighting for too and walking with the wounded is too so well done to you guys Absolutely. Thank you very much, Eddie. And, and like I said before, all the best. And, all the best. Uh, I'll be following you closely now. Thanks, Maybe God. even doing that for myself. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> you crazy fool. Take care. <laughs> Take care, now. Bye-bye. So that's uh, talking with Scott Briggs there, for volunteer uh, with Walking with the Wounded, doing a lot of good stuff, comes from a military family, has, uh, has been in the services and is now in that, a reservist in the services in the, in the forces, Duke of Lancaster Regiment. So that's a great chat there. Uh, 
And at 3.30, I'm going to talk to Joel uh, Oxberry. Ah, here we go. Joel Oxberry, who's head of income for walking with the wounded, just talking before uh, with uh, someone else for walking with the wounded, which will be Joel now. And uh, we could talk about the importance of volunteering, such as what Scott was just talking with. Uh, is doing volunteering of course great and I was lucky enough had the honor of being like an ambassador for the games makers the volunteers at the Olympics any games makers out there in salute to you you would <sighs> yeah you're amazing amazing with the games makers the volunteers just of up and beyond and they were volunteers and I had to, I'm not sure how it worked on getting themselves down to London for the thing, but I know a lot of them, a lot of, probably the majority, were not doing, you think, oh, you're a volunteer, you're down on the track side, you're seeing, you know, great athletes get world records. A lot of them were not. A lot of them are in places just getting cars parked and it, you know, sorting out things in offices, not visible, not seeing the Olympics roll by. And, uh, just did a beautiful job. Athletes did a beautiful job. Organizers, everyone involved in the London 2012. Yeah, it's a beautiful gig, beautiful thing. And I saw it. And I saw it mainly on my iPad. I saw world records happen and then races be won on my iPad because I wasn't there because you know everyone had bought the tickets. But I could see it happen. Uh, I I actually saw, I think it might have been this one. I had a little iPad, so a baby one here. And Andy Murray got the gold medal. And before he'd won Wimbledon, but he was at Wimbledon getting the gold medal in the Olympics. And I was in Edinburgh. And it was just about to happen. And it was happening, I think, on this iPad on a stream. And there was a driver driving me in the front seat. I was going to the hotel and I said to him, it's a little bit dangerous, but I put the, the thing on, on the seat next to him so that he could just quickly glance down because he needed to see it. Andy Murray winning that gold medal. Beautiful moment. Now I know Andy Murray's had a very tough time with injuries, but uh, he's just a fighter, so I respect the fighters. Fighters that fight on. So yeah. That's, uh, that was a beautiful thing to, think, to see live in front of my eyes, even though it wasn't there, I was miles away. But I could, I could see it happening in, in the very moment. And so the driver did too. So we were, he was kind of, his mind was slightly blown because, you know, streaming, that was like the early days of streaming video. 2012, the Olympics. Just sort of started doing it. Huh. Good to do that. So yes, I'm gonna talk to Joel and uh, 3.30 huh. and I have now done over 21k down downward slope um, past 22 so there's less than 20k to go less than 19 here to go I'm running on Zwift hello to all the Zwift people running along um, okay if anyone on Zwift wants to change to a blue shirt I'm gonna I'm gonna slow down why don't I do it now how many are with us let's see oh we've got 76 I can't. is it 76 okay um, um, yeah so if anyone wants to change in a blue shirt I'll tell you what I'll do I feel okay at the moment. What's at four o'clock? Twitter questions. Okay, five to four. Because I keep stopping for the loser. I'm gonna hold it, I'm gonna lose stop at five minutes to four. That's my plan. Or maybe a bit before that. But uh, somewhere between quarter to four and five to four. And then if anyone wants to throw on a blue shirt, if you're running along, you can. Of course, not compulsory. Totally do what you want. It's quite nice, people are running along with me, but sometimes there's runners just come steaming through. I'm coming through. But I can see lots of flags. 
floating around behind me, so that's nice. You can see at the bottom of the screen all those flags. Some of them are bike riders, so it's not all perfectly real. But uh, yeah, if you do want to change the blue shirt, uh, just wait 20 minutes and we'll do it then. Or it could be 20 or 25. Somewhere in there. Slowly down, I suppose. Okay, Jason. Okay, question is, Jason, do you think I should stop now? I can stop now. Okay, I'll stop now. In fact, I'm changing my bike. I'm gonna... Okay. I'm doing a pit stop. If you want to change to a blue shirt, if you're running with me, do it now. So I'll put in... Sorry. Sorry, full stop. Blue shirt change now, if you wish. Full stop, Eddie. the armed forces community and a lot of which use the services of walking with the wounded so is that a video that's playing dave or am i am i no, no you're live i'm back, back live so i'm still i'm having a pit stop at live but yeah so it's just if anyone's swift we've suddenly got into this blue shirt thing so um yeah so anyone is listening rebecca yes I'm, i know i've changed my mind but i'm just trying to get this um, if anyone wants to, probably no one's going to change their shirt. But anyway, I just kind of like the idea of the blue shirt. A team, team humanity. But anyway, you don't have to do it. Just, uh, ah, I should drink more water. Mm. Oh, I like that. Mm. Honey sandwich. You're doing right. Yeah. Chris, that's geezer. You're in blue. Thank you. Go, Eddie. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah. You're doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Run. Thank you. That's a great idea, isn't it? Thanks, Jerry. It should just go through, won't it? No problem, Chris. Okay, 30 seconds, I'm going to start running again. Okay, I'm going to start in three seconds. Here we go. Okay, pit stop over. So, we have a blue shirt thing going, if you want it. Totally up to you. Uh, on Swift in blue. It's a nice idea. I don't know whose idea that was. Victoria, we are humanity's blue army. Team humanity. 
There you go. Hey. Can yes. I speak to Joel? Joel, yes. Hello, Joel. Hi there. Hello, hello, Eddie. I'm live on Eddie's chat show. Yes, indeed. I, I believe that's what we're calling it now. Well, could be the humanity chat show because <laughs> I'm running with a Zwift app and uh, the, the, the runners have suddenly decided they all want to wear blue tops like I'm wearing. So they're saying uh, we're now team humanity. And so I think we're on the humanity, you know, walking with the wounded, you're working for humanity to help people who have uh, been through the forces and the services and uh, get to a better place once they come out and have a, they've had problems. So tell us, yes, tell us about your situation. Uh, yeah, well, for, first and foremost as well, like Scott, thank you so much for giving us some of the time. I know you, you've been really kind in saying that it helps you out, but really it, it helps us spread that message and that awareness. And thank you so much uh, for giving us that time. No uh, but, like, but like you said, uh, as, as all the charities that are taking part in this, our, our common theme is to, is to make humanity great again. And uh, certainly our focus is on, on uh, the armed forces community, uh, those that stood up and served. Uh, and unfortunately find themselves now in a in a tough spot uh, and in need of a bit of a helping hand and, and that can be around a, a multitude of issues both visible injuries and invisible injuries and walking with the wound is just that platform that helps them to, to transition back into civilian life and get to where they want to be that's the uh, that's the crux of it all no one wants to be on on tough street no one wants to be in a hard place yeah. Um, but ultimately, we've been talking about that fighting spirit of the armed forces. They have it in abundance, and we just give them a little bit of a push in the right direction. Excellent. Now, were you in the forces yourself? No, no, I'm, I'm one of the odd ones out, Eddie. So, uh, no, I don't come from a forces background. My, my family, uh, in, in, in terms of immediate family, like my, my dad and uh, you know, my mum and parents, no. My granddad did a, did a stint because he's of that age. Uh, but actually, no, really removed from it all, actually. And uh, I've, I've had a, a huge learning curve over the last two years at Walking with the Wounded. And how did, how did you come to end, uh, end up work, working with Walking with the Wounded then? If, you, if that's not your background, what, how did your paths cross? Uh, so I've been, I've been involved in the charity sector for around about seven years now. Right. So uh, some, somewhere in my, uh, my mid-20s, it grew a heart. I was in business-to-business -business sales. Uh, and then somewhere I just said, no, forget wiping that board clean and, and just focusing on money and let's do something with my skill set. And so uh, I worked at St. Anne's Hospice, so I was part of the hospice movement. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I loved it there. I loved it. Um, and then from there, kind of just followed that health trajectory and went into the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital. So I was part of the NHS Charities Together team. Uh, and then uh, from there, I uh, found myself really just like many other people uh, looking for the next step and walking with the wound was there. And it was, it was quite interesting me uh, looking into the veteran community and actually, even though it's only a small amount that, that find it difficult transitioning, yeah. uh, unfortunately uh, make up a disproportionate amount that find themselves in and out of the criminal justice system, uh, homeless uh, or unemployed as well. And, and that statistic alarmed me. Uh, and so I wanted to make a difference, but I've always been keen to work for an organisation that really impacts the community. So I've always worked for local organisations, and even though Walking with Wind is a national charity, they do some incredible work on the ground. Yeah, now that's interesting. So when you started off, I didn't quite realise this, that you... So what, what do you go to university and do a great degree there? Yes, I did, yeah. I did criminology and social policy for my sins. Oh, wow. Okay, but then you went, yeah. you went into businesses that was about making money and then you decided, no, enough of that for just piling up money, I've got to turn it into a better area. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, so I went to the University of Manchester. Yeah. Uh, I was there for three years doing criminology. Yeah. And I remember about the second year, one of my, uh, one of my lecturers said, if anyone's here wanting to be Robbie Coltrane from Cracker, it doesn't exist. And at that point, I became disenfranchised by the whole thing. Uh, left university and, and thought, what do I do with this if I don't want to go into the police? And uh, ended up really scrabbling about. I went to a recruitment agency back then, and, and they said, you'd be great here. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the rest of that story. Oh, right, OK. So now it, I, I'm reading, I've got some information about yourself in front of me. Um, yeah. You run the, uh, the Regan program, R-E-G-A-N, is that right? 
Uh, no, so actually, yeah, so op, op regen. Uh, so Scott, who you spoke to moments before myself, that's the volunteering programme for walking with the wounded. And explain, uh, I, just explain sorry. the word op regen. What does, how does that, uh, is it op regen, R-E-G-I-O-N, operation uh, region? That's right, yeah. Right. It's, uh, it's operation regeneration. Right, I've got you, got you. Yes, excellent. And so you're um, uh, in ch charge of volunteers or you work closely with the volunteers? Yeah, that's right. So um, you, you might have heard from Ferg, who you spoke to, and, and Scott, I think, touched upon it as well. Yeah. Uh, there's a number of the, the beneficiaries that we work with at Walking with the Wounded that find themselves unemployed. Uh, so Walking with the Wounded try to support those individuals back into employment, but it's not always what people want to go into. Uh, so there's very different uh, circumstances. Uh, so we scrabbled around thinking, well, well, actually, what do you do for those individuals where employment's not the next step, but we still want to try and get that sense of purpose and that camaraderie and breaking down those barriers of social isolation. Um, and so for, for us, volunteering uh, came to the fore as, uh, as a route that we wanted to try and direct our beneficiaries to. Right. Righty. Well, this is... This is, you know, I just think it, it's really good where someone I did want to be in the forces and I wasn't, but uh, it must be, it must be such a different life to go into the forces and to experience that place, camaraderie, difficulty. They say that if you're in uh, action, it's long periods of boredom and then moments of, of you know, horrific terror and, and you come out of that and you go back into civilian life. It must be such a, a strange experience, which it's just too, uh, very difficult for some people to, to deal with, yes? Is that right? Yeah, I think so. And, uh, and, and like I said, Eddie, I, I've not come from that background of, of serving. Um, and stepping into walking with wood, I, I, I assumed everyone that found themselves in a difficult place would be suffering with PTSD. It's, it's the buzzword you know, that, that really was, uh, was, was thrown around in mainstream. But you've touched upon some aspects that affect those individuals more than just the conflict side. It's, the lack of the camaraderie, the, the the fact that nothing else is going to you know give them that same kind of sense of purpose, yeah. and actually someone broke it down to me in layman's term. Almost overnight, for these individuals, they've lost their their job, they've lost their family in in sense of you know their brothers, um, and um, they, they they've lost their job, um, and so you know overnight they find themselves in this in this very difficult position that actually would affect anyone. If I woke up tomorrow and you know I didn't have my wife to rely on and my, my job was no longer there my mental health would be in a bad place and, and that's the thing it's, it's not it's not unique to them being in the forces often it's actually just that they've had um, a, a volume of, of negative situations and it's hard to pick yourself up from there even though you've got that fighting spirit I understand okay now I'm, I'm reading off here that uh, recently um, not so whether it's yourself or walking with the wounded volunteers, but stepping up to support the Nightingale hospitals and deliver emergency food parcels during the pandemic. Is, is that a situation that you've been involved in? Because obviously it's, it's, it's at a very tough point right at this moment. Yeah, yeah I mean, in truth, it's, um, it, 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 it comes down to, again, the, the, the armed forces community wanting to serve. You know, it's the whole reason why you step up in the first place. Yeah. And no idea that you mentioned, um, you know, if, if these were the days of World War II, you would be there. Yeah. There's some individuals that have that, that fire in the belly, that, that sense of purpose. Um, and, um, and it happens in crisis. So obviously we find ourselves in a global pandemic and, you know, it doesn't take much for the armed forces community to pop their hands in the air and say, yes, I'll take part. And so, Op Regen um, initially was was um, involved in itself in environmental impact, so um, litter picks, uh, improving communities, improving green spaces, but ultimately it was out there in, in the public uh, domain. And so we had a number of ex-forces uh, and armed forces personnel that said, what, what, what's this Op Regen? It's, it's volunteering, but, but can we volunteer to help the, the, the pandemic? Uh, and so at the time we weren't set up for that, but we worked very closely with local authorities and before you know it, uh, we're uh, delivering to those that found themselves shielding and uh, giving emergency parcels and provision. Uh, and actually again, Scott's working on a project which is going to be combining efforts with one of your 
chosen charities and fair share. So actually, yeah. we're, we're, we're picking up some of the food, we're packaging that, and we're sending it around some of the most vulnerable households in Greater Manchester. Uh, but excellent. we're going to be rolling that out across the UK as well. Excellent, excellent. Um, and hopefully we're going to get through this pandemic sooner rather than later. Um, but if people want to help and want to be volunteers, uh, how do they do that? Do they need to be ex-services people or can they, I assume they don't have to be to work with walking with the wounded? No, no, yeah, it's a really good point actually. Thank you for, for raising it. So, uh, of course, our focus is on ex-military yep. uh, and the client will always come first. So in our case, you, you have to serve to, uh, to get our support around mental health and around our programs. Um, but actually, if you wanted to volunteer, that, that could be anyone uh, from, from any walk of life. And what we find really important is that when we offer our support to, to veterans, uh, we, we're always keen to say that actually you are a civilian now. You need to recognise the inherent skills that you've got from the forces, but you're actually a civilian. Uh, and uh, sometimes there's this belief that you, you, know, you can't speak to a civvy, you can serve, they just won't understand you. Uh, and there's an element of that with some of the acronyms, but we, we encourage uh, Civvy Street and the forces to come together. So you can be from any walk of life to take part in Op Regen. Um, just, just be aware that you'll be, uh, you'll be taking part in those volunteering programmes alongside some of our ex-forces leads. But that's an incredible way to educate yourself. But how would they do that? They just go online, walkingwiththewounded.org.uk and uh, get in touch that way? Yeah, that's the initial port of call. If you go to our website, uh, so you can just go on a, a search engine, uh, type in walking with the wounded, yeah. uh, and we'll come up as, as the uh, as the first link hits on there. And then there's there's various different means to get in touch, but the easiest one is just to contact us via email, which is on uh, online. Very good. Now, I was just talking to Scott about walking with the wounded. I'm talking to yourself, so, and I'm quite tired. So my brain is. I'm I'm thinking. Okay, I'll ask you this question, that question. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you now and say, are there any other things you'd like to mention that I haven't covered? And is there anything you want to ask me? And then I, I can just keep pounding away and you can sort of run the, just, I'm not putting pressure on you, but just in case you think, oh, you should, we should mention this. Or Eddie, why the hell are you doing this, that, or whatever. <laughs> uh, do, do, do you know what? You, you have more than given us a, a platform for walking with the wounded side. And, and yes, if I can, uh, for, for a moment, I, I do have a few questions actually, yeah, go for and, it. and you, you touched upon one. Why? Why are you doing? Why are you doing this? I mean, clearly, you, you weren't a runner back in was it 2017 when you decided to do your first back-to-back -back marathons. Have no. you got the now? Have I got what was that last thing? Have I got the what? Have, have you got the book for running now? No, I. I like running. There's a few things I like about running, but I like the fact that it's very. You know, I tour the world, I do filming around the world, dramas, I tour doing comedy, um, and wherever you are, uh, this is like for any person, if you've just packed your, your running uh, shoes, you can probably just run, you know, you get, get a top, it, it's very s small amount of uh, equipment needed to do running, it's just you and get out there. So I love that, but you can stay healthy that way. Sometimes I'm running, not these ones, but generally, and you see a great vista or thing, or you suddenly feel I'm powering along, or you meet someone or something, it's a nice thing, and that can be beautiful. Being outdoors is great, so I love all those things. But I'm doing that, 2009 was the first one, which was running the, oh. yeah, I ran all around the United Kingdom for sport relief, did 43 marathons in 51 days, but I was taking days off every week, and I stopped that. And then 2016, I ran 27 marathons, in 27 days in South Africa for Nelson Mandela mm -hmm. and to celebrate him 27 years in prison coming out without bitterness was an amazing tower of strength and then it was 2019 with the 29 around Europe and now it's the 31 virtually in Europe and the world we're going to put some other marathons on and doing gigs afterwards so I'm challenging myself and and I think I have a very ordinary uh, look a very ordinary sense you know some people seem special some people and i keep saying this about david Beckham. david looks amazing did look amazing and looks amazing and you know when he played football he thought well that's an amazing person it sort of all goes together which isn't actually true you don't normally look like david that's supposed to be that brilliant 
but I just look like some git. And and I I think if I if I run this stuff, people think, well that person's like me. They just look like someone, someone else. And also make oh, 10 quid, 20 quid, fiver, whatever I can, I'll do ideas, I'll do, come up, I'll press that button, I'll do the text. Um, I think it's that, and I am the Make Humanity Great Again title. I know it, it, it's taking from a, a title, a slogan that had another person came up, I can't remember who the person who came up with the other title was, the other slogan, I think they're, they're just going out of history at the moment. But uh, this, seems, this seems like a good slogan, because 7.8 billion in the world, and, and no one really fights for humanity. It's very difficult to, because if you're a politician, you've got to fight for your constituency, or your party, or the country. But trying to say, I, I was born in Yemen, so I already had a head start, born in Aden, in Yemen, and I'm now performing in four languages, so I've decided this is the 21st century, um, coming of age of humanity, and we need to make it so that everyone in the world has the right to have a fair chance in life. That is my worldview, the right to have a fair chance in life. Not a free life, but the right to have a fair chance. And, and if we don't make that this century, I don't think humanity is going to make it. I don't think there's anyone looking after us upstairs, I'm afraid. And I, I do believe it's up to the good will of humanity to save humanity, fighting against the ill will of humanity. And so I'm going to fight for the good will. Yeah I, couldn't, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think I read something in a, in a speech, and I can't remember when, uh, from yourself, Eddie, but um, it was talking about, you know, it's, it's not God that turns up, it's, it's, it's us. Yeah. You know, it's, it's humanity. We show up. We're the ones that do that. And, yeah, I, I love what you just said there. It's, it's a shame that we find ourselves in, you know, it seems, it seems quite disjointed times now with everything that's going on. Um, but, but actually, it's it's you're absolutely right. It, it's, it's us that's going to get us out of ourselves out of this that, this mess. That is, if you are if you are a religious person, you will disagree with me on this. But and I but whichever religion, I'm happy for it to be true. A merciful God from any organized religion, excellent. Just come down and help us. But they never seem to come and help. And so I actually don't think they're there. I think it's polite to say that God doesn't exist, and it's rude to say He does exist. But he's horrible and hates us and wants babies to die with horrible diseases and neglected tropical diseases and the, all of the injustice in the world that God is happy to let that happen. That is, that is a bad thing to say. It's more polite to say that actually they're not there and we're lucky enough to be here. So it's up to our goodwill to make humanity continue forwards. And if we don't have enough of it, we won't make it. I really believe that. They'll invent some bloody horrible thing that could be like a, imagine COVID plus plus, you know, mm. imagine a more virulent, you know, these new strains coming on. If we imagine the new strain we couldn't deal with because these, these uh, vaccines uh, can deal with the new strains. But imagine they said, we've got this vaccine. We've worked our backsides off. Here it is. Oh, there's a new strain which is completely powerless or is, is completely go through this vaccine. The vaccine won't do anything with it. That would be a bloody nightmare. And we know we're right at the tipping age of it, which, which Donald Trump, unfortunately, is ignoring and being the most, the, the worst leader of any country ever, maybe in the history of the world, in peacetime. It is just awful what he's doing. So I reach out to anyone with a heart, with a conscience, using common sense that we must help humanity move forward and make stronger connections around the world rather than break them and just go back into the 1930s again. And, and, and Eddie, that reaching out as well, quite interesting that you use that. And uh, I think moments ago you touched upon language as well. Is, is that the reason you're so passionate about language and, and learning so many different languages? It was a good way to show, um, you may know, I don't know where you are on the whole question in our country, but you know, half a country wants to leave Europe, half wants to stay. The mo and you know, I know that Brexit is there with Boris Johnson's government, but still, I feel it's inevitable, it's our continent, and I'm proud, British, proud, European, and I wanted to put my mouth, my money where my mouth is, so I thought, why don't I start doing gigs in French and showing that they're laughing at the same things that we're laughing at, and in German, and in Spanish, and in Russian when I get there. It, it's, uh, my, my comedy is very alternative, very Monty Python, but we are all human. If you cut us, do we not bleed? Not only just Shylock in motion, 
happens in the Merchant of Venice, it's everyone. And whatever the color of their skin, same people. And we know this, we've always known this. But certain right-wing leaders, simplistic leaders, and they've come forward and they've said, do you want to use your hatred? Do you feel hatred? Well, I'll tell you, let's direct it towards these people or those people. It doesn't even matter who they're saying. I mean, I think Hitler didn't even, it didn't even, he just wanted someone to blame. The doctor that was very caring with his mother, Hitler's mother, who he loved, and she loved Hitler, and he was a Jewish doctor. And after all that, and all the care that he put into her, he decided that Jewish people should be murdered endlessly. What is that? What is that? That's, that's a man who's got a broken brain, does not work, sociopath, psychopath, and they're out there in the world. And Donald Trump is definitely a sociopath. And his, you know, his, the, the, the lying upon lying upon lying, it just, we can't let that go forward. Humanity will die. So I'm, I feel we have to stand up. You know, evil happens when good people do not stand up and say no. We have to stand up and say that is wrong. Lying cannot, just bald-faced lying, fundamental lies, cannot be part of politics. And people are getting away with it. And we're going back to the 1930s. So I'm fighting for a better 2030s. And that's what I'm trying to do here. Yeah, amazing. I'm and, 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 and hoping having these conversations, it makes people stop and pause. And whatever your political stance, um, you know, I don't think anyone can uh, watch these scenes that are happening around the world and, and, and be happy about that. And uh, so, so yeah, hopefully it makes people stop and think there's got to be a better way. Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of progressive people that are always pushing for diversity and humanity. There are some people who are lost. They're very right wing. They're full of hate and rage. And, and they're just going to, they're going to enjoy the fact of the insurrection things happened on the 6th of January in Washington, D.C. But then there's a, a lot of people in the middle who, who do float one way and the other. And we have to bring them towards humanity and away from, it's just hatred, using hatred, lying and then using hatred. as If you keep lying, you can stoke anyone up. You just, Hitler said, if, if the lie is big enough, you can make it work. And Trump has done this. The huge lie, when you're in this position, you're running a thing and saying, he said, you know, he was trying to steal an election back. It was one fair and square. You could see Republican officials saying, no, you, you heard that telephone call. You know, it was just beyond belief what he did. Nixon, we thought Nixon was bad. This guy's three times as worse, I'd say. Three times worse. And Nixon was horrific. Anyway. Yeah, no, it's, 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 a bit of a, it's a bit of a pantomime at the moment. Yeah. It's, uh, it's incredible to see what's happening. And then actually, I know that pantomimes aren't your thing. You've got Julian Clare in at five, so uh, apologies for bringing that up. No, I won't even talk about it because my mum was in a pantomime, see? Okay. My mum, 1958, the lads, the Little Aiden Dramatic Society, Little Aiden was Alberica, I think it's now called, it's the proper name, it's the uh, Arabic name and the BP built a refinery there and they built a hospital and houses and it's a whole little town called Little Aden. and dad was an accountant there he worked his way up in just doing the accounting for a refinery and mum turned up in 58 as a, uh, a nurse and they met they married in 59 and my brother was born in 60 and I was born in 62 so so Aden in Yemen means a lot to us because we exist because of it and uh, and mum did a pantomime and she played, she played Princess Jasmine or Princess Jasmine um, who was with Aladdin. So she's the beautiful woman with Aladdin, but Aladdin's always played by a principal boy. And I thought I could play Aladdin in the girl mode, boy mode. I think I'd be a perfect Aladdin in the, in the pantomime. But pantomime's a very old school, but Julian has reinvented it in his own way. And I saw the, I wanted to see the Palladium one. So I'm gonna to talk to him about that and how he's changed it with a tsunami of smut, I think was the, <laughs> was the, was the review he got. Um, and, but it is just so charming. His smut is so charming. So this is, and you wouldn't have thought you could put these words together, but this is what Julian's done. And more power to him for doing that. Because I, I saw it in him and Dawn French. And whenever they were on, it was like this very alternative gig. And then, when they were both off the stage, it became a kind of traditional pantomime with people saying, come on, kids. And I was thinking, nah, I'm not really into that. 
but when Julian just walked back on, it just changed again. He kept, yeah. he kept saying to me, well, I thought you were dead. What are you doing here? <laughs> stuff like this, very irreverent stuff. That's, that's <laughs> beautiful. Yeah, the, the crowd shouting, bring the tsunami of snot back. Well, he was there, he was, I think I, I said that Julian was not doing double entendres, he was doing single entendres. He was just saying lines that you think, actually that is just a single entendre. That's just, <laughs> that's just out and out there smutty. But, uh, and, you know, people, even mainstream people, are loving that. So it's weird, it's a bit like um, Larry Grayson, who took over the Generation game. I don't know what age you are, but Generation, Bruce Forsyth, big hit in Generation game. Then he wanted to do his own thing, so he moved to ITV. And his show didn't work. Larry Grayson was brought in. They thought no one can replace Brucey. And uh, Larry Grayson did, and he did it. He was very camp. And I don't think he was out as gay, but he was obviously gay, but he was camp as all camp as Christmas. And it was a big hit. A second uh, host of, it was, you know, I don't think they can get another hit, another host after that, but I was fascinated by that. Um, the edge of where mainstream bread, mainstream anywhere, France, Germany, America, begins to go, okay, um, we will lean towards more diversity, being more open to LGBT plus people, being more open to people of all different skin colors, being able to be in, uh, to do anything they want in life. We, we are in a good place in life, I think. Sorry, I'm going a bit macro on this, but you know, young girls can grow up, young boys or girls, and you say whatever you want. Young girl, if you want to be in special forces, if you want to be uh, uh, a, a prime minister, you want to be a president, uh, whatever your skin color, whatever, even your sexuality, um, now is the time. We're that open at the front end of our, our lives, but at the other side, you've got Trump and all that hatred. So we're fighting against that and trying to head forward to a better 2030s. That's what I said. You know, I, I was quite interested by that. You mentioned it on, on a discussion with uh, with Scott. But 35 years, you, you've been struggling. Well, not struggling, but actually you were seen as toxic yeah. when you when you came out. And it was only 2014, you said, where yeah. you felt with a positive shift. I was quite shocked at that. Well, it is, if you track it back, I've used the word toxic. You could say uh, perversion. That's what it was called. That would be the word they would use. I've used the word toxic because it's, even though it's a hellish word, it's slightly easier, better, sits better for me. But anyway, a bad person, that's what they said, and I'm sure a lot of right wing people would still say that. But I knew it was built into me. Uh, it was genetic or something like that, chromosomes, whatever it was, because I knew since I was five, and most LGBT people do know from a very early age. Um, the, 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 the tipping point was 2014 because three things happened in America, and America's a very good generator of, of news. If something happens in America, America tells the whole of America, and it, and it floats all around the world. It's uh, the, the biggest country, the most powerful country for doing that. And you had a series called Transparent, which started winning awards. You had Laverne Cox, a black trans activist who was in the hit series, Orange is the New Black, and was given uh, by Time Magazine or Quick Time Life magazine, a Person of the Year award, which is a big front cover, very important. And then you've got, uh, I mean, Vanity Fair, Caitlyn Jenner, getting yes. the front cover of that. So those three things happened in one year, I think they're all in 2014. So that made a, a, a sort of a wave go out. And then the word diversity was much more flowing around. And suddenly I felt from being, I always knew my job was to try and knit being trans, being TV slash trans, whatever the title was, because the language has changed, try to knit that into society and say, I am a member of society and I'd like a little space for myself and there are other people who are trans as well and we just want to exist and we want to pay taxes and we want to have a life, we'd like to have partners and we want to work and do job and we'd like to add to the human existence if we can, do something positive, that's probably what we all want to do. So that's what I was fighting for. And since 2014, I felt it's slightly easier. Well, that's great. Yeah, I think clearly you'll be more attuned to to that shift. Uh, but I know that certainly I felt it myself now as as a father, and you know my, my son's three and a half now, and um, clearly with with movements like the Black Lives Matters movement, 
take a look and just say, well, am I doing enough? Um, and we looked at the, the books that were reading uh, him, his name's Xander, and uh, there was just no diversity in those books. And right. we were just walking blindly into this. And actually, you know, it's, it's made even me, who I'd, I'd say is fairly embracing and, you know, very passionate about, you know, humanity and, and you know, it, in, ensuring that we embrace each other, uh, irrespective of beliefs and background. Uh, and, and we've shifted now. We've actually had to go out and buy a load of books, which which encourage the knowledge around you know different areas, be that religion or or gender or sexuality. Yeah. Um, but, but but clearly that that shift is it is now more prevalent, and I'm glad that it is. Yes. No. We are we are again at a point coming out of COVID. Some people think say things are going to go even more right wing. Going to be a lot of unemployment when the economy is in a tough place. People tend to go for uh, politics goes more right wing. People turn up with simplistic arguments and simplistic policies. But real politics is as complicated. Real life is as complicated as it seems. I mean, it's unfortunate, but it looks complicated, and it is. But mm. we, we've got to we've got to head forward. Anyway, Joel, I'm going to say goodbye to you because I have to go and talk to people on Twitter and do some <laughs> questions. I probably need to go to the loo as well. <laughs> but thank you very much. Great to talk to you. Yeah, and, and you too. Thank you so much. And Walking with the Wounded, ladies and gentlemen, Walking with the Wounded, just look them up online if you'd like to help or if you're a per person who's ex uh, forcing services and you need help, just walk, just search them online and uh, they're a great organisation to go for. And we're, your money, if you donate it at ESL.com, there is an amount of money will go towards them as they're one of the five charities we're championing uh, on this challenge. Thanks very much. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you so much. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, John. Oh. Okay, I'm going to walk for a little bit. Uh, just doing a bit of walking. A lot of blue shirts out there now. Team Humanity. Okay. Um, so, we're talking to Twitter now. Twitter, anyone wants to dive on Twitter and we can answer questions. Yes, Sarah, that's what's happening? Yes, that's right, yep. So if uh, anybody on Twitter has questions, now is the time to uh, to put your questions out. Um, if you go to the live stream uh, on Twitter and you put your uh, comment or your questions there, um, then we'll uh, we'll try and get through them. Yes, so are we talking to people on Twitter if you've got any questions? Um, people on Zwift, we have 83 Zwifters nearby, but some of them will be very tricky to tell today because lots of them will be bike riders who are not paying any attention. And I'm walking a bit. Anyone running with us? We're doing blue shirts on Zwift. Um, if you can put on blue shirt, then it matches mine. When then we, you become part of Team Humanity. There you go. Um, so, uh, yes, so that's what we're doing. I'm just walking because I'm still got this front of my calf still talking to me. I'm running with the Hungarian flag today, celebrating uh, Bucharest. There you go, the river Danube behind you. You can see on the, on the photographs there that are zipping behind us. Are they flashing and changing, Dave, or are they? Oh, there we are. On a slow loop. There we are. So, I've been there. I've played there a number of times. Played there two times. I've run a marathon there back on the 10th of February last year. And, uh, yep, we are going. So, sorry, just interrupt me when you want. Yeah, sure. And I'm just going to let everyone get on to uh, Twitter now and pop things up. Yeah. And, um, and actually, we didn't get through all of our uh, Budapest uh, facts, so I'm going to do a couple of those to give everyone the chance. Uh, so, let's go back to some Budapest facts. Uh, some really interesting ones, actually. So, um, Budapest has the oldest subway in continental Europe. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so it's been in constant operation since 1896. Only London's metro is older. Right. So, London's was in 1863 it was constructed. 1863, yeah, so that was... All the trains coming, apparently. There's uh, Bleak House, I think, has got... Dickens uh, talking a lot about London being kind of cut up so that the trains could go through. Um, which, if you think about it, had to have uh, 
they had to do that to get the trains through. They didn't have to do it, but if they're going to put trains in, they had to slice through in some way. <sighs> and uh, another fact of Budapest. Now, I think we uh, we went to uh, some of these establishments, I think, with uh, Gabor um, when we were last there. But uh, Budapest is known for its ruins pubs. And the ruins bars of Budapest have uh, been quietly known for having been turned around from former ghettos into lively pubs and restaurants uh, after young people of the city decided to renovate the Soviet-style abandoned houses with gardens and anything they could find on the street. Today they are epicenters of the city's youth, often holding parties, festivals and all the nightlife you could want. Oh, wow. oh they say, with little to no rules and cheap food and drinks. There you go. Oh. And another uh, fact, uh, paprika was invented in Budapest. Uh -huh. It says, le legend hat says, which means dubious, uh, Hungarians eat more than 500 grams of paprika per year. So there you go. Wow. That's a lot of paprika. I know that Hungarian is one of the most un unusual languages in Europe and it's supposed to be linked with Finnish in some way, but that, that not, not in an obvious way. But yeah. It, uh, oh, this is interesting as well. Budapest was not the first capital of Hungary. Oh, right. What's it the first? was once Erstegon. Yeah. No further info, that's it. Uh, oh, and this is interesting. Um, beneath the city of Budapest lies a hidden subterranean world, a maze of over 200 caverns and tunnels. The caverns are the result of the large number of geothermal springs in the area from thermal activity. Oh, wow. I that. We have to done. Yeah. Uh, what does it say? This. Wow, the six mile long. Budavari Labyrinthus has a, oh, it's got a tumultuous history, it says. Uh, it was a refuge for prehistoric people, uh, a cellar, and a prison in medieval times. It was also a bomb shelter and military hospital during World War II. Right. It was a command post during the Cold War, uh, but in recent times, it's a museum. Oh, there you go. And actually, a very uh, known fact, uh, Budapest has more thermal water springs than any other capital in the world. Right. So there we are, a few more facts for Budapest. Yes. So, now we've given everyone a bit of time on Twitter, I'll uh, go for some questions. Zwift here. Number of people, anyone on Zwift, if you want to run along with us with a blue shirt, that's... Uh, they are part of, be part of team humanity. That's uh, that's uh, what we we've suddenly decided we're doing. Don't have to, but it's there as an option. Yes, you can do. So I've got two more hours to go. Less than two hours. I've done four sixths, or two thirds of a marathon, and uh, this is the point in South Africa where I was taken out on the fifth marathon. I was, uh, whistle was blown, and I went to the hospital after two thirds. Yeah, that was a, that was a difficult day. So, so, Rebecca, you're two kilometers ahead of me, which is fine. Are you just making sure there are no sharks or things out there? Keeping bears out of the way. That's Rebecca Wensley. 2K in my head, and that was a message from Victoria Cousins I saw that, but I don't know how you know that. Um, it must be a part of uh, a Swift that I don't know. Okay, so I'll do some uh, Twitter questions. Okay. So this one is from Helen Andrews, uh, who says, you mentioned the other day perhaps writing music for films, which I think would be awesome. So I wondered if you'd like to write or co-write a film in the future. Oh, no, I've already co-written a film that's six minutes to midnight 
which I wrote with Kelly Jones and Andy Goddard. It's going to come out the 28th of March in the UK and the United States uh, on IFC in the United States and on Sky Lionsgate over here. And uh, yes, so it stars uh, myself, is in it? I suppose I'm the lead in it. And Judy, great Judy Dench is in it. Judy, Dame Judy Dench. And, and uh, we are uh, we're very happy with the film. We did it back in. And Jim Broadbent's also in it, sorry. Brain going here. But Jim and Judy, of course, both Oscar winners. I'm just an Emmy winner. It's a great cast in there. James Darcy in there. Helen Jones, who co wrote it with, is uh, also in it and is a very good actor and uh, plays uh, a character who works with James Darcy's character. Um, lots, it's uh, set just before World War II, for six minutes to midnight, and it will be out. Well, we hope theatrical release, but then who knows in this COVID thing. Hopefully, we're in a better place at the end of March. But that is the date, 26th of March, we've been told coming out. So uh, yes, I will be writing, co-writing, or and I need to get to, to directing movies. I think that is the place I have to be. Um, and I like being in them. So as I broke into Pinewood Studios when I was 15. So more of those to come. Thank you. Okay, next question is from uh, Flimbies, who asks, do you ever suffer from down or bad or dark days? If you do, what techniques do you use to help recover from them? Do you have any personal tips that could help? Um, I tend not to get so many down dark days. I've got so much that I have to do in my life, which I have purposefully set up like that. So I tend to body swerve around it that way. But if I do, I. I tend to watch things, streaming things, on my iPad. Um, I've always liked watching films, dramas, thrillers. Uh, some comedies, not much. The Simpsons, I happen to be watching, going through all the, the seasons they've done it for over 25 years. Um, but that's, I suppose, my, most, my easiest escape. Uh, I keep try and keep match fit for life, so I keep training. As my, uh, not hard, but just keep myself going, and that keeps me in a good place. And uh, yeah, so I'm sorry if you're having a tough time, but um, trying to get yourself out of that place that's obviously the hard thing, but I, I'm constantly trying to do things which I'm looking forward to setting up. I, we had to set up this, which I was kind of I'm uh, looking forward to is the right word. I'm looking forward to finishing it, but not so much the doing of it. Okay, sorry, not a brilliant answer, but that's, that's what I do. Okay, next question is from Sai in LA, who says, Hi Eddie, you have Hi. fantastic legs from the running. Do you do any upper body or strength training workouts? I should, so I, I should do upper body. I was just talking to um, someone who was doing a lot of rowing uh, yesterday, I think it was, and uh, I should really probably have a rowing machine or something, and I don't, so yes, that's something I'm less good at, uh, or swimming, um, so yeah, I'm behind on that, but uh, I'm trying to work out how to bring that in into my life, probably a rowing machine. Okay, next question is from Drew Grasher, who says, uh, who asks, why are your people called the beekeepers? Well, it's, if, if I put a message out on, uh, some people on social media, if I put a message out, then it's from me. But if there's a general one going out about things I'm doing, um, we thought we'd have a name. For, because some people, the manager puts it out, maybe they never put things out, and you know, it sounds like it's them talking. So we thought we'd put a, a, a different title, call it The Beekeepers, because I used to, um, I'm talking about my late shows uh, being about bees and their wily ways. So 
so that's why I had a whole piece on bees. I'm being covered in bees. Beekeepers are always covered in bees. Covered in bees. So that became a bit of a thing. So that's why they call the beekeepers. Okay, next question is from uh, Elisa Schofield, who asks, do you have any special or celebratory plans for after your busy January, other than sleeping? No, just sleeping. Sleeping is my main plan. Uh, oh, yeah. No plans. I've got more film work to do if that is allowed on the COVID rules. Um, but uh, sleeping is the main thing I have to do. Um, yeah, so not a lot of plans. I haven't got enough brain space to work out what to do with planning. I'd like, I'd like to sleep, though. I'd like to rest. That would be nice. Yeah, I think sleeping is probably a very good plan. Yes. Okay, next question uh, is from... Uh, oh, something fell down outside. I'm not sure what that was. Okay, we're fine. The roof is still intact. Uh, next question is from Bob Snow, who asks, do you wear the same running shoes for all 31 marathons? Well, I'm wearing ones at the moment, but I have changed it. But uh, if they wear down, I will. when they wear down, I will change. But I'm... As I mentioned, I haven't got much brain space left, much energy there. So I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible. So I'm not changing things up, changing colors, changing. I'm just trying to get these marathons done. And, and I'm tired. So yeah, I'm wearing the, the same blue ones every day. I like the blue ones. And. Uh, when uh, the backs have worn down, then I'll swap to another pair, which could be blue as well. Okay, next question uh, is from uh, Stakeout Some, I think, on Twitter, uh, who asks, uh, living in a country without lo oh, they say they're living in a country without lockdown, but then they ask, how come you thankfully, can continue this whole wonderful, great and important adventure, even though Great Britain is in almost full lockdown. Do you sleep at the Riverside Studios? Well, we're in a protective bubble. So Sarah Johnson is reading out these questions and me. We're the only two. We just, we've been in a supportive bubble from before Christmas and before lockdown. And uh, we go from my house, uh, wearing masks when we're outside, masks here and full masks. Then we get into her car. No one's allowed in that car. No one's allowed in our house. Uh, we get to hear this room. Uh, if they come into the room at any point, it's when we're not here and they have to spray it all down. So it is a completely uh, COVID safe and lockdown situation. So we're staying in the bubble. It's this room, essentially this room, the place where I do the performance. And they're all, uh, we never meet anyone. That's how we do it. We just uh, uh, just uh, stay in this COVID safe bubble. So that's how we're doing it. And it's like you're watching TV programs happening, uh, news happening, and uh, some, some filming is still happening, but it's all in a lockdown, uh, in a COVID safe situation in the lockdown. So we just stay in this protective bubble and don't interact with anyone else. Yeah, so we should say like the majority of our team are working from home as well. So if you're if you're calling in to say hi at any point, there's uh, Miranda and Carol who are both uh, working from home, who you'll uh, talk to before you talk to Eddie. Uh, we've got Chris working from home, and then we've got uh, well today we have Ian and Dave uh, in the pipes as they're, we like to they're say. They're somewhere else, but we never see them. They're just uh, we just link to them on voices. And uh, Zach as well. So yes, it's it's really. Uh, just us in this room, isn't it? Yeah, so we stay in this two-person bubble, and that's what we've been in since before, uh, since before New Year, before we started. Okay, next question. Uh, so this is from, 
uh, Julie Rose, who would like to know what you can see on the display of the treadmill. What, um, so basically, what does it look like to you? Do you see a virtual landscape, a display with numbers only, or a movie? So yes, what, what is your point of view, I think? Um, well, it, there's just a, there's a speed, and uh, that's the main thing. So I've got speed here, and distance, and I think time elapsed. That's part of the machine, but I've got a little monitor down which is showing the Zwift app running so that is what that's what's going on that's what I'm really seeing that's the main thing if I look down at that you can see that at the top corner up there uh, and uh, so that's got a little little iPad here which I can oh, shit. Another bit of food gone. I'll grab that. Uh, for contacting through to the Swift app. So that's how that works. Oh, yeah. And then I've got a little water thing there. I've got a clock over here. But, uh, that's what's going on. Little bits of food balance here, which I can't really see. So I've got lights on my face. Yeah. Okay, so uh, next question. Uh, this is from uh, Mary Howman, which is a very timely question. She says, Hi, well done for all you were doing. How do you manage to run and talk at the same time? I can never manage this. It's not easy. As you can probably hear, I struggle to get the words out. Uh, but the talking helps me get my mind out of my legs, which are normally achy. Whereas today I've got some weird thing happening in the front of my car. I suppose it's this chin. It's playing up. And uh, it's not behaving itself. The left one is, the right one isn't. But it's a struggle. But uh, I try and get out of the the grind that I'm doing. Uh, and I've got about an hour and forty minutes to go. So, hey, well, it's less than six hours. So, getting close to thirty k done. Yeah, I just. Just try, try to talk. Um, that's, that's all I can do. Um. Okay, so actually a few more questions from Flimbies on Twitter. Uh, I'll start off with this one. Uh, have you ever killed anyone with a tray? No. I think it's... You no, know, tray deaths are quite low. So no, only Darth Vader's done that. And uh, another question is, oh, well, kind of two actually. So, um, first part, uh, what music do you like to listen to? Second part, do you like musicals? Not so much a musical, but uh, I want Bowie to Mozart to Beethoven. That, uh, yeah, it's a bit of an eclectic taste of music, and uh, not based on any particular thing, any particular, uh, you know, it's not particularly alternative music, it's not particularly mainstream, not particularly classical, it's just anything I, I kind of like, so that's how I do it. I've kind of noticed you're really good at, I think you've got a musical ear, because I've noticed you're really good at doing harmonies. If you hear something, you can kind of, I don't, I, I don't know how you do that, but... Oh, that's just, uh, me. Oh, well, I'm going to have a peep uh, But I do that by, uh, I, well, I'll tell everyone after the pee break. Okay, the cliffhanger. Yes, yeah, cliffhanger. 
Great. Well, that's, yeah, thank you everyone for Twitter questions. Yes, thank you. Oh, God, sorry, I've got to stop for a while. Shockingly, over 2 million tonnes of food a year is wasted within the UK supply chain. Fair Share is tackling this problem in a strikingly simple way. We work with farmers, producers, distributors and retailers to save good quality fresh food from being wasted, so we can get it onto people's plates instead. In practice, it's a huge logistical feat, involving hundreds of volunteers working tirelessly to unload the produce, unpack and sort it at any one of our network of food warehouses across the UK. The food might be surplus, but it looks and tastes just like the food you'd eat at home. Most of it arrives well before it would have hit the supermarket shelves. Food becomes surplus for all sorts of reasons. A glut of courgettes from overproduction or a lack of demand as unpredictable weather plays its part incorrect packaging and labelling, wonky fruits and veg, and cancelled orders. Wherever it comes from, with the support of our team of volunteers, we prioritise the incoming food, itemising it for traceability and breaking it down into smaller quantities for redistribution. Fair Share gives nearly 11,000 charities access to food, all of whom are onboarded safely and meet all food safety regulations. These charities and groups range from food banks, children's breakfast clubs and homeless centres to small local community groups. Not only does this food save charities thousands of pounds on their food bills, it means they can offer the people they support more fresh, healthy fruit and veg and a wider range of food in general. New innovations like the Fair Share Go app have seen direct pickups from the supermarkets meaning perishable goods like fresh bread and fruit can quickly be redistributed. Fair Share is more than meals though. Food brings people together. It helps local organisations tackle loneliness and isolation within their communities or help connect struggling families with the services that can support them. It's such a simple concept. Food that could have been wasted is instead used for good.
So, we're going to talk to Julian Clary at 5 p.m. London time. Half an hour's time. Talk to Julian Clary about everything and anything. And Panthers. Hi Anna. Hi Eddie. Hi. We're so super proud of you. Well done. Thank you very much. Where are you calling from? Calling from down in Devon, it's the southwest. Um, no snow here. No. Pretty, pretty awesome place with the Riviera of the UK. Ah yes, the Riviera of the UK. That's it. But that's it. What's your temperature like? Is it down in the low, low centigrade? My, minus four degrees centigrade this morning. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we've been out sunbathing this afternoon, so you know. Hang on, because, how does that work? It just gets really warm in the afternoon. We're, we're, uh, you know, who knows whether it's climate change or we're just lucky bunnies down here. I tell you that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty awesome. From minus four to sunbathing. Um, yeah. No. That's brilliant. So thank you. I believe you've donated already. Um, I have donated, but um, I'll keep encouraging people to. It's yeah, fantastic. We should talk Absolutely. about it. Anyone wishes to donate, we're, we're championing a number of charities, and I can tell you about the five, but as Anna has already donated, where you can do it through eddieizzard.com from anywhere in the world. Or did you try the text? Did you do the text or did you do it online? I did it online, but right. I know you can do it by text. I would encourage people, it's really quick. Yeah, in the UK, you've got a UK phone, a 70810, and you just write the word 10 or write the word 20, um, and that. And boom, it's done, and off it goes. So that's, so that's great. So now, I, um, you work in community building. So oh yeah, yeah I do. I mean, I'm, I, I, my day job, I work under the NHS, um, for an organization that works for the NHS. But yeah, in my, in my spare time, let's call it spare time. Yep. Um, yeah, I do community work down here. We've got lots of people who work on mental health with young people. Um, right. We're currently keeping a building open so a nursery can stay in there during lockdown. So yeah, people are doing amazing things. But you know, I, I think our shared passion is getting off our bums and doing stuff. If I had any affinity to this amazing thing that you're doing, it's there isn't any place to stop. You just have to keep going with things, don't you? Yes. You just have to keep going. That is it. It's just uh, sometimes it gets really tough, but you have to soldier on. Yeah. And try and get it done, and then ho hopefully, yeah. Uh, well, in my case, hopefully, someone will go. Oh hell! There's a five, there's a ten, there's twenty, and uh, yeah, and we move forward. So, and then so some, you find, are you finding people are donating from all over the place, Eddie, or is it you know are you getting mostly from 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 England? Well, it's particularly the UK and America, because I'm probably best known in UK and America, so they're my the big places where people give from. I played all fifty states of America. And uh, American people have been very positive and uh, and uh, come you know come to shows, so it's great you know playing Hollywood Bowl and all that kind of thing, Madison Square Garden. So I do love playing there, but those are the main. But actually, people are giving from all sorts of places around the world. Wonderful, and also they're watching the shows at night from all sorts of places. At the the 7 p.m. show I do, which is yeah. a, a bizarre show, kind of crazy, but. Uh, I'm getting them done. I'm getting into a sort of shape now. But uh, the first one I did in the first night, I was just wandering all over the place talking about my life. But there's no audience, you know, you probably know there's no audience. Yeah, 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 we've got tickets for Friday. So I was going to ask you, is it, I mean, how are you, how are you dealing with those? I hear you arrived in high heels the first time. Um, high heels every time. I'm way here, yeah, so I, I don't run in heels, but they're not that high. They're quite clunky. They're uh, not clunky, but they're quite square. So they're, yeah, they're about, about that high. But uh, they're just high heel boots. I think, I think they may be keeping me upright, actually. But, uh, well, that, that's fantastic. I mean, you, you could probably design a line in uh, post uh, running show heels. I yeah. think there's a market there. I don't think there is a market there, but I think I could. Oh, you do. <laughs> yeah, just me. No, it was going to be crazy enough to, but I have to do that. I feel I have to be. I do things which are 
kind of out there, a little bit crazy, uh, so that people go, really, really, can you do that? And then, yeah, they, yes. and then hopefully they, they reach in their pocket and, and they put some money through and it helps people. But hopefully you also realise, Eddie, that you inspire a lot of people to do things. So, it, yeah, we can reach in our pockets, but also, you know, we work with a lot of young people and other people who don't necessarily think that they can do stuff. And right. actually, people can do stuff. You want to you wanna run a marathon every day, then, you know, run a marathon every day. That's, yeah. it doesn't, not that it's not hard, but you can achieve anything if you give it a whirl, right? Yeah, you, we can all do more than we think we can do. I think that's, that's what I prove. I think I'm quite ordinary, I've said this before. I think I look kind of ordinary and uh, seem that way. So, you know, if, if I, I think people look at me and say, well, if I can do it, this guy, this person, this, this trans person, then I can do this thing. I'll do a 5K, I'll do a 10K, I'll do a sponsored something or other, I'll do a sponsored bake, whatever it is. It's uh, hopefully in the end we're all encouraging each other, inspiring each other to move forward. Absolutely, absolutely, and congratulations on the transition as well. That's also something we're super proud of for you. So well, thank you so much. Brilliant. When people, if someone calls me she or her, it does feel marvellous to me. Um, I know some people have a problem with the pronouns, and I say, well, you know, if you've got a problem, just call me Eddie, call me Mate, call me Mush. I don't mind, but uh, you know, it has been a wonderful response around the world. Um, since, uh, well, I, you know, as you know, I've been out for years, donkey's years. So yeah. it's, it's nothing like, a, nothing big has happened. It's just, I was asked to make a statement on pronouns and I said, I never insist, I just request. And that's the way, that's the way I'm gonna do it. And most people are very good with that and some people are smelly people, so forget that. Well, if they're, if they're smelly about it, then we need not pay much time to them. But you're running. Are you running through countries where maybe you know trans isn't an accepted form of you know being that you yes. know this is this is you know this is political, isn't it? To it, an extent, you know, yes. and that's it's super important for, for yes. young people, particularly who need to come out and be whoever it is they want to be. And Very much so. It's uh, in certain countries. Maybe some of the countries I'm running through. Trans is less accepted, not accepted, but uh, I ran in girl mode in all these cities back in February, and, uh, and now I'm running them virtually, um, uh, and uh, and I'm getting them done, which is the big deal. So I I don't think I'm very stylish, you know. I think a really good runner would have a great form, and these arms would be powering, and I'm just sort of I'm just slogging away trying to get there. So. You're, you're absolutely the style that we need, Eddie. Your 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 style is uh, lexicon in a lot of families' uh, repertoire, and uh, my family is very is a patchwork family, as a friend of mine would say. You know, we're all over the country supporting each other, right. and your your jokes and the way that you do things are part of what we we say. So you've got your own style. I don't think you need anyone to tell you how to how to do it. Just keep going. We're Thank, right you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being there and saying that. That's, uh, it keeps me going and just the chatting I really I can almost feel um, is it serotonin Sarah do we wear serotonin or is it's yeah, endorphins? I think it's serotonin or dopamine or yeah. dopamine yeah. What, whatever it is that fires off and it's not because I'm laughing it's just because I'm talking and uh, and connecting with yourself or someone like yourself who I've talked to before or Julian Clary at 5 p.m. and yeah, yeah. Uh, and coming up with an idea, trying to articulate a feeling, it just, uh, it makes this part of my my being sort of all work on that. And so the bottom part, it fades away. You know, I don't have to worry about it. So that's this wonderful thing, a six hour podcast. I didn't think I, that's, that was gonna be my safety net, but that seems to be my safety net. Crazy. And that's wonderful. If, if other people are going to get on doing this, you know, I always say to people, put a podcast on because, you know, a lot of people do running and yeah. other things to keep themselves going. Put some, put somebody in your ears that yeah. can, you know, help you take those, put those steps in front of each other. It's fantastic. I mean, they're, they're probably not going to go and do a stand up show right after doing a marathon, but they're, they're probably going to go and do something else amazing, like be a doctor or a nurse or something or a lawyer which is fantastic too, so yeah, yeah that's, the, grand. The that's grand. It is interesting, the spoken word 
is better. I find I, I do listen to podcasts or audiobooks, which is kind of the same thing, but a long form, or a podcast is really a short form of a book. And the spoken word is kind of better than music, I find, because music is kind of you get yourself into a film and you power away. And but the podcast, you can lose yourself in their thoughts, what people are saying. Do you agree? Or disagree? And uh, and even in the car, I found people get tired when they. If you're listening to music in the car, you can get tiring. Listen to a, 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 a you know, a, a, a talking book, an audio book, podcast when you're driving, and it will keep you more alert. I feel in the head. So that's why. I, I would recommend to you if you get a, a, a low point, Brené Brown listening to um, Obama talk about his book. It's very inspiring. Oh, you know, right. He's a guy who uh, you know has changed stuff. So yes, you want uh, an excerpt. Obama, I take it, it, his book is now out, is it? You're talking about his latest book, Obama's book, yeah? Yeah, Promised Land, that's right, yeah. And is it out as an audio book as well? I assume so. Yeah, he's reading it, which is like, you know, if you, you this, you know, amazing voice that he has, dulcet tones in your ears. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Anna, is I'm going to download it as I run. Yeah, he, uh, it, uh, the, the Brenny Brown interviewing him is pretty good, but also him reading his own book, so, you know. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear that. Uh, P-R-O-M-I-S-E-D. Oh, it's land. There we go. And the audio I mean, book. It's, it's uh, 750 pages, so it, it might do you for, for one country, I'm thinking. Ping. I've Pain just, gets there. I've just, whoa, just bought Pain it and almost, almost fell off. But it's, uh, it's not worth it for that, though. It's going to download now. Yep, I can listen to it. There we go. So, there, there's an immediacy of things you can do now, uh, which when I was growing up, you just couldn't do that. Um, yeah. Last night I got home and I decided, I was talking about Lenny, playing Lenny Bruce, which I played. Uh, the great comic Lenny Bruce on stage. Um, Peter Hall directed it, and it was in the Lyric Theatre, I believe, in London. And there was the film Lenny, Dustin Hoffman played it, and I was actually in the film with Dustin Hoffman. That was great. I forgot to talk to him about it, but I suddenly wanted to see the film Lenny. So yeah. I just went on and pressed a button, and I could download it. So. It's Everything's a, there at your fingertips, yeah, and which, you, have you got, you've got a good setup so that you can download whatever it is to keep you occupied for here, you know, there, and everywhere now, right well, around you. It looks like. Yes, it's. A, it's. I mean, that's just on my phone, and that's great. So the book will be there, but it's. A, it's. A, it's. It's just amazing. In my childhood, maybe in your childhood too, you used to think, "I'd like to get this." Ah, uh, well, I want to see this film, maybe. In a couple of years, it'll be on television. I'll have to look at the Radio Times forever to see if it's on. Just to check. Yeah. Just to check. That, that was the old days. And nowadays, you just go, I want to see it in the next five seconds. <laughs> it's just kind of you, crazy how it's changed. Do you remember that advert for J.R. Hartley? Looking yeah. for the yellow pages. You know, that epitomizes my childhood. You have to phone someone up, and then two weeks later, they'll ring you back saying they've found something. And then you come in and collect it. Oh, yeah. That Different. was it. There was. Do you have fly fishing by J. R. Hartley? Exactly. And I go, no, no. no. And then I think I did a comedy bit on Bell on that, which was a little bit bonkers. I can't remember what I did. Well, if you if you remember, you can put it in your show again. I think it I think it epitomises. It came to mind the other day because no one would ever think of doing that now. No. no one would ever look in the yellow pages. They still deliver them. No one looks in them. Well, there's a thing, Anna. When I first came out in 85, I looked in yellow pages to see if there was a TVTS help group, transvestite transsexual help group, yeah. back in, in my area, in the area of my phone book. Uh, in, and it was the phone book in, uh, in one of the public phone books. You know, you just used to have them in there. Yeah. And I found that the only one that was kind of suitable for me uh, was there a place I could go to it was half a mile away. So I decided that was the fate. The fates were ringing a bell and saying, you live half a mile from the only place in the UK that's probably the right place for you to go to, so you must go. So that happened in 
late 84, uh, early 85, yeah. So that was the Yellow Pages back in those days. That really astounds me that there was a self-help group at that time. That's mm. fantastic. Yeah, we've That's got... That's absolutely fantastic. We've got Ethan, uh, Ewan Sinclair, trans woman who ran it, and uh, just a safe haven for people. That's fantastic. Yeah. That is absolutely fantastic. It really helped me. And uh, it got me to that stage one. And I'd already sort of self-analyzed myself by lying on my bed and going through my brain and saying, what am I thinking? Where, where, where are these thoughts coming from? And I decided I must be not open with this and out and talk about it. And so I, having gone to the TVTS help center, right next to the police station, actually, I seem to remember, which didn't matter. It wasn't an illegal thing at those. I don't know if it's ever been an illegal thing. Anyway, no, because I know being gay was illegal until 67. But uh, anyway, I, I, after that, I decided I will go on the tube station, I will go and get a cup of coffee, I will throw on a dress and some makeup, and I gotta do this. And that was 85. And I, and it, you know, it was tough, and people were staring, and people said things, but I just pushed through it. So, and now we're here. Now I'm running and marathons. And now you're running marathons. And the, the connection I will make to you, because I know you've got to go soon and talk to, to Junior, which is fantastic, is um, the, the build into your marathon is the building that me and my colleagues and lots of our volunteers are trying to keep open. There, there's a, um, a, a help group in there that supports trans and, uh, and people who have all sorts of identity issues. So, you know, hopefully there's, hopefully people don't have to take the chance that it's half a mile down the road anymore. I would, you know, yeah. I'm really, really kind of, yeah. If there's anything that we can learn, it's that time passes too slowly to get us to a point where that's the case. But, you know, my hope is that is really the case now. Um, and, and, when, and actually, when I, when I saw that you were running these, these marathons, I actually saw it almost at the same time that I saw that you, um, you know, you were out and, and transitioned. And I thought, this is amazing. She's, she is really doing whatever she said she wanted to do. And that is utterly inspiring. So, you know, that's, I mean, I, I donate to a huge number of things. But, you know, that, that was the reason I donated at that moment is to say, you, you keep going, you know, just keep going. So I would encourage anyone to donate because... Not only are you doing it for projects that you know need the cash, and I've looked at some of the projects you've been profiling, but you know the, you deserve the support. You know you deserve having people saying yes, just keep putting one foot in front of the other, because that's what you've been doing since that moment that you picked up the yellow pages. Clearly, or yeah. before that, it's just fantastic. And, and I know lots of people do it, and not all of them are as famous as you. So I hope that they will be encouraged by that as well. Um, Yes, we've, yeah. got, we've got to say there are a lot of selfless people out there who do amazing things, and they're the ones that should get the awards and things. Um, and they do it, and they're not don't have a high profile. And I'm I'm just trying to use my profile in a positive yeah. way. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, I'm sure it's really working, and I mean, I, I know from talking to people that they are they're really excited about what you're doing. So. You know, that's, uh, and, and the idea of combining it with the shows as well is fantastic. I, I, you know, I hope they're not too exhausting for you, but you know, we're, you know, we're all looking forward to seeing you in those as well. So that's fantastic as well. That's great. Thank you for saying that. And uh, as Anna was saying, I'm doing shows at 7 p.m. London time every evening. But you should bear in mind that one of the 12th on this Tuesday will be in German because I will be doing running at Vienna a Vienna virtual marathon and so I'll be doing it in German getting trying to get my German up to the, to the right level because it's a little bit scratchy uh, and uh, but that's the one on the top all the others are in English except on the 23rd and the 28th which will be German again for Berlin and French for Paris uh, now Fantastic. I'm going to talk to Julian at, in 10 minutes now I'm going to ask you is there anything you'd like to talk about that I haven't covered because uh, I know you're doing lots of things, or any questions you'd like to ask me. Because um, feel free if you don't, no pressure if you don't, but uh, if there is anything you'd like to say, then do say, because we've got this window on the world right now. I, I suppose because I have the privilege of working with so many amazing people who are working so hard at this time, is there anything that you feel that they should know from your years of really trying to get across 
you know, with great humour and with great style, how to be yourself and how to stand up for people. Is there anything you want to hear? And I will, I, you know, not just on your broadcast, but I will take it back to them, the people that I work with, a lot of whom are young people right. who get told that they're not worth listening to. Right. Uh, do you mean about being trans particularly or anything? Or but also, you're, you, you're, you're, you're trans, but you're also um, political, but you're not exclusive and you're, you know, you're you're running, you know, it's, it's the whole shebang, isn't it? Yeah. You want people to, to be themselves, but do well, something if, extraordinary with it. Well, if I say this about being trans or LGBT+, plus, I think it's easier than it's ever been in the history of the world to come out. But then you do know that you have 10 years of, of a fight after that, where you have to re-knit yourself into society as the new person that you are, as the, as the out person that you are, and that's... That can be tricky. People do think they come out and it's all going to be golden. And I think that's why some people feel, feel despondent, dispirited after that point. It is definitely easier to get to this first point, but you have to find your place, find how it works. You won't get relationships like a click of a hat. You won't get a job. It's all going to be as hard as it was before, maybe even a bit harder. But it is your knight's quest. You become a knight. Um, and you have to fight for your space just to exist. It's a bit of a tough fight, but uh, stand on your ground. It's not a perfect sight. You know, people said nasty things to me. I say nasty things back to them. They fight me, I fight them back. And uh, I'm not a great fighter, but I'm scrappy and determined. You have to be determined, I'm afraid. That's the, the way forward and stand your ground. And, uh, and that's how that's how I've got forward to this place, but um, I know it's difficult, so I salute anyone who's being brave enough in any country in the world to come coming out. And uh, if you're just a young person for politics, I didn't join a political party till I was 35. So, but you can still, you should vote, especially young people, do vote. Because a lot of young people have got a lot of hope in their hearts and an idea of a better future. And so I encourage people, young people, do get registered because your votes are going to be so valuable in upcoming elections. Get registered as soon as you can. Do that. I know it's not in usually in young people's idea list, but it is so important because the young people will change the world. And I'm fighting for people who are young and young at heart. You can be young at any age. You can be young at heart at any age. So that's what I fight for. Fantastic. I'll pass that on, you keep going, and it's a real pleasure to talk to you. I, I hope you find the distraction you need while you go through this, Eddie, I really do. <laughs> thank you, I, I think chatting to everyone is great. So thank you, Anna, you take care, and have, yeah, great, you too. have great sunbathing in safety. Thank you so much. Cheers. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. <sighs> that was great talking to Anna there, down in topness, and minus four in the morning, and then sunbathing in the afternoon. That sounds all right. More stuff. Okay. So. Now at five o'clock, six minutes time, I'll be talking to Julian Clary, live around the world, having a chat about pantomimes and everything. We good? We great. Okay. Yes, we. Yeah. Well, actually, do you think we should alternate? Yeah. Let's yeah. Oh. How long have I got? Hour and thirteen to go. <sighs> I've got this niggle. It's not a niggle. It's a pain, actually. In my shin. So. Julian Clare, we're talking to Julian in five minutes' time. And then at 5 30, Sarah Collinson. Uh, Um, yes, 
thank you. Who has made a documentary for ITV Wales about a 17-year-old boy, uh, Theo from Swansea, who is transgender. And uh, we'll be talking to Sarah at 5.30. Thank you. I can do good. I gotta walk for a second. Walking. Oh. So, team, team humanity. We're running a blue shirt today. Don't have to run a blue shirt, but if you do. Part of Team Humanity, just like that. Uh, oh, in front of my shin is giving me a pain in the shins. This is annoying. I'm running with a Hungarian flag today, celebrating Budapest. Thank you, Jason. I'm getting there, getting there. Uh, probably, what's it going? Probably about an hour and ten minutes worth of running. Thank you, was it? Adam, thank you, Adam. Getting it. Oh, do change into blue shirts, anyone who wants to run with us, and then if we encourage everyone to do that, we're gonna whole blue team. Team humanity going. That should be great. Oh. Thank you, Rebecca. Back running. Here we go again. Blue shirts are rocking, yes. Adam. Right, whose idea was that? Adam, who came up with that idea? It's a good idea. Love it. Thank you, Debbie. Debbie is, uh, Debbie Colville, Colville is running 100 K, 100 kilometers through January and 8 of RF Cosford. So well done you. I don't know how many K I'm running in total. Um, if I'm doing 42 a day, I think I'm doing 420, 12, 1,200, 1,200, 300 kilometers, something like that. Uh, someone who's running today who's on Swift came up with the idea of running in blue shirts. I don't know who it was. Anyone know from Swift? Uh, send me a message, send a message out because I can't. I will give them credit for coming. But uh, I'm not sure I'm actually going to send a message out. Who came up with the idea of running in blue shirts? Question mark. I love it. So. Ah. Swift shirts, yes. Well. I'm afraid I'm in. Yeah. Oh, you're working on it, okay. So, we're going to be talking to Julian Clary any moment now. David, it's, it's Julian. We're just having some technical. Technical issues. doodads, okay. Yeah, so, having, was it Clive? There, Clive Finnemore. So, 
Okay. I do so, still have some Budapest facts I yeah, could do. Yeah, do tell us. It's lots of them. It's great. Okay, another fact. Uh, the tallest buildings in the city are 96 metres tall. It says for a reason. <laughs> All right. Uh, it says, uh, the tallest buildings in the city are the St. Stephen's Basilica and the Parliament. Both are 96 metres tall. This is a reference to the year Hungary was founded in 896. Okay. No buildings can be taller than this. Very it's quite a nice thing, yeah, I think. Yeah, it's a nice thing. You know, yeah. That's in Budapest or the whole of Hungary? Uh, in, uh, in Budapest. Right. Yeah, in okay. Budapest. Uh, so that's the thing. And uh, the Parliament building is the third largest in the world. Yeah. It says, and the cleanest. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so it says, uh, the Parliament in Budapest is the third largest in the world. Um, there is a massive army of 150 people that work tirelessly every day to keep it in tip-top shape. This includes locksmiths and craftsmen who manufacture every replaceable fitting and fixture on site. It says the workers who inspect every flag for damage, oh, workers who inspect every flag for damage or tatters, um, then replace them immediately to keep the building looking flawless year round. Right. Yeah. And, oh, and it says not to mention the cleaning of every roof tile twice a year. Right. That's incredible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. Okay, another fact. Uh, so it says, uh, while walking through the streets of Budapest, uh, Bud Budapest, sorry, and admiring the buildings, you may think to yourself, uh, those sure do look like bullet holes. That's because they are. If you're unaware, uh, there was a nationwide revolution in 1956 that originated in Budapest against the communist regime. Uh, due to the intense fighting in the streets, a lot of buildings still bear the scars from the struggle. Wow, so yeah, they're still about. Yes, 56 rising. Look for some more facts. Magic situation. Oh, oh this is interesting. No one knows where the Hungarian language came from. Apparently, oh. unless anyone uh, wants to message us and tell us. It says, uh, Yes, it says, uh, along with Finnish, Mandarin, Chinese, Russian and Arabic, Hungarian has often been proven to be one of the most difficult languages in the world to learn. And no one knows where it came from, since it mirrors nearly nothing known on the planet and follows no specific rules. Well, that's kind of a weird statement, it follows no specific rules. I'm not totally sure on that. I'm guessing there's some rules. That would be... Kind of... There's no rules. It'd be a bit bonkers. How are we doing, Dave? Um, we're just working on some video side of things. Sorry? We're just working on the kind of video connection. Okay. Hopefully soon enough. Ah. Ah. I'm struggling here. I think we might have uh, audio, but not quite video yet. So I can see things are things are happening, I can see everyone is working on it. So, the northernmost holy place of Islam is in Budapest. 
It says, um, uh, it also has the world's second biggest synagogue as well. Um, but it says Budapest is home to, uh, is also home to a Turkish dervish named Gul Baba, who, became, who came to Hungary during the Turkish invasion in the 16th century. It says he was honored as a holy man, and after he died in 1541, his tomb in Buddha uh, became an Islamic sacred place and the site of pilgrimage. pilgrimage. Uh, the chapel built between 1543 and 1548 is one of the few remaining Turkish buildings in Budapest. So there you are. It says other noteworthy buildings include the Kirali and Rudas Turkish baths. It is a beautiful city. Yes, indeed. I'm going to have to walk. Walking. Walking. Actually, I haven't done a flag shout out, have I, for Zwift today? Yeah. Oh, I might do that if if you don't mind me going in the app. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm clear. Shall I do a, a name and flag shout out or? I'll do flags first. I'll do flags, alright. Test my, uh, my Some flags of them could be, again. Could be cyclists going by. Okay, so um, we have um, UK, uh, Australia, uh, USA, uh, Belgium, Canada, Italy, Germany. Uh, Norway, um, we have, I think we have Russia as well, we have... We're going to go to Julian, we've only got audio but we're going we're gonna to go with it okay. and, and a picture, so I'll pass you through now. Yeah. Hi Julian. Oh, Eddie, hello. I'm all stressed because we've had technical problems and you can't see me, which must be awful, yeah, you I can hear me. Yeah, I thought we. I thought we got to get you visual because you look very glamorous. But um, but you look very good in your photo. I don't know if you can see. Your, well, you probably can't see the photo. It's got. No, I can't. I can't see anything. But I can imagine you because I've been watching you from time to time over the last few days. And so you are there jogging away, aren't you? I am. And I, I'm, I, I'm sat here covered in dog hairs, wearing glasses, looking at a blank screen. Ah, well, I hope you have a dog. Otherwise, that's just bizarre. No, there are two dogs. There's Albert and there's Gigi who are around somewhere. And what's been funny is, you know, I have a little look at you um, running away and then I go and walk the dog and I have some lunch and have a nap and I come back and you're still there. I know. Um, how do you do it, Eddie? Well, it, you know, you know, Julian, anything in life, it's willpower. It's just the brain in saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to insist I'm going to do this. That's the way we tend, we humans tend to get things done. Uh, well, my, brain, my brain, I don't think my brain does work like that because I ran for a bus once in about 1995 and I thought, well, I didn't enjoy that. So my brain tells me not to put myself through it again. I know, but say on other things, like you, you, you came out, when you first came out, it must have been a tough transition, tough journey to, to, being, to doing that and being open and just saying, hey, I'm here. And, and, uh, and it's run by the mind that says, I will do this and stuff people if they're just being, you know, nasty to me. Don't you feel? Yes, no, I felt, I felt very sure that I was doing the right thing and yeah. I felt very supported by my family. And I didn't quite enjoy um, the outrage that the Daily Mail readers might have felt. <laughs> I, thought this was, I thought it was a good 
good for them ultimately to be outraged and then have um, homosexuality demystified, if you like. And, yeah. Um, I kind of, I did enjoy all that, and of course, um, one likes attention um, of any, whatever form, really. <laughs> well, did you so? When you say, um, did you come out at an early age or um, uh, in your twenties or officially? Well, no, there was never any great announcement with me because it was all a bit self-evident and um, my parents kind of sent me a message via my sister saying, if you're gay, it's fine. And um, I sent a message back saying, yes, I am. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was never really discussed. I remember being nervous when I had a fir my first kind of big newspaper interview and I think the headline was Gay Clary something or other and I thought, well, I wonder what they'll make of that. But right. they just said, what a nice article. So it was, I was in that kind of environment. And of course, on the alternative cabaret circuit, that was all very left-wing and comfortable. And I, I spotted a gap in the market, Eddie. I thought, yeah. no one is talking graphically about gay sex on the circuit and dressing up and carrying a dog on stage with them. So perhaps if I did that, um, that would be interesting. But it, well, nothing was ever... It wasn't really important in that it wasn't, this is what I'm going to be doing for the next 40 years. It was, this is what I'll do this week at the time. It is interesting because um, I was talking about Larry Grayson and how he was took over from Bruce Forsyth in, in our UK, the generation game on UK television, and they didn't think it was going to work, and it wasn't. He seemed to be, and John Inman, both obviously seemed to be out, but they weren't out, where I believe there was this thing an older generation didn't feel they could say anything, but you just charged through that and didn't even bother with the announcement. That was what was wonderful. Well, it was a different era. I think if they if they said it how it was, they probably wouldn't have worked anymore. But I always think, I think Larry Grayson in particular was was as out as you could be at the time. You know, it yeah. was all outrageous and, and also very funny. Um, but they didn't want to frighten the horses, this is true. <laughs> Now, I came to see, uh, you know, pantomime is not my thing, but I came to see the pantomime you were in. I specifically got, I think, the last ticket in the Palladium on the last day, because you and Dawn were doing it, and I kind of, Dawn French, and I yes. wanted to see that. And I think you have kind of reinvented, uh, um, in your, well, it's kind of weird, because, as you mentioned, was it Tsunami of Smart, was that with... Was that, that, the was, um, that was what The Guardian, I think Michael Billington called it, the Tsunami of Smut, which is one of my favourite reviews. <laughs> it is. I've said this thing, I don't know if you heard me say this, but I said, I think Julian was not doing double entendres, he was doing single entendres. You were just, yeah. you were just saying what the hell you wanted to say, and it didn't, it didn't even need to do a double entendre. Which was, well, I think, I think Panto, is, Panto can be quite boring, and it, you know, I think the producers of, at the Palladium have reinvented it really and they're very very keen on the smut and they positively encourage me and they ask for more not less so what can i do eddie but you know give them what they would ask for no it was perfect because there was there was you and and probably normally you know dawn did that one but i'm not sure if there's anyone like dawn normally in a panto that you're in but so when you were on stage it felt like a show that i could grab hold of and when you and Dawn, or Dawn is herself on stage, I could grab hold of it. And then it would go, if you both weren't on stage, with the best wishes in the world, it did go back to a traditional pantomime, which I found just, I, you know, I couldn't get, it, it was too, you know, too formulaic, I think is the word I'm looking for. And, well, uh, I think, well, on some level, you've got to tell the story for a panto. Yeah. There are, apparently, children do come, although, you know, I don't particularly encourage them to come. <laughs> But, no, but they want to see good triumph and good evil and all of that. So if if I'm not anyone's cup of tea, then there is there is some respite from it, I suppose. But I, I remember you coming because I remember what you wore. You came into my dressing room wearing were they thigh length boots, or have I imagined that? They could have been. I have some knee boots, and I have some ones that go to the thigh. I think I, they would have been knee length on that day because I with um, with a tartan skirt. Oh, you sure? It was bold. It was a bold look, Eddie. It was, uh, it could have been the red uh, kilt that I have. Yes, which, it was red. That was made by 21st Century Kilt. It was actually made for Princess Charlene of Monaco. Um, 
Well, they made it because she wanted some something to wear when she was getting married. And they took this down and she said, no, that's not for me. And so it came back. And, and how, how did it end up with you? you? You then bought it when she rejected it. Yeah, it was in the shop hanging up. And I said, um, yeah, can I try that kilt on? Because it was a girl's kilt as opposed to a boy's kilt. And they said, yes. And they said, we made it for Princess Charlie. And I thought, well, that's even better. That's kind of crazy that, that uh, Monarcha royalty have said no to this. And I, they sort of, I'm, I'm going to wear that. So, and they, they put a tartan strip down it. And, and it's, this is the brilliance of the Scottish business mind, because um, the groovy people at 21st Century Kilt, they said, I said, well, I, I don't have a tartan. I don't seem to be linked to a, uh, a Scottish clan, even though I'd like to be. And they say, do you have any link? And I said, well, I'll tell you this. I did, Buchanan is a tartan, isn't it? And I, it's a clan, and I did a fantastic, my best street show ever in Glasgow that I ever did was in Buchanan Street. And they said, well, okay. I said, can I be Buchanan tartan? And they said, yes, you can. And they just decided, because it's, it's, uh, it's not a real, it's not like a religious thing. It's just a thing. So well, I don't suppose Princess Charlene's got any Scottish blood in her, has she? No, I think she's Australian. I think she was the 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 woman who was um, that the prince had met. I'm not really into monarchies. I don't know these stories, but she. I think she was going to leave. She found it all too much, and then security guards that went down to the airport and said, "You're not going. You're getting married." And anyway, it all it all worked out. Hopefully, in the end. But uh, I've got that skirt. It's a, it is a bold look. Um, talking, talking of Scotland, Eddie, um, I love Scotland and I wish I was Scottish, but I'm not. Is, is that, where's your favorite place to do a show? Because mine is Glasgow, I would say, because they're so, well, let's face it, inebriated <laughs> when they come to see me, they're refreshed. And um, so they're a lot of fun and they like to shout out and it adds like half an hour onto the length of the show. Is that on your personal show or if you do a panto there? Oh, no, not Panto. I've never done Panto in Scotland. Just my, my one-man show is Born to Mince or whatever it's yeah. called. Um, I, as you may know, I'm going to politics, so I'll have to say that I have no perfect place, you know, because they're all, they do, you know, I have done great shows. I mean, the Buchanan Street one, it was, i tell you what, I was on Socky Hall Street, which you may know, which is just around yeah. the corner from Buchanan. Yeah, I was on the... Good time. Say again? There you go for a good time, isn't it? That's yes, all the exactly. Socky Hall Street. A lot of stories in Glasgow, and uh, I was I was street before me. There was a little festival on. I was doing a street building up, and and I'm going to swear now, kids. Uh, you know, this is my show, so I'm allowed to swear. So there was a street guy behind the audience I was building up. I was pretty good street performer at this point, so I could build up an audience. And this guy shouted over from the street, "Fuck off, you English cunt!" <laughs> and I said, this is the, the head of tourism for Glasgow. He's just coming down doing traditional Glasgow welcome to me. And then he came into the show and then we danced together. And then yeah. we did, you know, because he was just a street guy. And yeah. it was, uh, and it, 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 it sort of fired me up. And I thought, okay, I know how to do it. Even if someone tells me to fuck off, I'm going to carry on and do a really good show. Then I went around the corner and did Buchanan Street. And I just nailed it to the the mask and it was a beautiful show and I've done great ones at Edinburgh on the street as well and so accent, I mean I know you're multilingual but your Scottish accent when you said shut up you can't or whatever it was yeah. that, was, that was very good I that, that I, was what he, well I did play for Robert Watson what uh, do you, let's just say and uh, a film called Castles in the Sky he invented radar and he was a, he was in a it's a beautiful story he should be celebrated so Robert Watson what um, we invented radar in, in 35, him and his team, and he was in meteorology. And they were bouncing waves off clouds to tell what the waveforms were coming in. And he worked out they could bounce the waves off planes and tell how many planes are coming in or what pl grouping of planes. And they, the, the, uh, the British slash English authorities thought, well, he's an idiot and well, he's, he should, the Scotsman should be trusted. And they let him do it. And, uh, he got us radar, so I did that and played that role in the film. And my brother, who is my strongest critic, and will tell you, Eddie, you were crap, man. And uh, he said he said he thinks it's my best, one of my best pieces of work, dramatic work. 
So does your brother does your brother travel around with you? He is. He's very fluent in French, German, and Spanish. He's got degrees and a diploma of translation in, from uh, uh, French into English, which. As you go up for the diploma translation, 60% fail, and you've got to imagine you've got to be pretty good at the language to start wanting to go for the diploma. So well, he's that's probably because it's probably in your genes, isn't it? The Izard genes. You're all good at everything, I suppose. No, I'm not like... only a few things. Only it's uh, I'm a determined bastard. That's what I am, Julian. Yes. Uh, yes. I only a few I'd things. be more like you, Eddie, because I'm. I don't think I'm determined enough. I'm very sort of passive and placid, and. Um, I like to take the easy way out, but I'm, going, I'm not going to go running, I don't think. No, don't go running. I don't think it suits you. In fact, Julian, your style of comedy is very different to mine. And I went to see you at the assembly rooms when you just sort of really taken off into, you know, I think you were doing the telly stuff and whatever. And so you're mm. playing one of the big rooms in the assembly rooms in George Street and, um, up in the Newtown. And I thought, I'm probably, this is not going to kind of work for me, but your charm, amidst the, amidst the tsunami of smash, your charm just is, is beguiling. You just, you can win over, well, you can win over me, but I think you can win over anyone, even people who are just... I don't know. I, 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 it's a sort of languidness that I'm aware of, but I've always had it. I've, I've had some old school reports recently, and my tutor, when I was about 17, said, and this wasn't compliment. He said, Julian is always either languid or superior. And I thought, that's just sort of, that's true, really. Yes. I am one or the other. Well, you don't give a monkey, as you see, so that is very beguiling. I realised that because when I was trying to get somewhere, uh, my, uh, my first Edinburgh show was 81, if you can believe that. 81 and 23 doing sketch shows. It's a long time ago, but I was so desperate to get forward. I, I think I was trying too hard. And I think the essence of what you got is this languid thing of I'm going to, I'm going, I'm here, so you may as well watch me. And I'm going to tell you certain things which may blow your mind. And if you don't like it, I, oh, fuck off. You know, it's just, I don't care. And it just, that's, that's, that's lovely. That's very grabbable. I was, I was thinking about, um, all this running you do, and I was thinking about comedy, and I think it's, they're a bit incongruous, really, running and comedy, because I forget what I was reading, but it was about why human beings have comedy and what's the purpose of it. Yeah. And it's, if, and it's people like you and I, or people who are on, you know, outsiders in some way, um, in order to disarm people, you might make someone laugh in order to stop them hitting you sometimes. Yeah. And, but because um, when you're when you're gripped by laughter, when you are the person laughing, you are kind of incapacitated in some way, and that might give me or you or whoever a chance to escape. But if I said something very funny now, which is not likely, but you probably wouldn't be able to run anymore, would you? Because you'd be your knees would go weak and you'd be incapacitated. No, I can press a button here and, and I can slow it down to walking. I can do, I can get down to walking quite quickly. So. Um, <laughs> I've learned how this bloody machine works, so I can do that. But you have uh, time. You can hear the laugh coming on. You can press the button in time. That is that is true. But it, it is you're you're right, absolutely right. I think saying what what is uh, comedy is a is a puncture. Uh, we puncture balloons of pomposity. We uh, it's an attack weapon, really. You say there's this thing, and look how stupid this thing is. Let me tell you about it, and we take it down. It's not a builder, and I want to be in politics, and politics is not, comedy does not work in politics, except as a relief thing at the end of the paragraph. You, you have to, I'm, I'm trying to put well, forward... We, I, we, do, we, laugh, we like to laugh at politicians, I that's a different thing. That's it, but it, it's the other team. So when I'm putting forward an idea of saying, make humanity great again, I have to be serious about that, and saying, come on guys, we've got to head towards the 2030s, and then I use the comedy, that that's good for attacking the opposite side, the extreme right, and just saying, well, this is ridiculous, and you say something comedic about the people you disagree with. So that's a good use of comedy, but it's not the front step of me. It's my, it's sort of my back step in, in a political life that I'm trying to... Well, you don't to have to restrain yourself, then, to, to not say... You can think funny things, but not actually say them when you are being in a, in a political arena of some kind. I can only say if it's uh, at the end of the paragraph. That's the thing. So I put, I push, you know, put forward the positive idea, and at the end, I say, people who disagree with me, they are very smelly people. You know, they're obviously a funny version of that. And you just... When, when, when is this going to happen, or should I, should I know this already? Or no. I... 
it's you if I you know I've said it for a number of years I wanted to run in 2020 for uh, either member of parliament or mayor of London and Sadiq Khan is doing a great job as mayor so I want him to continue that I'm going in for member of parliament but that election that 2021 became a movable thing and it happened in 2019 couldn't get a seat so now I'm up for trying to get a if a by-election comes up that's a good fit I would love to run for that and if not it'll be the next election so I'm going to be political be an activist uh, but I'm not elected to any constituency but I still can talk for humanity because who the hell talks for humanity no one usually does you know I mean I think all charities do but politically you have to argue for your constituency or your party or your country but uh, I thought why not argue for 7.8 billion people which is a bit of a, a jump but that's what I'm going to do in the meantime which is what I'm doing now make humanity great again as opposed to just make a small part of humanity great well you've got there are no limits to what you can do Eddie and, and when when you do um, reach the upper echelons of political life and um, perhaps you'd consider me for your cabinet the minister for buggery or something like that I would have I would have to consider but I'm not sure we would need a minister for buggery uh, uh, actually the minister I just think that's going to have to be something that you do, uh, that you work for in your own time. There are czars uh, now, aren't there? People need czars of nightlife or czars. Oh, yes. That's yes. And you know, the, the word czar comes from Caesar. Kaiser and czar is a derivation from Caesar, from all that time ago when they, that mass murdering crazy person Caesar went and did what he did. Well, and then they took him out. Anyway, that's just, just history. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm concerned that you are now, apart from doing all this running and then doing shows, you're talking at the same time. Um, do you not get out of breath or do you not think, oh, I wish I could just shut up for a while? Well, I do get out of breath. I don't think about shutting up. I don't know about you as a comedian. Uh, our job is not to shut up. Our job is to, is to be able to continue. But uh, the thing yes. that keeps me going, because normally if I'm running outdoors, I do have a changing landscape. I have people, cats, dogs, things to see and interact with, parks yeah. to be in, maybe snow. But here I've got nothing. And yeah. I found that the talking is the thing that takes me out of my tiredness and my aching front right leg, which is really playing me up a bit. And so this is a, it's, it's serotonin, I believe it releases in the brain and yeah. uh, it takes me out of myself, so it helps. Bizarre. Yes, and I suppose it makes the time pass a bit. I, I, I'm not very good on those running machines. I was on holiday once and there was a, a gym with one of those and, um, oh, are you still there? Yep, still here. Oh, sorry, the, my screen's gone even blanker than it already oh, was. Wow. Uh, but they're funny, aren't they, those running machines? Because you have to sort of not think about what you're doing, because if you do, then it can all go wrong. You haven't, you haven't fallen off yet. Not yet, almost did. Uh, but if I do, if I try and do something weird, I try to show my phone to the screen, to the camera, and that almost came off there. If I get very tired, I start moving back and back and back, and that's a little scary. And so how, lo how long are you running for each day? How long is it taking? It takes me about six and a quarter hours, six hours, between six and six and a half hours. Uh, and do you have little breaks where you can eat a baguette or something? Yeah, I have everything from a honey sandwich to a little oh. bit of a little bit of a something bar and something of a protein bar. I'm fed little bits and pieces that wrap it. A honey it. sandwich sounds like some kind of euphemism in my world, but I guess it's just... A, no, a honey sandwich is actually a sandwich made out of honey with bread. Oh, it's, it's, I was it's, imagining all sorts of it's things. Not, it's not curd. It's not curd. It's a... Uh, and it's very tasty. It's a taste of honey and sandwich. And, I see. and so, you, might, you must sleep well at night when you go home after all this carry on. Well, no, actually, you, you, there's, a, there's a certain, you have to, the brain trains the body to be relentless. Come on, keep going, keep going, keep going. So when you go to bed, uh, the body wants to keep getting up. It's yes. a bit weird. I have to take a homeopathic sleeping pill every night to try and get me to get a decent bit of sleep. Yes, uh, I walked up, um, I walked to the top of Primrose Hill yesterday, which is no great feat by comparison. But when I got home again and was sitting down, my, my legs were sort of humming, you know, they're kind of buzzing. I don't know what that is. It's just kind of my muscles registering that they've been activated um, for the first time in six months, probably. It could, it could be that. I, oh, I, I thought you were based in, are you based in Brighton and London or is it more oh, London? No. no, I had a flat in Brighton 
years and years ago. Oh, um, right. but, but no, that's that's um, no longer with us. No, I'm in London. I'm in Camden Town. So I was just I'm minutes down the road. It was very sunny yesterday, and there were so many people on the top of Primrose Hill. If you please, the police arrived and asked us to disperse. So I felt very cutting edge. All it was, it was such a lovely day. So many people had had the same idea at the same time. You know, yes. Let's go up there. And there was a man up there with two parrots flying around, which was um, came a bit of a performance. So people were gathering around to watch the parrots. And um, yes, then the Rosas came, Eddie, and told us, reminded us that there was a lockdown and we shouldn't be doing any such thing like that, enjoying ourselves on the top of Primrose Hill in such vast numbers. So we had to go home. Well, I can understand. I think Group of Six has gone down to Group of One, unfortunately. It's a, a sign of our times. I know. Um, Sometimes, yeah, I was walking along with my husband and we were within a few feet, really, of some other couple walking along. And before you know it, you've become a group, haven't you? And you didn't really mean to. Yes. Yes, it's... Uh, well, these are strange times we're living in, so... Um, you can't run wearing a mask. I suppose you don't need to on your own, but... And um, what would that be like, running with a mask? Running with a mask, it, it would be tricky because I have one that fits all the way around. So we have to be in this safety bubble, and uh, I just find it walking because it, it uh, yeah. starts running out of oxygen. So that's yeah. a, a tricky thing. But, but you uh, sound like you're fainting away slightly. Are you having a, a tired moment? I'm having, a, a, I'm having a little tired moment. I was going to ask you. Well, I'm not, this isn't a question, but I was going to say this. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the the, the uh, I'm going back to the, the pantomimes, which I think started in the late 1800s and were kind of interesting and new at that point and then they got a little bit tired i feel and i think you've changed them but my mother was a, in, very into amateur dramatics the little aiden dramatic society where i was born in aiden arden in uh, in yemen and uh, they she played princess y yasmin or jasmine in yeah, uh, in yasmin. aladdin and she there's a picture of her standing with a woman who's playing the principal boy and i thought if i ever did do a pantomime I hopefully could play the principal boy because that's kind of the boy girl role. Well, but, yes. I wonder if that fixed in your mind somehow. No, it to, to make no. It, it wasn't a thing that I knew because I didn't get that photo until very late in life. But right. uh, it is something. When I saw it, I thought my mother could never think. Well, I'm playing Princess Jasmine, and one day my son's going to be uh, playing the principal boy next to me. Uh, well, you know that image. I just kind of like that image as you know. Squaring the circle, you know, going completely yeah, round. Yeah. But she was done. Was very young then when she played Princess Jasmine? She was. She would have been about thirty. Yeah. Right. They were. She was a nurse at the uh, the uh, Aiden, little Aiden Refinery Hospital there. And, okay. Uh, and she met Dad, and they got married. And the next year, that was the Christmas '58. They got married at '59, and I was born second child at 1962. And. Um, so did you go back to dramatics, amateur dramatics, or whatever? Again, no, or was Mum's story is quite sad. So, had me, my brother Mark, in '60. I was in '62. She was a great mum. Obviously, had been a nurse, looked after everything. Got cancer and died in '68. So it's a sad story. In 1968. Yes, only I was six years old. Just turned six. My brother was uh, just turning eight. Wow. So, yes, I, I knew this had happened, but I didn't know that you were only six. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's tough, but other people have had tough lives as well. I also think if you have a mother that has the inability to love you, but is still alive, that is probably worse than having your mother die. Or if you had a mother that is alive, but has just left the family, that could yeah. be worse. So, yeah, the best um, option is to have a mother who's alive and who does love you, isn't yes, it? Yes, I think. If we could order that, please. From, <laughs> From the, the from the powers that be, oh. from the government, but I'm not sure that's going to work. Um, all right, Julian, that is wonderful to talk to you. Very great. Keep doing. You're going to you're going to keep doing uh, the uh, pantomimes, yeah? I take it. Yes, we are. We are, we did we only managed six performances this year before um, things were closed down. But um, no, we'll be back. Don't you worry. And um, come and see us again wearing another kilt. Yes, indeed. I've only got one. I've got to get another one then. Okay. Um, they won't fit. But it's, you must be, I don't want to get you into embarrassing, but one of the best paid 
pantomime stars the, the country has, aren't you? I mean, because it's Palladium, that's the top of the line. You must, and you make this I whole thing work. I don't know what other people get made. There was some kind of um, graph thing done in the Daily Mirror a few years ago, and apparently Colleen Nolan gets paid more than me, which I was personally outraged <laughs> by. But um, that's what it said in the Daily Mirror. But I will keep doing it whether they pay me or not, Eddie, um, right. just because it gets me out the house. And um, you, you are, you know, a great inspiration to us all. So you carry on doing what you're doing. How many more days of this have you got? Another 20? Uh, 21 after today. 20 more to go, three more weeks after today. Yeah. Well, it's just amazing. And um, I applaud you from the comfort of my nice warm kitchen in Camden. Excellent. You stay warm and stay safe. Good to talk to you. Lots of love. Bye-bye. Take care. Take care, Julie. So, that was Julian Clare, had a great chat there, who I think has reinvented the wheel on, on uh, pantomimes with his, he's very happy to say, the tsunami of smut that he brings to it. It just is. <laughs> Maybe it's the fact that it's a pantomime. Because a pantomime has got into this formula, it's, it's locked in. I think that when they get the formulas, they, they lock into concrete. And behind you and kids and, if you're not from Britain, you won't, might not have seen a pantomime, but it's a very old, it's like a Victorian uh, melodrama. And you take Aladdin or, or Dick Whitting Jr., you won't know, Aladdin would be a famous one. And, uh, I don't know what the other ones are. Anyway, they're all sort of classic fairy stories and they turned into pantomime. And uh, uh, Julian is like a... No, it just explodes, explodes in a different direction. And you just imagine Bates, Middle Britain, or if anyone from Middle Anywhere saw it, they would just go, holy cow, what's going on? And that's why I like it. Right now, is Tim with us as well? Or is it Sarah on, on her talking today, Dave? Dave. Hey, will we Tim and Sarah? Okay, great. I'm ready when you are. We are making that connection. So, and uh, if you go online, you can see Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, just being posted uh, and saying, pushing back strongly against the, the uh, old fascists that uh, Trump is encouraging to destroy democracy in America and try and do a coup d'etat. So that's coming from Arnold Schwarzenegger, Republican, uh, Republican uh, man um, and governor, ex-governor of the state of California. So I just seen that flash up on my phone. So have a look at that. Uh, Conan O'Brien. So I'm going to talk to Sarah Collinson, who's made a documentary for ITV Wales. That 17-year-old boy, uh, Theo from Swansea, who is transgender. I might, I might have seen this. Oh, suddenly I've got a huge amount of words. We do have them ready for you. Okay, so great. We'll through to Tim and Sarah. Hello, hello. Calling the world. Okay. Hi, Eddie. Hi. Hi. Sarah, can I get a honey sandwich? <laughs> yes, I'll get you a honey sandwich. sandwich. Bring, bring me a honey yeah, sandwich. <laughs> Tim, I don't know if I'm allowed it, but I need one. The, the yes, never, there's never a wrong time for a honey sandwich, Eddie. You can no. always have those. So, yeah, you know, people talk about shin splints. I think I was talking to you and they said, that, well, that's, or people, that's not really what they are, or they don't really exist, or it's something with, what is a shin splint? And do I have that, or have I got just something else going on? Well, a shin splint is uh, simply, it's just, uh, it's like an inflammatory response from one of the muscles that sits on the front of the leg. Um, but we're going to have a good old look later on, virtually, just to put everyone's mind at rest. Uh, me, you and Sarah are going to do a FaceTime call and we'll have a look and try and clarify exactly what it is that's going on. Okay. Very good. So, Eddie, the, uh, my guest tonight is actually my sister-in-law. Oh, wow. Uh, Sarah Collins, me, Drew. Um, now, we've got a bit of a smorgasbord. What are you in the mood for? Are you in the mood for politics or in the mood for sort of like gender transition? Well, um... Let's talk about. You're equally well on both. 
Well, let's talk gender transition, then let's talk uh, politics afterwards. Okay, fine. All right. Well, I will introduce Sarah, and then she can tell you everything about the program that she made. Hi, Sarah. Hi, there. Can you hear me okay? Hi, Sarah. Hi, Eddie. How are you? I'm okay. I'm knackered. I'm hurting a bit, but... I'm surprised. I'm getting there. <laughs> now, tell us about your documentary. Now, I, I remember seeing a, a documentary, but I'm not sure if it's the same one as yours anyway. Yes, tell us about yours. I'll see if, see if it... I, well, I make, I make programmes for, for um, ITV Wales, current affairs programmes. So I made something it's probably a couple of years ago now. Um, one of the things I made was, was fascinating. And actually, Tim had a connection to it because it was friends of theirs who kind of got me thinking about it. Um, about young people specifically and gender um, transitioning and um, there was a, uh, some, some friends that Tim and Kath met when they were in the States who's, um, who they, they're Jamie who's transitioning from female to male and they were struggling to get him um, timely intervention so they ended up going to um, a clinic called Gender GP which happens to be based in Wales where I live which offers um, uh, uh, private treatment, so you have to be able to pay for it, it's expensive, but offers private treatment for people who are worried about waiting lists and the impact that's having on the mental health of um, their children and young people. Um, so that was, but it's controversial, you know, um, that clinic has, has, has come in for lots of criticism as well, with lots of support from parents and children who said it's helped them massively. Um, so there were two, there were two people in my program. One was was Jamie um, Sheeran who had gone to Gender GP, and then the other one was a young person from Swansea who hadn't had intervention before they went into puberty, and so therefore felt that actually that didn't help their mental health at all because um, uh, she was transitioning uh, from uh, male to female, but post puberty, and you know didn't like certain things about her. Her, 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 her voice and her body because she had gone through puberty. So it was just an interesting look at those two, you know, what happens with early intervention and what happens when you don't intervene with hormone blockers in an, uh, you know, uh, before puberty. And um, the main thing I took away from that, I guess, as a program maker is, well, well it's, it's incredibly complicated and I don't even begin to understand the ins and outs of it all, but it's fascinating and that the thing that mostly was that actually parents, we were lucky with these two people, but the parents that we spoke to were immensely supportive of their children and basically just wanted them to have the best possible outcome, whatever they meant. I know that's not the experience of everybody, um, but that was something that I found extremely um, heartening, actually. Yeah. That, that, you know, that was great. It was a really positive experience from that perspective. It is beautiful when parents are supportive. I've heard horror stories mm -hmm. about some parents, and and these parents are not great members of humanity. And then I've heard the wonderful supportive, including I played Dallas in Texas, and I met a mother outside who I think was a very different, uh, you know, her probably her life view, her world view was very different from mine, but her son was obviously wanting to express them, felt they were trans, uh, wanted to ex express the feminine side of themselves, and she was going to be supportive, and she, she looked like someone who was going to fight. She was just going to fight the fight, so I just thought that was amazing. And when parents are positive for their children, it's beautiful. And, uh, yeah. and I should say, when my dad, when I came out, my dad said, my mum had passed away, no, a few, long, you know, about 15 years before, and he he went away and thought about it, and he wrote me a letter saying, "I'm okay with this, and if your mum was still alive, she'd be okay too." That's what he said, which is beautiful. Yeah, I think that that thing is is you know, I don't think you can kind of underestimate the importance that parental support has, and and actually when you're when you're trying to deal with all of the things that transitioning throws up, to feel that your parents. I mean, it must be the worst thing that your parents are not accepting you as you want to be. Um, well, I would say, if, if your parents are, if you get on with your parents, it must be horrible. If you don't get on with them, you know, if you, because sometimes, hopefully not both of them, but sometimes there's one parent you really disagree with and just has a different worldview to you, and they're never going to accept that because their worldview is so back to front for your, from your progressive point of view, and so. 
Uh, maybe at the end point if they come around, that's nice, but uh, yeah, it's... Uh, I mean, if they're in that situation, the, the healthiest thing for them is to is to realise that's never going to be, be something that's going to... You know, do you know what I mean? At some yeah. point, you must be at point where you have to walk away from that relationship, or, or yeah. you know, that relationship's not going to be how you want it to be, you know, completely um, I do. That's not a painful thing I to do, deal with. I do find this weird about family. You would think that... Um, but you tend to grow up thinking that how it is in your family is how it is in every family, and that is absolutely not, not the case. And, the, and you would think that all family members would back each other up, and that is not the case. It can be completely different. Some are completely backing up, and they all get on, and some people, are, two of them get on, and that one doesn't. And it's a complete roll of the dice, it seems, how families work. I think that's I think that's really true. I always I'm always remember that as fantastic. It's old now. Might um might leave them called secrets and lies. And there's a great line in it when he says that's what families are made up of, basically secrets and lies. And I think every family has, to a lesser or greater extent, somewhere in their family, a big secret and people lying to each other. Um, even the most loving families have it somewhere. You know. Um, yeah, we we got to a pretty good place. So, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, I was just interested. You're talking about the parental kind of relationship with these guys going through transition. Mm. Did these, the people that were in your program, did they have siblings? Uh -huh. Yes, uh, but in both cases, the parents did not, or, or they themselves didn't want their siblings to take part in the program um, because. I don't know. Actually, I don't. I wouldn't like to put words in their mouth and say why that was, but they just felt that wasn't appropriate in their particular decision. So, for the purposes of the program, they were sort of only children, you know, and they, the siblings weren't involved in the program, and we didn't ask them what they thought or what, what it was like for them or, or, or anything. So, I, I don't know their specific situations. But yeah, I mean, that sibling relationship is again more complicated. But I think. I mean, I know, and again, this is you know, this is not true of true of many people. But I also look at my I've got a seventeen-year-old and a fifteen-year-old, and I talk when, when we talk ourselves as a family and to their friends. You know, that I've seen a massive shift in that generation in, towards acceptance of you know the kind of the gender spectrum or whatever. Whatever you know, I just think for me that's hugely positive. I think that young people of that generation talk about it, accept it, not exclusively all young people of that generation, but, you know, even five, six, seven years ago, that would have been different, I think. Um, so I think, you know, young people, you know, who have siblings who are transitioning, maybe feel very differently about it than, you know, people even 10 years ago would have done. So I think that, that younger generation is, is, in my experience, just incredibly accepting and open and interested and all those just all that good stuff but not judgmental in the main you know, sarah huge. i'm just going to hold you there sarah thank you david um the what there was it's, it's stopped now but there was a huge amount of uh, uh, interference on the line is that was do you know why that was happening david up in the skies it sounded, it sounded like julian clary was sort of tidying up his office <laughs> no oh it's gone now it doesn't matter dave you don't know what that was or no, I'm sure. No, I'm sure. Okay, it's gone now. That's cool. Sorry, Tim, back to you. I just wanted to... Yeah, no, it's, it's, again, we were talking earlier in the week for George and my daughter, and I, I agree with you, Sarah, that, that generation, that their whole landscape of what they were taught and how they were taught and the generation that 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 they were taught and the generation the sort of sexual identity and attitudes towards it are definitely changing. I, I say that people, young people are more gender, they call it colour blind, I like to say colour inclusive, gender inclusive, uh, LGBT inclusive, you know, men and women do whatever they should do, whatever job they wish to do, up to, because, you know, women can now be in special forces, athlete, footballer, uh, president, prime minister, um, business leader. Every single job, there is not one, I think, that is barred to women now in, the, in uh, most uh, democratic developed countries. So that's great. That's a hope for the future. So, Sarah, in terms of that clinic you think you're talking about in Wales, is there another one? Are there any more now cropped up or not? You know, I, I don't know, actually. It'd be interesting to see. I, I suspect there might be. Um, but um, 
one of the GPs that, that was running that clinic was actually um, being investigated by the GMC. So, you know, what she was doing was, was, was you know, in, in, in the eyes of some parents, she's an absolute, you know, hero who was stepping up to do to help their children when no one else would, and in the eyes of other people, she was, you know, doing something that was not recommended by the GMC and operating, you know, in a way that um, a responsible GP should not operate. So, as always with these things, it's, it's you know, it depends what side of the fence you're sitting on, doesn't it? You know, um, but it's, um, you know, it, 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 you know that that whole, you know, there's obviously been that recent court case with the Tavistock Clinic, which you know, I'm sure you're aware of, which. Um, you know, the Tavistock clearly lost that case, so that is again fascinating. Um, and I was surprised that they lost, actually, I have to say. Hey, what, what did, Elise, what's the context of that, what, of that, for people who don't know? No, it was, a, and, I, and I can't bring her mind to name, but she was a young woman who had transitioned and was, had been given um, hormone blockers, um, so she didn't go through puberty, and she, uh, in her mid 20s, I think. Um, Decided it was the wrong decision. She wished she hadn't transitioned, and then she took the. Took the basically, the, the nub of the case was: Can a young person make a full and informed decision about whether they should take hormone blockers, and do they fully understand the implications of that and of transitioning? And you know, is that is that it? it you know, can a young person be, be held responsible for that decision and make that decision well and responsibly? And the court decided, no, they can't. Well, it's, as, a, as a trans person, I'm going to say this, that it's, it is a difficult question. And that if you are someone who wants to transition and you want to stay transition, it would be great to go through puberty, not feeling in the wrong body and to live your life not feeling in the wrong body. But if you, um, if someone changes their mind later, this is a tricky question because in fact, that puts them into the situation where the person who was not allowed to transition, because if the courts are saying, ah, you're young and you cannot transition even though you want to, that is forcing them into a life if they want to stay in their life or if they transition later, where they could have had a more normal, accepting teenagehood, which is a very tricky time. So um, I don't have a magic answer to this, but I know we need to... Huge, it's so complex, and I think it's one of those things where you know, the law is a blunt instrument, isn't it? And everybody's case will be very slightly different depending yeah. on the, 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 their levels of support they have at home, the kind of uh, experts who are who they're who, who are looking after their treatment. All that kind of stuff will play into their psychological assessment of that young person and where they're at. And you know, and it's so it's you know this is where it's deeply unsatisfactory, isn't it? Because a, a ruling like that will be made that might be what. Like work in one case and completely not in another. It's really, really, really complex area. Hey ho, let's talk about politics then. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah, so you were in Washington DC for four years, I think, when you from 2002 to 2006. So you lived through the lovely George W. Bush years. The um, so tell Eddie, how did, how did you end up there? How was it? And uh, and you know, what do you think of things that have now unfolded over the last four years? Well, um, I'm, a, I'm a bit of an American politics kind of, you know, uh, junkie. I guess. <laughs> um, so yes, we went out. We actually went out because my uh, my husband and I both work in news, and he was the bureau cameraman for the ITN Washington bureau. So we were out there for his job, and then I'm also a journalist, and I went out there and freelance for the BBC and Channel Four News and, and various other news organisations and Eurovision when we were out there. Um, so I was kind of vaguely interested in American politics before I went, but probably not obsessed quite like I am now. And then, uh, and then we lived there for four years. Both my children were born there, um, and it's just you know we live in Washington D.C., which is a kind of strange anomaly compared to a lot of the states. You know, it's, you know as you truly know, it's, you know the, the, the coasts are very different from heartland America and the Midwest, and the South is very different from the North, and all that kind of stuff. But Washington's a great place to live, and you're kind of in that very strange. City see where, you know, no one's from Washington, people come there for four years for an administration and then leave again and, you know, it's a very extraordinary place to live. But, but politics in America, I think, is endlessly fascinating and I, I love bits of it that I absolutely love. I loved as a journalist being able to kind of, you know, you go out and do your classic box pop and 
you could guarantee that within five minutes you'd have three absolutely brilliant Fox Pops. You could do the same thing on the street in the UK and you could be there for half an hour before you get anyone to have any idea what you're talking about. So the levels of engagement and interest and you know, on whatever side of the political fence is extraordinary. You know, I think that's amazing. Um, and I love that about working and, you know, doing politics out there and, and, and talking to Americans about it. And the other thing I guess I learned was I always felt, before living in the States, that we were kind of, you know, Britain was very much more towards, I guess, kind of culturally more like America and less like Europe. And we were just like America, but a sort of, you know, you know, I don't know. And decided, I guess the whole kind of the, the language thing, but living there made me realise that actually I felt much more European um, than, you know, I felt that actually culturally America was very different in a way that the language kind of fools you to think you're kind of, a, you can, you're kind of similar. Um, and so that was that was really interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, God, the last, I mean, it's, I've just kind of been glued to the Trump presidency. Um, it's just the most <laughs> extraordinary overused phrase but it is it is literally unbelievable and extraordinary events happening that you know you would not you could you have to kind of just stop yourself every so often and go am i actually watching this happen in america in 2020 or 2021 it's just jaw-dropping you know okay. fascinating okay i want to do a weird thing do tim do you have an iphone uh, yes are you talking is that where you is it with you next to you no, no, I'm on an iPad, I've got my phone here. Um, do you have the Sky News app by any chance? And if you don't, it doesn't matter, you can just look this up. Yeah. Do you have the Sky News app? Or? Okay, I'll try and get it now. Well, Sky okay. News. No, don't, yeah. don't download it. If you haven't got it, don't download it. Just look up Schwarzenegger, latest news. Because he's just... Oh, I want to show this. I want you to hold it up to the to the your screen so that people can see this because he is someone who is from Austria and grew up at the tail end of the Nazis and, and he's a Republican and he's made a speech. I've already retweeted one of his speeches. Can Tim, talk to me. Can you see yep, this video? Can you see this video for Arnold Schwarzenegger, latest video? Are you talking, are you talking I, have, yeah, I have got the video where he's saying that Schwarzenegger compares pro-Trump rioters to Nazis who attacked Jews during like, the Broken yeah. Riots. I want you to play it and show it down the screen. See what I mean? I want you to hold it up to the, turn it round yeah. once you play it so that everyone can watch around the world and see this. Because I think Arnold Schwarzenegger is being very sensible, brings very sane ideas, and he's okay. someone... Okay, Keep on going. I've just got an advert from Chris Whitty first before okay. we play. Chris Whitty's telling us it's all doom and gloom. Right. So I've already tweeted something that Arnold Schwarzenegger said. It was the... Vaccine. Right, is that... The now, you must all stay home. Okay, for five seconds. The NHS. Okay. Save lives. So just... This is weird. I've never done this before. Don't. Go to your left. Left. Right page. No. The, the screen. Hold the screen. The screen. The screen. The screen. The The screen. The screen. The proud boys. Wednesday was the day of broken glass right here in the United States. The broken glass was in the windows of the United States Capitol. But the mark did not just shatter the windows of the Capitol. Right, okay, actually, actually stop it. Stop it for a second. Can you stop it? Yeah. Can you switch off your virtual back screen? Can you? Yeah. It's, that's the thing that's blowing it. And if you can make that, hopefully you're not in a, in a tunnel or a gutter. So Eddie, I'm interested, what do you think, um, you know, if you could project forwards to 2024 or the next presidential election, what do you think all this will do to a Trump bid? Or there's no, a, Sarah, there's, no, there's no point going there. You can't, I know that you can't go there and say this will happen. And it, it becomes that endless talking heads of, well, it could be this or it could be that. Um, I am a, I'm a Democrat, I am a Labour Party member, I am a positive person, I'm progressive. I don't want to take humanity forward. And, uh, and so, okay. Are you close, Tim? You've got that. Okay, so now the answer, hang on. Okay. 
Austria. I'm very aware of Kristallnacht, or the night of broken glass. It was a night of rampage against the Jews carried out in 1938 by the Nazi equivalent of the Proud Boys. Wednesday was the day of broken glass right here in the United States. The broken glass was in the windows of the United States Capitol. But the mob did not just shatter the windows of the capital. They shattered the ideals we took for granted. They did not just break down the doors of the building that housed American democracy. They trampled the very principles on which our country was founded. Now, I grew up in the rules of a country that suffered the loss of its democracy. I was born in 1947, two years after the Second World War. Growing up, I was surrounded by broken men drinking away their guilt over their participation in the most evil regime in history. Not all of them were rabid in their semis or Nazis. Many just went along, step by step, down the road. They were the people next door. Now, I've never shared this so publicly because it is a painful memory. But my father would come home drunk once or twice a week, and he would scream and hit us and scare my mother. I did not hold him to be responsible because our neighbor was doing the same thing to his family, and so was the next neighbor over. President Trump sought to overturn the results of an election and of a fair election. He saw the coup by misleading people with lies. My father and our neighbors were misled and also with lies. I know where such lies lead. President Trump is the failed leader. He will go down in history as the worst president ever. The good thing is that he soon will be as irrelevant as an old tweet. Now you see this sword? This is the common sword. Now here's the thing about swords. The more you temper a sword, the stronger it becomes. The more you pound it with a hammer and then heat it in the fire and then thrust it into the cold water and then pound it again and plunge it into the fire and into the water. The more often you do that, the stronger it becomes. I'm not telling you all this because I'll become an expert sword later, but our democracy is like the steel of this sword. The more it is tampered, the stronger it becomes. I ask you to join me in seeing the President elect Biden. President elect Biden, we wish you great success as our president. If you succeed, our nation succeeds. We support you with all our hearts as you seek to bring us together. Those who think they can overturn the United States Constitution know this. There we go. But Sarah, what were, you, what were you saying about America Plus Week being jaw dropping? Well, it, it just, yeah, I mean, it, it is important. And I'm just, yeah, yeah, I think you're, it, it's, um, not often you watch events like that where you, you know, you think of, a, there's literally a few times in your life where you, where, where an event, you know, like the, the events of, June, of, of January 6th, where, where you, you, you kind of, you can't your brain can't catch up with what you're watching you know and you sort of think you know you can't actually can i say this happening. january the 6th 2021 a day that will live in infamy mm -hmm. that is what that was a day that will live in infamy so um and uh, president roosevelt said that before about pearl harbor and that is it, it's a horrible attack on american democracy and, uh, and I think it's very positive because you'll know, Sarah, you'll know, there's a lot of Republicans have just gone along with Trump. They're scared because they think he's got all this backing. But it is people who are going along with Trump's lies. We know their lies. And if we cannot get to a point where we say lying upon lying upon lying is not allowed in politics, it's a very tricky thing because you can say from a different angle, a lie isn't necessarily lie, but Trump, we know, he just lied about everything, everything in the world, enough is enough. January the 6th, 2021, a day that will live in infamy, and from this, and that's what he's saying about the sword, when he went for the sword, I thought, where are we going with this? But he's saying that you temper it, 
and you put it in cold water and you heat it and temper it and it's like what doesn't kill us make us makes us stronger and what doesn't kill democracy makes democracy stronger that was an attempt to kill democracy and it did not work and it will has to, and it has to make democracy stronger we have to be pushing forwards to the 2030s a positive 2030s and not heading back to the 1930s as Arnold Schwarzenegger a republican and an ex-republican governor of California that is what he is saying enough is enough the proud boys the equivalent of the Nazis from Germany back then. We saw a Confederate flag in there. They were pushing for slavery in the Confederacy. These are unacceptable things. So that's what I think. Eddie, I'm interested. What do you think about um, like Twitter's decision to block Trump's account? Absolutely. For Absolutely. It's a bit. It's a bit like. No, it's a bit like saying some people say, "Oh, freedom of speech." Well, if. If you, you, freedom of speech in this country, but if your speech is doing hate crimes, if you're doing hate crimes with it, if you're inciting people to commit murder, five people died. This January the 6th, a day that will live in infamy, 2001. It's, uh, sorry, 2021. It's, uh, that is, th that is the point. So if he's inciting people to go <laughs> forward and five people die, Yes, block it because these are crimes. Uh, these are hate crimes. He's encouraging people to commit hate crimes, and uh, we now know those are illegal and should be illegal and should have been illegal since the beginning of civilization. And do you think, do you think the Democrats' decision to try and go for impeachment? What, what do you think that's all about? Do you think that's a wise decision? Well, it, the point is he could do absolutely anything. We now know anything in his way if he was in for another four years think about it if you took if if uh they had if they've been allowed to have elections in uh after four years of hitler being in then hitler and was voted out then you wouldn't have got to the second world war just imagine what another four years of trump could happen so they are going to that maybe it's maybe it cannot be done in the time but it's just too dangerous and uh, even vice president pence saying I'm not going to do this illegal thing that you're asking me to do to try and stop democracy going forward and then looking to make sure that he can't go to the nuclear codes. This is an unhinged, dangerous, uh, sociopathic and psychopathic person who only cares about his own ego and will lie, has lied more times than anyone almost in history, almost more than Hitler. I think it's more than Hitler now he has lied. This is Donald Trump. So you've got to stop this man. In any other situation, he would have been put in prison ages ago. You know, he has broken so many rules, so many laws. He has been so horrible, so racist, so sexist. We, you know, you, he can't ever take any of that back. And he keeps going on doing it. It's like a uh, crime doesn't pay, but he's got to a place where he is being criminal and he's going on and doing it. It has to stop. Enough is enough. And do you think that um, you know that you know Washington is a place where people you know power seeps away quite quickly sometimes, and you can see Republicans, some quite senior Republicans, already shifting their their you know attention away from him and their support away from him, even on a minor level. And so you're starting to think, you know. Um, whether that's, you know, for different people, that's sometimes about them making sure they're feathering their own caps and sometimes it's about maybe having a conscience, who knows? But, you know, you wonder that will be his final undoing more than Twitter or anybody else can do, that, that actually, that kind of, that ousting of him from, from the centre of power will be the thing that he becomes this kind of, you know... Yeah, it's, um, well, we saw what Sarah Palin happened. She had a certain power and a certain sway for about two years and then it all dribbled away. But yeah, you we well. can't be sure, because what he did, I finished my mouth, by the way, so well done me. And uh, he gave, he gave, he's, he's been giving people permission to behave in racist and sexist ways. Um, people who, if society is society and you need to behave decently to one and all, some people wanted to behave indecently to, to people. And he gave them permission. He said, you can come back into society, but they are acting outside the rules of society, which is live and let live, which is be tolerant, which is, you know, don't use your hate and your, and your 
and your violence and your threats of violence against people. Because this is what the extreme right does. It, it, it uses violence and threats of violence. And what we moderates do is we say we disagree and we try to make it in calm terms. And then when people are screaming at you, we often back down. And we need to stay, we need to stay strong and we need to fight. We need to fight these bastards. Cheers. That's Cheers. Right. Well done. That's well, that, yeah, in summary, fight these bastards. <laughs> the taglines today. Yeah, and, <laughs> you know, you've got to stand up to, you know, and I say fight, I don't say get out there and we start going hammer and tongs, but uh, we have to fight. Now, I can't get my thing going. Oh, booger. Well done, Eddie. Good work. Thank you. And I will, I will see you after the gig with Sarah, virtually. Just All so right. nobody panic. Yes, thanks, everyone. On, uh, on Zwift, anyone wearing the blue shirts? I have done my marathon today, my 10. I've done 10 and 10. Uh, thank you, Budapest, Hungary. Thank you. Everyone, thank you, Arnold Schwarzenegger, for that message. Do look at it on YouTube. I'll, I'll, I'll retweet it immediately. All right, guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.